A couple of years ago, I flew home to visit family. I'd been there about a week. Then we'd head to the coast for a week. Then back home for another. I totally needed this break. I just ended an on-again, off-again relationship. It took seven months of putting up with it. Because you're supposed to fight for what is important to you, right? Anyhow, I finally just said it was done. No more chances. No more trying to work it out. It's just done. So, with that chapter of my life being over, I was more than happy to be somewhere else, surrounded by family and putting myself back together. So I got there. I spent a couple of days sleeping a lot. My mother's a nurse and she was becoming concerned that there was something physically wrong with me. I just needed a couple of days in a safe place. Somewhere where I could let my brain work on digesting the new life I would have when I got back home. So, before we left for the coast, I met up with a friend from grade school that I kept in contact with over the years. I thought it would just be he and I, but it didn't really face me that another person was there. We hung out for a while, and then I needed to get home. I had to take the backwards route to get home, or taking a different route would add another 20 miles onto my track. Being backwards, I needed to keep an eye out for deer, so I said goodbye. I told my new associate that if he was ever in my neck of the woods, to look me up and we'd grab a drink and hang out. I told him to grab my number from my friend, and I went out the door. About halfway home, I got this weird queasy feeling in the pit of my stomach. I slowed way down and sure enough, there was a deer in the middle of the road. Because I had slowed down, I could see another car out on the road. I couldn't shake this queasy feeling, so I figured it would be better to cut off and go down to the main road because there were more places to stop at. I really didn't want to stop off in some rural farmer's driveway. I've watched way too many movies to make that mistake. So I get over to the main road and pull into a gas station. I sit there for a couple of minutes, trying not to get sick to my stomach. I ran into the store, grabbed some water and ginger ale, and then I went back out to my vehicle. I was still unable to shake that queasy feeling, so I started to head home from the gas station. But I knew I didn't want to go straight home, so I drove around, taking this road or that road, until that weird feeling started to go away. And then I went home. I read for a bit, and then went to sleep. The next day, everything was fine and we headed off to the coast. Fast forward two weeks. The trip is over and I'm still feeling a bit fragile over the breakup, but that's really it. I figured I would begin the process of cleansing the environment of negative energies, and then work through the baggage that came from the breakup. I knew there was a lot and it would take time. So the next day, I'm going about my business. Everything is as cool as can be when packing through the junk left behind after a breakup. I'm really just doing mindless things to zone out. I didn't really want to think too much on the activity, since my brain was working full time already. A little bit later in the day, my phone rings. I don't get a lot of calls, so I assume that there might be a family emergency or that I needed to answer it ASAP. The area code of the caller, who is not in my contact, is the same as my cousin. I answered without a second thought. On the other end was the acquaintance I met at my friend's house. It's a little weird to have him be calling me, but I don't think it's anything terribly out of the ordinary. I asked him what was up, and he said he was at the airport. I still find it a bit odd, but I said, Oh, that's cool. Where are you going? And he said he'd already landed. Again, I'm distracted and just really want to get him off the phone so I could go back to my mental sidestep and zone out. So I said I hoped he had a good time wherever he was, and then he said he needed me to pick him up. Wait, what? Did you just say you needed me to pick you up? Yeah, he replied. I came to visit you. Now hold on for a second. I know for a fact that I didn't show any more interest in him than general courtesy. Why did you come to visit me? I asked. He said he felt a deep connection and wanted to be with me. I'm starting to get angry as well as freaked out at this stage. I told him I didn't feel a connection at all, and I couldn't believe that he would fly across the country to see someone that he'd spent two hours with. He said I invited him when I said come look me up. I said no, 
That's just a polite thing to say to some random person that's made a very small impression on me. He said I needed to find a way back home since I misled him. Misled him? Really? Look me up if you're ever in my neck of the woods did not mean come follow me on a plane. He said he needed a place to stay until he could get the money for a plane ticket back. I said that there were plenty of hotels that he could stay at while he got himself sorted out. He said he didn't have any money after buying the random one-way plane ticket. So at this stage, I'm flabbergasted, angry and freaked out that someone would do that on a one-way ticket. I finally caved and said he could stay the night while he sorted shit out but I expected him to be gone no later than the morning of the day after tomorrow. So I bring him back to my place, throw pillows and a blanket on the couch. I turn to my bedroom and he asks if he can sleep with me. I tell him no, there's no way that's going to happen. I point out that I have a firearm and do not attempt to come in. So the next day I have work. I woke him up and told him to get up and find a way home immediately. I also told him I had work but I would check on his progress the next morning because I was dropping him off at departures regardless of whether he had a way back or not. I went to work. He blew up my phone all day. He wanted me to come back to my place for lunch. I told him no and that I'm way too busy. I finally get home from work and I'm chuckling at a message I got about my dog and that's when I noticed that he rearranged everything. By everything, I mean every room of the house has been rearranged. I flipped my lid. I asked him why he thought it was a normal thing to do. Instead of answering, he asked me who I was talking to. I told him that wasn't any of his business, but I received a text from a guy watching my dog while I was on vacation. I was shocked when he told me that he didn't want me talking to that guy. I am no longer freaked, but full force apocalyptic disaster is about to be unleashed. There was going to be nothing left but a smoking crater. The temperature drops about 10 degrees. I very calmly said to get his shit and I was calling a cab. He's going to the airport because he's a psycho. For a side note, when I'm in full rage, I speak very calmly. If I'm not complaining about something, it's a quick burn. If I go monotone calm and tilt my head to one side slightly, that's where I hit arctic level anger. So he, unaware of the environmental change that's occurred, and the chances of survival are dropping by the second, decides to tell me that he used my computer. He got my ex's phone number and they both agreed I was heartless. We're fast approaching the epic scale disaster and he finally seems to notice how deep into rage I had sunk into. I told him it was unlikely that he had gotten into my computer because it's a full quote from The Art of War by Sun Tzu. He would have had to have the processing power of the Hadron Collider computers and it was obvious that that was not the case. I told him he had three minutes to get his stuff and get out, or I wouldn't be responsible for what would occur. So, still yelling insults at me, he gathers his stuff and leaves. I used to get messages and calls from him. I'd block one and six more would pop up, but eventually it stopped. To this day, I have no idea nor interest in knowing where he's at or if he made it back. Growing up, I spent every summer vacation at my grandparents' house in rural Tennessee. When I say rural, I mean their town was quite literally a cluster of homes, with a singular one-lane road is the only way in and out, 45 minutes from the nearest freeway on ramp, 30 minutes to a grocery store, and an hour and a half to Costco. What I'm trying to say is this is about as remote as it gets. I play outside for hours and hours and maybe only see two or three cars. It's a lot more built up now, but it was nice while it lasted. It was around 11.30pm and my dad and I couldn't sleep because it was especially hot and muggy out. We decided to go for a drive through the hilly, curvy back roads that I absolutely loved and still do. There was a scenic access site that was just a clearing overlooking a cliff about 15 minutes further into the woods. It wasn't very well known. It was down a narrow two-track, lined with a couple of dilapidated trailers lining every quarter mile or so. Due to the isolation and lack of any real police presence, this area was lousy with meth during this time. 
It was a local rumor of some inbred cult up in the woods. Keep in mind, it was midnight by the time we got to the parking lot for the Overlook, which was just a gravel pit. My dad has always had a bit of an intuition. He asked me if I really wanted to get out of the car. That made me a bit hesitant myself, but I saw the amount of fireflies that were out. Catching them was my favorite pastime. Armed with a flashlight and an old Tupperware container with some holes in it, we set off down the path to the cliff. We immediately heard noises in the woods, heavy footsteps, way too heavy for a deer, and there wasn't really a bear presence in this area. The woods were unusually quiet besides that. We both thought we saw someone hide behind a tree out of the corner of our eyes. I didn't realize he saw it too until we brought it up in the car and vice versa. Here's where it gets freaky. Once we made it down the path to the cliff, we saw the outline of a man. He was about my dad's height around 5 foot 10, but he was thin as a rail. He couldn't have weighed more than 120 pounds. Here's the thing. He wasn't admiring the beautiful moonlit scenery of the cliff. He was standing perpendicular to it, just staring off into the trees, perfectly still. My dad slightly nudged me in the direction of our car. As I started walking back, he shined the flashlight on the man. As soon as the light shone on the man, my dad gasped and dropped his flashlight before literally picking me up and then sprinting full force back to our car. As we peeled out, I had no idea what was going on. His face looked like a melted candle. He said after a few minutes of silence after we pulled out onto the main road. Apparently, the man had no nose, just two nostrils in his face. The way he was described sounded like he was a burn victim. As we brought it up to my grandmother the next day at breakfast, she immediately turned pale. Apparently, there was a meth lab explosion up in the hills a few months prior. They were unable to rebuild the building. They resorted to making their products in the woods. They're very defensive about their stash. Even homicidal. I am someone who cannot be around others for long stretches. I like to go on walks alone with music. I know it might not be the smartest thing as a young woman, but this occurred in broad daylight on a busy stretch of road in Myrtle Beach. I was walking down the road, and an older man in a sedan pulled into the parking lot I was crossing, so aggressively that he almost got T-boned by oncoming traffic. I thought maybe he was late for reservations. He waved at me and I nodded, followed by him just idling there. I kept walking. Two blocks down, I turned back and decided to go back to our hotel. All of a sudden, the same guy pulled up on me, speaking so low I could barely hear him. He kept asking to give me a ride and motioning me to come closer. I instantly got chills all over my body. Had he been watching me the whole time? Had he pulled into that lot just because he saw me walking past. I also wondered why he was speaking so low. It was like a million connections happened in my head all at once. I felt my face go cold. I said absolutely not, I'm fine. And then I walked away. I was not quiet about declining his offer. At my rejection, his face contorted into something so angry and vile. He sped off so fast. I did not think he had good intentions. I wonder if things would have been worse if it was dark outside, or if I were more forgiving of strangers. Many years ago, roughly when I was 7 to 10 years old, my family and I were on a vacation visiting a museum. After looking at all the artifacts we were enjoying the outside, we were one step away from entering the parking lot. There were benches, an ice cream booth, and a playground. Suddenly we could hear a little girl screaming her lungs out about, No. I don't know you. You're not my father. Honestly, sometimes kids will make up stuff to stay at the playground when it's time to leave. My mother was cautious of the interaction between this adult man, who was decently dressed 
trying to convince a little kindergartner, saying, It's time to go home, honey. But suddenly, the girl said something that made my mom interfere. I want my mommy. Please help me. Call my mommy. I have her number. The begging for someone to call her mother, to get away from this presumed tired father, got my mom's attention. She got in between them and said loudly enough for most people to hear that she had taken pictures of him and the girl, and if he is her father, the mother should be able to confirm. She questioned him, telling him why doesn't he stay while she calls her. It wouldn't be an issue if he was the father. She had slowly positioned the girl behind her while saying this to the man. She then took the girl's hand and walked back to our table, trying the tears and asked for her mother's number. The girl had a piece of paper with a number on it which my mom dialed. Before the girl's mother picked up, she asked the girl if she would like ice cream, so all four of us went to the ice cream shop. While the girl happily pointed at an ice cream, with me and my brother doing the same, the girl's mom picked up and my mom told her everything. She quickly asked about any allergies because she was about to get ice cream and paid. While on the phone, and a little girl a lot happier with an ice cream, my mother pointed out that the guy was no longer around. She had made sure to look out for the angry man, who for a long time walked back and forth angrily, but now he was completely gone. We think he kept an eye out on our mom to see when she wasn't looking to time his escape. When we were seated seconds later, a woman came running up to us, red face with tears streaming down her cheeks. My mom kept the lady and the girl at a distance. She faced the girl to ask, Is this your mom? To which she said yes and went around my mom to her grown mom. Later my mom explained that she asked the daughter first, with the lady at bay, to ensure this was her mom, just in case the girl was too distraught to tell. My mother then asked the woman to show her her phone. She wanted to see the call logs to prove she was the person she called. Security was called who got the photos from my mom. She explained what happened. Then the lady offered to pay us for all of our ice cream, but my mother refused, saying how her daughter being fine and safe was all that mattered, and that one ice cream wouldn't hurt the wallet. My mom also explained to us that since she, as a little, not so strong woman, she only dared to approach him with the threat of photos and speaking loud enough for people to hear. We learned what to look out for to protect ourselves and others. And when I look back at that memory, it makes me so proud of my mom. This happened when I was four or five, and it happens to be one of my earliest memories. So one summer, my grandparents would invite my immediate family to go camping with them. They have an RV just big enough to cram us all in. So we went camping at a place called Goose Pond in North Alabama. During this trip, my grandpa taught me how to ride a bike without training wheels. After many tries and fails, I was able to ride a bike on my own pretty well. So out of excitement, I asked my parents if my brother and I could go ride our bikes. They said we could ride the short loop where about 60% of the loop can be seen from the RV. So me and my brother grabbed our bikes and took off. While riding around the loop, nothing eventful happened until we reached our final turn. This turn was barely out of view from my parents in the RV, so when my brother and I turned the loop, a car pulled up behind us. We got off our bikes and stepped off the road to let the car pass. When the car got parallel to us, it stopped. A man from the car rolled down his window and then started talking to us. He said something along the lines of, I have candy in my car if you want some. Just come over here and I'll give you a piece. Ignorant young me took a step in the man's direction. As soon as I took that step, my brother grabbed my shoulder and said, Let's go back to the RV. As soon as we paddled away, the man drove off. So this, unfortunately, happened when I was 11. My dad is ex-military and a retired pilot, so I grew up with the incredible benefit of being able to fly standby virtually anywhere. I did a lot of traveling with my family growing up. One of these trips was to Puerto Rico. 
We were vacationing for about five days. My dad's old military buddy was working as some type of housing manager at the military base there. So we hooked up some ridiculously cheap housing for our son base. My dad's other military friend came along with his wife and 17 year old son Brian. Brian was cool. We got along pretty well, but didn't hang out that much. Age gap. Our families hung out for a little bit, but we went our own separate ways for the most part. And it started happening on the second night. The little condo we were staying in had two bedrooms and a living room connected to the kitchen. Growing up, I was always kind of afraid of the dark, especially the still silence that accompanied the darkness whenever I tried to fall asleep. I decided I wanted to sleep on a living room couch so I could fall asleep to the TV. There was a wall to my left with a large window, and it freaked me out. I closed the blinds as much as I could, but there were still little gaps that I could barely see through. Whatever, I thought. It was as good as it was going to get. I remember this like it was yesterday. Beer Fest was on the free movie section. I was hyped because I was pretty sure there was going to be topless women in it. It was pretty late at night, and my parents had gone to sleep hours before. About an hour into Beer Fest, it happened. A few fast, hard taps on the window. I perked up like a meerkat and just sat still for what seemed like forever, just staring at the window. There were some streetlights off in the distance that kind of illuminated the outside. I didn't see any movement. I sort of relaxed and kept watching Beer Fest. No topless ladies yet. About two minutes go by, then three more taps, but these were longer and more drawn out. They were sinister. Every hair on my body stood up as I looked over at the window. A dark, tall silhouette stood an inch from the glass, face obscured like a demon ghost or some shit. I freaked out and ran to my parents' room. I turned on all the lights immediately and said that there was someone outside. My dad was pissed. He said I was imagining things. I wouldn't leave them alone until he went outside and looked. He went out there in his boxers, patrolled the perimeter of the house, nothing. They told me it was nothing, probably my imagination, and to get back to sleep. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the entire night. The rest of the trip went on alright. The days were full of tropical fun and adventure, but I could barely keep up. I couldn't sleep. On the night of the second to last day, I realized the couch was insanely uncomfortable and figured I'd try sleeping in the guest room, which actually had a bed. I thought that since I was so tired, I'd be able to fall asleep fast. There was a giant window directly over the back of the bed, right behind me if I was laying down. It was about midnight. I was playing on my iPod Touch, listening to music at a moderate volume. And then, bang, bang, bang. Whoever had been stalking me knew I'd switch rooms that night. They pounded on the window right above my head. I screamed and ran into my parents' room and told them. My dad was convinced I was imagining things. He just couldn't believe that anyone would do this on base. Military men, am I right? I convinced him to sleep in my bed with me until I fell asleep. He stayed for about an hour and then got up to go back to his room. I begged him to stay but he told me to put my headphones in and try to sleep. I defeatedly put my headphones in, just lying there. And then again, bang, bang, bang. I sobbed, turned the music up as loud as it would go, and accepted my fate. I actually cried myself to sleep. The day we left, my dad's buddy who ran the base housing took me out to get lunch. On the ride back, I told him what happened. He chuckled and said it was Brian. Apparently it was just some fun, small prank. Oh yeah, fun. I couldn't believe it. Brian and his family left early that morning, so I didn't even get to confront him. And it's not like I really would have. What would I even say? Why did you torture me? Even though I knew it was him, that experience messed me up for years. Talk about scared of the dark before. So, Brian, fuck you.
About six years ago, I was with my friend Tom at my parents' cabin. We decided to head off to a casino on an Ojibwe reserve about 40 minutes away. The entire stretch of highway between is heavily forested, and there are no lights, which means it can get incredibly dark out. We got there and played some poker, tried a few table games, and grabbed some dinner with our winnings. It was a pretty successful night overall for the both of us. We ended up leaving the casino around 1am. It was a bit later than I would have wanted, given the lack of any street lights. We drive about 20 minutes on the highway without passing any of the vehicles when I noticed two green orbs just off the highway before a hill. Realizing it was a deer, I slammed on the brakes and waited. Several deer crossed and we resumed driving. The car was going slowly up the hill because it was a starting stop. As soon as we make the crest of the hill, Tom screamed, Holy shit! Right in front of us was a woman walking in the middle of our lane towards us, no more than maybe 30 feet away. I slam on the brakes again and come within 10 feet of her. Thankfully slowing down earlier and climbing the hill meant we weren't going that fast. But what was going through my mind wasn't the fact that I nearly ran over someone. It was that this woman with pitch black hair was wearing a white nightgown. She had no shoes on and was walking towards us with a blank expressionless face. I'm not gonna lie, that image frightened me because it looked like something straight out of a horror movie. Tom and I waited to see if she was going to pull up to our window and maybe ask for help or something. She made it to the front of my car and went around the driver's side. She didn't stop, but she raised her hand and dragged it across the side of my car while continuing to walk. At this point, Tom and I were both freaked out. I asked Tom what we should do. He said we should just get out of here. For whatever reason, I just didn't feel right about leaving and not asking if she was alright. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw that she was still walking. Having almost hit her, and knowing that something just wasn't right, I decided to do something. I told Tom that I was going to ask if she was alright. Tom pleaded that we just go and get out of there. I put on some bravado and told him not to worry. I would be right back. I put on my blinkers and stepped out of my car. I left my door open to provide some light, and I walked around to the trunk of my car. My interior lights didn't do much, but my blinkers allowed me to see an outline of her slightly down the hill. I was only able to see her every other second. I half yelled, Are you alright? She finally stopped walking, but still faced the other way. There was no response. I heard Tom's door open as he was getting out to join me. She suddenly started screaming. Tom and I ran back into my car and I just floored it. I got a lot of shit from Tom for the remainder of the ride back to my cabin. I haven't heard or seen anything like that on the highway since then, and I am pretty thankful for it. And that was the creepiest moment of my life. I'm quite an awkward person. I struggle to make friends due to my shyness. So in late 2019 to early 2020, I decided to join my sixth form's D&D club. I was hooked, and the fact that I had met a very lovely girl there, who I'll refer to as May, made it all the more enjoyable. It was the hype of a new friendship where all you want to do is spend time with your new bestie, and so on. When May asked me to join their D&D party, I was overjoyed. I really did like her. She started off a bit awkward, as was I, but she was really sweet and understanding. We ended up having a lot of our more nerdy interests in common. The first time we hung out on our own was a little more uncomfortable than I was expecting. Of course, as we had only been friends for a couple of weeks, I knew it would be a bit awkward, but I was not expecting how terribly unpleasant it turned out to be. We didn't seem to click for some reason. Everything was fine when we were in a group, but one-on-one, -on -one, May was strange. She would completely ignore me for no reason all of a sudden make very odd jokes but in a serious manner, leaving the pause for a bit too long, and then would laugh, and that's on top of other strange mannerisms. This was just before I left sixth form early due to personal reasons. It wasn't super off-putting, I wanted to get closer to her, believing when she got used to me that maybe she'd mellow out a bit, but boy was I wrong. Once I did officially leave school, May became intense. It started out with her asking to meet up every to every other day. 
Keeping in mind I had started working full time by this point, I had very little time to see people, which was fine because she'd understand that I was busy, right? Wrong. She started getting annoyed and upset to an inappropriate level. For example, she would make me send a picture of my calendar to prove I was too busy to see her. And even when she could see it was full, she would start to try and manipulate me to make me feel bad for not being able to see her. Messaging me things like, I love you, but you're so difficult to meet up with. Calling me her best friend and telling me she was crying because she couldn't see me. These conversations would happen around two to three times a week. And honestly, I started getting creeped out. By this point, we'd only known each other for around two to three months. We'd met up alone around five or six times. And we'd seen each other almost every day at school before my departure. My creepometer had started to rise. But it wasn't at a point yet where I wanted to end the friendship. Sure, it was annoying of how possessive she was. But it's not like she was stalking me. Yet. I distanced myself a bit from her just for my own sanity as her neediness had progressively gotten more intense and it had become taxing on my mental health. I still wanted to be friends with her. Underneath everything, May was really lovely. But that was until she came to my house for the first time, back when I was living with my parents. May turned up a lot later than we agreed, which pissed me off a bit as I knew they had worked the next day and it wasn't a biggie and that's when the really uncomfortable comments started. Now my parents' house is very nice. It's big. They have a gym and a hot tub. A lovely garden. That kind of thing. By this point, I was used to friends making a couple of comments like, Wow, your house is so nice. Or, Damn, I love your house. But May wouldn't stop. She would drop how large or nice she thought my house was in every other sentence, which later developed to her slating the house and my parents' jobs constantly telling me that I was shoving my parents' wealth in her face, or that my parents got their money because they take advantage of vulnerable children. Please keep in mind that I had not spoken about my parents' money or the family home once in this conversation, because talking about private things like that is very uncomfortable for me. Then she started to get even stranger, asking me to cuddle and spoon, telling me that I couldn't escape, going on about how I was really happy with my boyfriend, then making jokes that didn't really feel like jokes, at my expense. I was very uneasy, and my parents could see it too. So after that day, I told May that I was way too busy to meet up, so stop asking me. She didn't. She started making jokes that because I wouldn't see her, she would just show up at my house and catch me off guard. She even changed her jog route so she would run past my parents' house every day, and then she started messaging my boyfriend. It was completely out of the blue. I hadn't even given her his social media or name. I hadn't even really discussed my relationship with her at all. It was very uncomfortable for everyone involved. My boyfriend was obviously not interested in being her friend, due to how uncomfortable she made me. She told him things like, You need my permission to date her, because I'm her best friend. And other things like, You have to be friends with me and like me, because I'm her best friend. We were not best friends. She would spam my phone with messages and I would reply around twice a month. I was completely smothered. It was so strange. But when I received a screenshot of their conversation from my boyfriend, because he was creeped out, I was livid. The screenshot showed them having a very one-sided conversation on her behalf, where all of a sudden she told him she loved him. I didn't know what to say, and neither did he. So I confronted her. May tried to turn it around on me and said, and I quote, I was talking to your boyfriend and he knew about me. Impossible. I figured out you talked about me without my consent. Followed with a broken heart emoji. It was surreal. I told her that I had mentioned that we met up and that she was a friend from school, which was true. Of course I told him that she made me uncomfortable, but she didn't know that. And the conversation ended there. She then went to university and we didn't speak for a while. It was so relaxing. All the anxiety around the situation faded. May had made new friends and I was free. But when she came home for Christmas, everything started up again. All that anxiety came back. I was going through a really rough time. So me and my mom went away for a few days. But when I didn't respond to May for three days because I was busy, she went crazy. 
She spammed me on every social media I have daily. On Instagram, Snapchat, Discord, text message and more. The messages started off normally with her asking if we could meet up and that she was home from uni. But they gradually became more angry. And I won't lie, it was scary. I believed her when she said she would just show up at my house. And I was so terrified she'd ask my friends for my new address under the pretense that I had forgotten to give it to her. They had threatened to do that in joking form before. It felt obsessive and I didn't know what to do. She wouldn't stop messaging me. It became a constant stream of creepy messages. So I exploded at her. I told her that this behavior was creepy. That I'd never been made to feel this uncomfortable by someone before. That she didn't have boundaries and I was scared about the joke disguised threat she made. I ended it off with the fact I didn't want to see her again. And could she please stop messaging me? I could have definitely been nicer about it. But that never seemed to work in our prior conversations and I had to defend why I was busy and couldn't see her. Her response was so strange. She became incredibly apologetic. Then got angry. Then started to try and manipulate me into meeting up. Apologizing and then putting herself down and then telling me that she loved me. I was so over all of her nonsense and weird behaviors. I felt bad for her. I had wanted to be her friend so much, but she was obsessive and overbearing. And even though I tried for so long to make it work, she had ended up pushing me away because of her behavior. I do wish her well and I hope she gets help for whatever is going on with her. But creepy stalker friend, you're definitely not my cup of tea. Please stay the hell away from me. So let's begin my story. I had a friend, and we'll call her Sam. All throughout high school, and even for a bit afterwards, we were best friends. Even though we were best friends, I felt like I didn't really know her, if that makes sense. We were pretty wild teenagers, drinking, smoking, hanging out with older guys. Sam always dated super sketchy guys. When we were 16, Sam started dating a 27-year-old named John. I had my fair share of dating guys way too old for me as well though, so I didn't see anything wrong with it. Also, predators have a special way of making you feel like there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. I have my fair share of trauma due to older men from that time in my life, but that's a story for another time. She didn't have a car at the time, so she would often ask me to drop her off at his place to hang out, and also cover for her if her mom contacted me. Being an idiot teenager, I was like, sure, yeah, whatever. She's my homegirl and I know she'd do the same for me. Plus, I'd met John several times before and he seemed decent enough at the time. Just keep in mind that I was also a teenager at the time and I do now realize he was a predator. He would give us alcohol and stuff and would invite us over to party with his equally disgusting friends. Their relationship seemed fine at first, but it turned toxic within a few months. He would constantly demand to track her phone location and control what she wore. He also cheated on her multiple times, but she always stayed. During the time this happened, I stopped driving her to see him. One time she called me, begging me to drive her over to see him. I said no. She went on to explain that he was drunk, and if I wouldn't, then he would pick her up. And if they got into a crash due to drunk driving, it would be my fault. So I drove her to his house. I was furious with John at this point for hurting my best friend, and I had a rebellious teenage give no fucks attitude. So as soon as I walked into his house to drop Sam off, I started screaming at him for being a manipulative piece of shit. His response in the dark, twisted yet emotionless look in his eyes still gives me chills to this day. I could break your neck so easily. Thankfully I was standing right by the front door, so I ran out to my car and immediately sped off. The next couple of years are kind of fuzzy, but basically they were constantly breaking up and getting back together. Sam dated a string of other guys, but would always cheat on them with John. When we were 18, this is when things started to get progressively weirder, and I started to distance myself from Sam because of it. Long story short, Sam had a new boyfriend who she seemed crazy about, and I was so relieved because she finally seemed over John. Then, she heard through the grapevine that John got engaged and she became irate. We were hanging out when she heard the news, and she said, 
I just have to go home and process this. She immediately left, and I was like, whatever, I'll give her some space. She calls me a few hours later and was talking super fast and laughing a lot. I said, you all good? And she said, yeah, I just broke into John's apartment and smashed all of his shit. I know that I have this new guy I'm dating, but I've been hooking up with John still. Don't hate me. I'm sorry I didn't tell you, but anyway, I feel so good I broke his TV and cut up all of his sheets. Too bad John and his fiance weren't home. I'd never seen her act like this before. I was so alarmed. What would she have done if they were home? The break-in was never reported to the police, probably because she told John it was her, and if he went to the police, John's fiance likely would have found out he was cheating on her with Sam. Now at this point, a smart person would have completely cut her off, but I didn't. I stopped hanging out with her as much, and we naturally grew a bit distance because I'd moved across the country for college, although we would text and FaceTime every couple of weeks. In 2018, John's fiance was found dead. The police immediately ruled it as a suicide because it was a note and the gun was found in her hand, but all of her friends and family insisted she would never do that. She was known to everyone as being extremely positive and cheerful. They pressured the cops to investigate more, and lo and behold, one year later, John was found guilty of murdering her. He's currently in prison, and it chills me to the bone knowing that I was in his house on multiple occasions. I used to frequently hang out with him. I think my friend had something to do with it, and I'll tell you why. Last year, she was visiting my city and asked to meet up for dinner. I said, sure, why not? We're going to be in public and I do miss her. It'd be a nice catch-up. While we were at dinner, she had her phone out on the table and I saw a call from the name, Jail, ringing her phone. She quickly excused herself to take the call and was gone for a couple of minutes. When she got back, I questioned her on it. She explained that she visits John in prison regularly and that they talk on the phone every day. I asked why. He was found guilty of murder. Why would you want anything to do with them? She looked me dead in the eyes with a look of pure evil and malice and said, I'm the only one who knows what actually happened. Nobody else knows the truth. I quickly changed the subject and finished my dinner real quick, and then I made an excuse to leave. I was terrified at this point and had no idea what she was capable of. I hightailed it back to my apartment and blocked her on everything. I haven't spoken to her since. I know this isn't solid proof that she was involved, but her past behavior, the break-in, coupled with that chilling comment and the fact that she visited John on several occasions, a convicted murderer in prison, leads me to believe that she had something to do with it. At the very least, she knows much more than she's admitting. So Sam, let's never meet again. My parents put me in a new high school when I was starting my sophomore year. I didn't know anyone except my older male cousin who was in the grade above me. My parents dropped me off and I saw my cousin who was waiting for me. I was 16 and previously homeschooled for the past 6 years. My parents called him, said I was nervous and asked him to help me out. He greeted me and said I could hang out with his friends. He brings me to a group of 6 guys. They're odd sporting death metal t-shirts and didn't talk much. I was a 16 year old girl that did ballet and was rather outgoing, so I inserted myself and they all started to call me their little sister. One guy, who we'll call Mark, took a liking to me. He was by far the weirdest, always talking about death metal and death in general, but he loved me like a sister and we hung out all the time. Fast forward to my senior year. They all graduated, but my cousin and Mark were going to the same college and sharing a dorm. They told me I could make the 45 minute drive whenever I wanted and stay the weekend, so I did. Every weekend after ballet, I would drive up and visit. One Friday night, my cousin called and told me under no circumstances was I to come up. I was upset and asked why. He said Mark was being weird. I questioned him further. Apparently my cousin went to work. Mark messaged him and said he was going to Robotrip and then asked my cousin if he wanted to join. My cousin said no and that was that. Two hours later, Mark called sounding messed up 
and told my cousin not to come home, that he should go to his parents for the weekend. My cousin was frustrated because he didn't want to drive 45 minutes at 10 p.m. back home. He asked him why and Mark just said, their voices are telling me to kill the next person I see. I don't want to kill you, Anthony. Mark has always been a bit weird. At parties, he tries to get people to stab him. He gets into random fights and really just gets joy out of watching other people get hurt. So I listen to my cousin and I agree I won't come up. About 30 minutes later, Mark is calling. He asked me to come over. I lie and tell him I have ballet the next morning so I can't. He's annoyed but says okay. The next day Anthony picks me up and we go to his door. Mark is passed out with a knife in hand. He carved into the walls, I must kill, over and over again. He also had numerous cuts and smeared his blood on the walls. We took the knife and woke him up. He said he started to rob a trip, then heard voices. The voices were telling him to kill. I'm pretty sure if I would have gone over there, I wouldn't be telling you this now. So, to start this story out, I was best friends with a girl named Charlie for three years. I loved her and I thought she loved me, but that wasn't true. Back in fifth grade, I had just been transferred to a new school. The whole class knew each other from the year before. I was a complete outcast. I met Charlie at the school's open house, and apparently we sat at the same table. She was really nice and bubbly. She said she'd like to get to know me. I wanted a friend and she was there. Sparing the details of awkward preteens trying to get through school, we became fast friends. We got each other Skype and then we talked all day and night. We called nearly every day and would just talk for hours. She made me laugh and we could talk about anything. I became friends with Charlie's friends, Catherine and Addison. We were a group of kids and had fun, but things changed subtly over time. Charlie became more depressed mentioning she'd been diagnosed with depression and anxiety disorders. I did my best to comfort her. What are friends for? I assured her a diagnosis didn't change anything, and it's good she's getting help for the issues. She agreed, but I don't really think she believed it. I'm not entirely sure when it started, but Charlie started venting to me about her emotions. I always listened and tried to help when I could find the words. I was her shoulder to cry on, and I was just happy I could help her in some way. I felt like repaying her for the new nobody who wandered into her friend group. She never got better though. She started to get more extreme and more serious breakdowns. She would call herself worthless, claiming she could tell her parents hated her. I'd met her parents by that point, and they were loving people. They clearly cared about her, and I told her so. She called me a liar, saying I should just leave her to self-destruct and stop pretending I care. I was heartbroken. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The next day at school, she seemed to be doing better, smiling and joking with our friends. I tried to ask her about the night before, but she got a very serious look on her face. She sounded angry. She told me it didn't matter anymore. I didn't pry. I figured she would talk about it later. And that night, I asked her again, but I got a similar answer from before. I was still confused, but I kind of just went with it. I wish I hadn't. It went for months like that, her breaking down, spiraling, calling me a liar, a cheat, and saying I hated her guts. Every attempt to comfort her or deny the accusations were met with, liar, and it became routine. Charlie broke the routine by adding something new. She started to openly hurt herself at school. When she messed up, answered a wrong question, or sometimes for no reason, she'd take a mechanical pencil and start scratching at her arm, holding it just so to show me and her friends exactly what she was doing. Whenever we tried to stop her, she'd snap at us, telling us to stop pretending we care and to shut up or don't touch me. We didn't know what to do. We were just kids. The summer after fifth grade went pretty well. She seemed to be getting a bit better, with less spiraling and breakdowns. We talked every day, and before we knew it, summer was over. So in sixth grade, we were a year older, and in a new school. We were still a group, me, Charlie, Addison and Catherine, and this is when Charlie got worse again. 
She started having breakdowns during school, openly hurting herself more, and I was constantly worried for her. And I don't think there was a full day that year that I could relax and not worry about her hurting herself. If memory serves, it was the year she first messaged me about wanting to end herself. She explained how she would do it, how easy it would be, and that no one would care that she was gone. I was crying, hysterically trying to calm her down and say how much I cared about her, how I wouldn't know what I would do without her. She ended the conversation saying she wouldn't do it. I was beyond relief. I made sure to check up with her the next day at school. She insisted that it wasn't bad, that I had overreacted. I still insisted she'd be honest about those feelings, that she needed to tell an adult if she was thinking about it. Charlie promised she would. The rest of the year remained pretty consistent. There was a steady incline of severity of her breakdowns, but slow enough that I hardly noticed the change. Now for seventh grade. This was the year that shit really hit the fan. Charlie was starting to struggle in school. When she was immediately great at something, she gave up. She just stopped trying. The open self-harm got worse, going as far as to shout at me if I tried to stop her. But she was still my best friend. I loved her. And she loved me. Right? We could talk to each other about anything. Except when I tried to vent to her, she said I was making it all about me. With that, she couldn't handle it right then. If she was having trouble and I tried to relate to her issues and give advice, she'd say I was making it up about myself and I'm not her parent. And that year I started to really question my gender. I met my actual best friend, and now my platonic partner, Liz. We were two broken trans kids, so deep in the closet we couldn't admit we were trans. Liz was the first to come out. I welcomed her with open arms, gushing about how much stuff we could do together. Charlie didn't like Liz. She was clearly jealous. She thought Liz was taking me from her. I reassured her that I still cared about her, and that she was still my number one, but she didn't believe me. About the middle of the school year, Charlie said she might have a crush on me. She asked if I would be opposed to being her romantic partner. At the time, I was very in denial about my sexuality, and said I wouldn't mind it. She seemed to take this as me consenting to some kind of relationship. She became much more touchy, hugging me and even kissed my head or forehead a few times. I didn't know why at the time, but these actions made me incredibly uncomfortable. I wanted to shrivel up and hide. I know now it's because I'm touch averse. At the time I hated myself for these reactions. I beat myself up inside for recoiling from my best friend. And how dare I get grossed out. I very quickly fessed up to the discomfort telling her that I actually didn't want to date her, and we weren't together, that I wasn't comfortable with the amount of physical contact she was giving. She seemed understanding, apologizing for being touchy. She even joked about being touched on. After that, she started to get really distanced when we were in person, and not just physical distance. She seemed to avoid talking to me for long. She made up any excuse to shut me up. The nightly routine of breakdown Russian roulette of whether it be a couple of sentences or four hours continued. There were a few different times she threatened to end herself. More than once she said it was my fault. One particularly standout night she sent me a video. There was Charlie sitting in her bathroom next to the toilet. She said something like, It would be so easy for me to just end it. I could drown myself in the toilet and no one would know. And it'd be quiet and no one would care. My parents don't give a shit. I texted her over and over again, begging for her not to do it, saying that I loved her and her parents loved her, and that I'd miss her. I cried so much, I got dehydrated. I stayed up past midnight just waiting for her to respond, but she didn't. I thought she was dead. I thought she did it and it was my fault, that I should have gotten to her sooner. I cried myself to sleep that night. When I got to school, I saw her walking into class and my heart nearly leapt out of my chest. I ran up to her and hugged her. I wept and begged for an answer, asking where she'd been, telling her I thought she died. She chuckled and said, Geez, I'm sorry. I forgot to check my phone last night. And I felt like everything stopped. I just stared at her. This person who I'd loved for years now, who I looked after, talked to, and cared for, Someone I couldn't live without. 
just laughed about it. I didn't know what to say. I was so dumbfounded that I just tried to act normal. My whole view of her shattered that day. It was the beginning of the end. That year droned on and I started to push away from Charlie. I still cared deeply for her, but I couldn't take it anymore. Her breakdowns and ramblings and venting was daily, and I just couldn't handle her berating me. I felt terrible, like I was abandoning her. It felt like leaving a person with a broken foot to walk a thousand stairs by themselves, but I had to get away. I started talking to our mutual friends about what she did and was doing. They said it was terrible and they couldn't believe she would say such things. I showed them the conversations, feeling even more guilty for showing off our private text to other people. I had to prove it though. I had to make them believe me. In the end, I did get away from Charlie. And I think my other friends did too, but they didn't do much for me. They shut me out. And while I was broken, healing from a three years long wound, they talked about me behind my back adding fuel to my fire, only to tell me that I only ever talked about Charlie. I lost pretty much all my friends that year. I tried to resettle back into my group of friends at first, but it wasn't the same as before. I was constantly worried that they were talking about me behind my back, and I was terrified that they saw me to be on the same level as Charlie, so I left that group. It was for the best in the end. It's been a few years now, and I can say with certainty that I have trauma from those years of abuse. This is by no means detailed enough to capture the horrific experience that was my time as Charlie's friend, but I don't want to reopen old wounds. I am still great friends with Liz, and honestly, she saved me from Charlie's reign of terror. Her kindness and friendship contrasted with Charlie's everything and woken me up to how awful it was. I don't hate Charlie, despite all she did to me. She was a terrible person and an absolute monster of a human, but we were just kids. I know that I'm not the same person as I was back then, and I figure that she isn't either. Everyone deserves a second chance in life. But Charlie, let's never meet again. Back in my early 20s, I moved to Melbourne to go to university. Because of some of my dodgy mates I knew from outside of my uni, I somehow wound up as the go-to guy for drugs with my classmates. I hated the reputation, but it made me feel a bit cool at the same time. I was at the bottom of the drug dealer food chain, the type of idiot who jacks up the prices $10 a pill so he can make enough money to drink and party. I had no guilt of ripping these people off. These were mostly rich kids who lived with their parents and didn't have a job to support themselves through uni. Dealing to them was so easy and non-threatening. A few years after I finished uni, I was working an office job that was boring and paid peanuts. By now, my friends and I had pretty much grown out of the desire to take drugs on weekends. Dinner parties with good food, good wine, and good conversation was now more my idea of fun. My dealing days had well and truly finished. Or so I thought. It was 11pm on a Tuesday night. I had just got home from a draining day at work and was exhausted. I was also in a bad mood. I plonked myself on the couch and stared at the ceiling, trying to muster up the energy to get up and shower before bed. My phone starts flashing and vibrating on the coffee table next to me. I looked at the caller ID and it was T-Bone the nickname I had for a guy who I met at a festival years ago and ended up spending a bit of time with here and there. He was a huge, friendly, weed-smoking, acid-dripping hipster with an impressive beard. I hadn't spoken to this guy in well over a year, so when I saw his caller ID on my phone, I immediately thought, ah, he needs drugs. I answered and we exchanged some pleasantries, and then I could hear the tone in his voice change to that awkward, Hey, could I ask you a favor, Tone? He wanted drugs. And lots of them. Two thousand dollars worth, to be precise. When I asked him specifically what he wanted, he just said, As many eggies and bags of speed as you can get. Followed by a laugh. This was way outside my comfort zone, even when I was dealing back in uni. 
Ten pills was usually the maximum I would offload at any one time. It was late, I was tired, but I was also broke and figured I could clear an easy $500 after purchasing from one of my guys I used to buy from. I told Tebow that I would call him back and see what I could do. To my surprise, the first person I called was Stover. He was able to help me out, and he was only a five minute drive from me. We discussed the terms and conditions, which seemed reasonable. The total came to 1,500. I called Tebow, and he was happy to part with 2k for this amount. I met Stover out in front of his luxurious apartment building. We had a quick chat, and he joked about meeting the guy I was selling to. We shook hands, and then I was on my way to Tebow. I asked Tebow where he wanted to meet, and he told me where he was. I Google mapped the address, and it was a 45 minute drive away from me. Had I known he was this far away, I wouldn't have agreed to sell him anything, but I couldn't back out now. The address he gave me was probably the worst neighborhood in Australia, known for its violent crimes, murder, and of course drug dealing. For anyone listening to this living outside of Australia, they certainly don't show this shit hole in the tourist brochures. I started the journey. I now had plenty of time to think about how stupid I am. I had a ridiculous amount of illegal drugs on me, and I was driving out to the roughest neighborhoods in the country. After ages of sitting on the freeway, I took the exit and was approaching my destination. At this point I was so tired that I was in an almost dreamlike state. Every set of lights I pulled up to, people in cars next to me would give greasy looks, trying to act hard and start a confrontation. I pulled into the street where the house was. Your destination is on your left, my phone told me. It was so dark out. All of the street lights were out and there was cloud cover, so there was no moonlight. I couldn't see shit. The houses in this street looked dilapidated and abandoned. This didn't feel right. The house that T-Bone said he was at had boarded up front windows with shitty graffiti tags on them, and there weren't any lights on. I called Tebow, no answer. I redialed and thought it was about to ring out when he picked up. Hey, T-Bone, I'm out front. Ah, cool, come on in, he said. No, come out to the car, I replied. Hang on a sec, he said, and then he hung up. I was thinking to myself, shit, I hardly know this guy. He had been at a few parties I went to. We hung out, but I don't know anything about him. I saw him emerge from the side of the house, pushing through bushes that blocked the pathway. I was the only car parked on the street. He saw me and gestured for me to come over. I had no idea who he was with, so I thought it was time to get into character. I took my jacket off so I was only wearing a white singlet, and I put my filthy black trucker cap on I kept in the glove box. I was hoping this would make me look a bit more tough. My friends often joked about how I look tougher than I am. I have some footballing, kickboxing induced facial scars, combined with a pretty large physique from smashing weights for years. I was big and scary looking enough to be intimidating, but truth be known, I am really a marshmallow who avoids confrontations. I shook hands with T-Bone in the front yard of this place. I felt at ease when he gave me a happy greeting and thanked me for coming out all this way. He told me to follow him and we went through the bushes around the back of this place. I could hear music. It sounded like they were pumping dubstep through shitty distorting speakers. I could hear a few people's voices and I could smell cigarette smoke. T-Bone ripped the back door open and the smell and sound hit me harder. I've been to some nasty house parties, but this was horrific. There were three of them in the kitchen. There was a flashlight attached by string to the 12 foot ceiling swinging back and forth, kind of like a small pendulum. This was the only source of light. The swinging light made it difficult to see the people in the kitchen, but with each sway, I would catch a glimpse of their faces. They had no teeth, all shirtless, skinny with bad tattoos. We entered the kitchen and one of them closed the door behind us and then stood in front of it, arms folded, as if he was guarding it. One of them came forward and told me his name was Jay. Not like he was introducing himself, but it was more like a statement. His face was messed up. He sized me up and then looked at T-Bone and said, 
I thought you said he wasn't trouble. T-Bone looked at him in total shock. As Jay turned to T-Bone, the flashlight swung past and I noticed he was holding a big screwdriver behind his back. Now I realized what was happening, and I felt like an idiot. I've walked into an ambush. Jay turned back at me. He was about six feet away from me. He showed me the screwdriver and said, What have you got for me? With a toothless smile emerging on his face. The fact I was so tired and pissed off kind of worked for me, because I didn't show I was shitting myself. And I squared up to him and said in a no-nonsense tone, Give me the cash and I'll show you. To which Jay replied, Nah, didn't T-Bone tell you I'd pay later? I looked at T-Bone who looked back at me and shook his head and mouthed, I'm sorry. Jay looked at me with such hatred and looked as though he was in pain. Give us the gear, he said. If it wasn't so dark in the shithole, he could have easily seen my overinflated pocket and that's where the stash was in an envelope. I looked at the guy in front of the door and as soon as our eyes met, he put his arm over the door handle, confirming he wasn't going to let me go. We all stood there, trading glances. The swinging light made everyone's shadow look like they were moving. Jay didn't like this. T-Bone broke the silence and said, Jay, chill out. I'll get the money. He left the kitchen. I thought he was going to bail on me. Jay slowly came towards me, pointing the screwdriver at me. He said in a raspy matter-of-fact tone, I'll kill ya. I'll do the time. Try me. That's cute, I replied. The painful anger came back on his face. I've never seen anything like it. I slowly put my feet into a fight stance to prepare myself for what was about to happen. T-Bone walked back in and said, Here's the cash, which briefly diffused the situation. I did a quick count. It was $1,700. Close enough. I threw the envelope of gear to Jay. The doorman moved and I got out of there. T-Bone followed me and he tried to give me an apology. Mate, I had no idea that shit was going to happen. I'm so sorry. I just said, you owe me $300 and drove away. I never got the extra $300 and I never dealt drugs again. I also, thankfully, Never met Jay again. In 2003, I was working as a stripper in the Phoenix area. I had been dancing for almost a year and was still getting the hang of how to get the most money from a regular with the least amount of clinginess reciprocated. I was also working off and on at four different clubs. I'll call them Club 1, 2, 3, and 4 for reference. I was alternating between day and night shifts, depending on the money. One night shift, this skinny, scraggly-looking guy comes into Club 1 and hones in on me right away. From the way he's bouncing and twitching in his seat, it's clear even in the strip club lighting he's a meth addict, and he was higher than my heels. No biggie. I was raised by meth addicts. As long as he is happy, this should be easy money. We go to VIP, chat, I relieve him of his paycheck, and he goes on his way. The next night he's back again and he's looking for me. I get his name, Steve. I tell him my name is Tori, my fake backstory, and we head back to VIP again. He tells me he's a truck driver and is only in town for a few days a month. We have a perfectly nice, if not jittery time. No red flags. Everyone goes home happy. It was a repeat the next night, and then I don't see him for a month. This continues for about four months. He starts bringing in the finest gas station meth addict approved gifts when he comes in to see me. By this point, he's also serenading me half the time I'm dancing for him. His favorite was Picture by Kid Rock and Cheryl Crow. Thankfully, I spent a lot of time with my back to him, and my ass doesn't have ears. I could only hear snippets of his impassioned baritone. The singing was creepy. Not just because it's on repeat. He's now gesturing specific lyrics at me. The longer he sings, the more grabby he's becoming. Not anywhere illegal, but grabbing my face to force me to stare back at him. Intertwining our fingers to hold hands. Pressing my hand to his heart. Trying to press his to mine. 
by the end of this month's visit, he asks me to move in with them. He tells me that he just wants to know that I'm at his house all the time. Of course, he also envisions himself as a typical customer in shining armor. He's telling me he wants to save me, take me away from all of this. I decide to be a bit more honest with him and explain I have a girlfriend and I'm not interested in men. I'm not interested in him. I tell him that I'm happy living where I am. He tells me he will let me keep my girlfriend. All he needs to do is see me the three days a month he's in town. I shut him down again. He starts begging me to think about it, and that he'll come help me move in with him when he gets back next month. After the visit, I ask the manager to ban him. Unfortunately, without a picture of him on hand at all times, that's pretty much impossible. I settle for alerting the security, bartender, and manager to give me a warning if he comes in again asking for me. When his time of the month comes around, I switch to a different shift at clubs 2, 3, and 4 to avoid him. When I go back to Club 1 the next week, he has left a couple of filled plastic grocery bags for me. They're full of notes scrawled on crumpled, dirty scraps of paper, silk roses, small stuffed animals, panty roses, mismatched taped together greeting cards, and other detritus. There's a barely legible letter professing his love, insistence again that I move into his place and some poorly written graphic details of what he wanted to do to my body. I was sufficiently grossed and creeped out. I was happy I dodged him this month. The following month rolls around, and I ditch what had become my regular club to avoid him again. I'm working the day shift at Club 2, good money from lots of bored dudes on their lunch breaks. It's getting to the last couple of hours of my shift and slows down. I was on stage, not really paying attention as I finished up my routine. I didn't see him until I was heading down the stairs to get off the stage. He was a few feet in front of me, waving and yelling Tory over and over. There was no way to get around him. As soon as I got to the bottom of the stairs, he grabbed me in a big hug. I was still topless from being on stage and didn't want him touching me. He wouldn't let go and kept grabbing handfuls of my hair and smelling it. I pushed away from him and started to tell him that my shift was over. That was my last stage and I'm heading home. He looks upset and frustrated. He says he just wants to hang out with me before he has to leave town tonight. I tell him he'll have to pay for me to sit with him, whether I'm dancing or not, and he agrees. I go and give the bartender and security a heads up that he's my creepy stalker guy, and then go back to taking his money and then attempting to placate him. Instead of me actually dancing for him, he has me just straddle him topless while we talk. It's not unusual as it sounds, plus it's a nice break for me. He was unusually shaky and jumpy this time, so I resorted to making him sit on his hands. He proceeds to tell me how he went to multiple clubs looking for me this month, how he asked various clubs if his girlfriend Tori was there. He tells me his house is all cleaned up and ready for me to move into. I remind him again that I'm not moving in with him. He excitedly replies, well, you never know. I again remind him of my girlfriend, who I was making plans to move to Canada with. He says he's in love with me, and that our whole lives are about to change now that we found each other. Between all this jilted conversation, he's singing lines from Picture again, and he starts prodding me to sing along with him, like some fucked up romantic duet. Finally, despite the money, I decide he's just being way too crazy this time and really creeping me out. I tell him I'm done with my shift and I really needed to get home. Before I can get him off me, he suddenly wraps his arms around my waist, picks me up, and starts running towards the hallway that leads to the exit. I'm still topless, wrapped around the skinny, scraggly, dirty trucker, while trying to flag down the bartender, DJ, anyone, because security wasn't there all of a sudden. He made it to the hallway about 10 feet from the door when the absolutely massive security guard stepped back inside from walking a girl to her car. Steve tries to dart around him, and I'm reaching for security while Steve tries to pull me away from the security guard to get to the door. The brick wall of a security guard manages to plant himself in front of us, and he pulls me off of Steve before he can try anything else. He insists he was just joking and that he was trying to tell me goodbye. I bolted out of there. I went into the dressing room while he was still yelling for me to say goodbye, 
Security was practically carrying his bony ass outside. Thankfully, he was banned this time. I decided to take a vacation with my girlfriend for a couple of months after that, just in case he tried to show up in the parking lot of the club, and then try to stuff me into his trunk. He continued to call the club looking for me while I was gone. They lied and said I quit working there. The group of friends and myself rented a place on the lake just for a fun-filled, drunken weekend. We were all in our young to mid-twenties, and it was supposed to be just a big party, and for the most part, that's what it was. The Friday night and Saturday morning, we pretty much went all out having a blast on the water, and just doing stuff. Stupid stuff. Well, naturally, when Saturday afternoon rolled around, we were all so dead from going all out, we decided it would be a night of no drinking. We were just going to have a chill evening and night, and that's what it was. Relaxed. So 9pm comes rolling around, and about 8 of us were in the house and 5 outside. The house was a two-story with a second-story deck. It was surrounded by the woods, and then down through the woods you would hit the lake. I just want to mention that we already had experienced some weird vibes from the locals when we first arrived in town. Mostly just backcountry old-timers that I assumed were leering and irritated because we were a bunch of college-aged kids looking to have a good time. But the town and the lake were large, so it's not like anyone knew we were staying. Anyways, three of my friends were on the second-story deck, and my other friend and I were downstairs outside, just talking on a small old table near the woods. It was just a really nice night. My friend and I were just getting lost in conversation, and all of a sudden there was this weird feeling that encompassed us. Like an unnerving physical experience that came from the woods behind us. It was so strong, we both kind of quietened down. And then out of nowhere, this loud chanting abruptly came from the woods. I have no idea how far away it was because of the way the lake is set up. I'm pretty sure the voices carried up through the forest. It sounded like a cult chanting away and all the voices were male. They were loud and perfectly in sync. I think we were frozen for about 20 seconds before I couldn't contain myself. I darted towards the house with my friend following me. I don't know how to explain the feeling that came with the chanting, but it was almost evil, like something so powerfully uninviting. I was shaken by the time we got up to the second story. I ran out on the balcony with the other three friends. One of them was my brother. By the time we got up there, the chanting was gone and I naturally asked, Did you guys hear that? In the most shaky, freaked out voice, they all had heard it, and not seconds later, the chanting began again. So the five of us are out there, peering into the forest, listening to this chanting that would sometimes sound far away, and then relatively close. They were all male voices in the weirdest language, or I don't even know what it was. It sounded like a strange, extreme church, then, following the chanting, a loud bang like someone hit a huge metal object sounded, and then the worst part came. A man wailing, like extreme pain wailing. All of my hair was up, and it was the scariest experience I've ever had. My brother and I were staring at each other, in a mixture of scared excitement and horror. The wailing stopped, and then it was back to the chanting, which eventually died out. I was so freaked out by it I wanted to call the cops, because whoever had screamed had been in a lot of pain. That, mixed with the weird chanting, just made me immediately think of some terrible sacrifice going on. One friend tried to say it had to be some drunk guys just messing around singing, but there was no way that was coming from some drunk guys. They were perfectly in sync. Then the bang and then the wail of pain, and then all that weird tension and energy was just gone. No. I didn't call the cops. I wish I would have, but honestly the forest was so large, and since the lake house was up looking down at the woods and the lake, it could have been anywhere. It definitely wasn't in our close proximity, but it was close enough to hear all of that perfectly. We went in and got some of the others, but by the time they came out, the chanting had stopped. Someone wanted to go explore and find out where it had been coming from, but obviously, that was a stupid idea. 
After that, I was so ready to go home. I cannot explain the relief driving away the next morning. Even now, it gives me the worst feeling. Whatever that was, it felt so wrong and evil. I'll never forget that moment. I can only imagine it was some weird cold stuff. For a bit of background, we lived with our grandparents. Our father had died, and our mother had got into drugs. Our grandparents had this huge 80-acre plot of land. They had had a bunch of trails that had been made for deer hunting and four-wheeling. Along those trails were handmade deer stands that we were allowed to use as tree houses when it was off-season. The town was very rural. Our driveway was about a half a mile long. The closest neighbor took about a half an hour to bike to. The town only had about 1,200 people in it, so everyone knew everyone. You know how it goes. When this happened, I was about 10 and my sister was 15. We had just gone on summer vacation the week before. My sister wanted to go to a friend's house. Our grandparents let her go on the condition that I had to go with her. I was super excited, but my sister was less than thrilled. As soon as we got out of our driveway, my sister picked up the speed, wanting to leave her dumb little sister behind. It worked. Pretty soon I couldn't even see her anymore. I wasn't too worried about this. It wasn't the first time she left me behind, and I knew the way to her friend's house. I had been riding for about five minutes when I heard a honk. I pulled closer to the side of the road as there were no sidewalks, but they honked again. When I turned around, I saw it was a rusty red truck. There was a crack in the windshield and fuzzy dice hanging from the rearview mirror. I put up the kickstand and walked over to the driver's door, thinking it was one of my grandpa's friends. It wasn't though. He was younger than my grandpa, around 40 years of age. He had greasy blonde hair. He was covered in dirt and engine oil. His teeth were very yellow and I could see silver caps when he smiled. I waited for him to roll down the window, figuring he needed directions. He had a huge grin on his face. He asked me what I was doing out there. I told him I was riding my bike down to a friend's house and that my sister had left me behind. He told me he could give me a ride, which I declined. He got a bit mad and said he was just trying to help. He asked me if I liked puppies. I said yes. I told him about my puppy Figaro that I'd gotten the year before. He told me he had a puppy and I should look in the back of the truck where he was. I walked back. He got out of the truck and opened the back, but there was nothing there. He grabbed my arm but I was able to pull away. I ran right into the woods. I quickly found an old trail and climbed into one of the deer stands. It had wedges cut into the tree and had a little platform chair to sit on. I sat up there and cried. I thought for sure he would find me and I'd never see my family again. I could hear the man shouting at me, telling me to stop being a bitch and go to him. If I didn't, he would make everything worse for me. Eventually he went away, but I was too afraid to go down for fear that he was just out of sight waiting for me. My sister and a friend came back down the road about a half an hour later and found my bike. My sister freaked out and started screaming for me. I climbed down and went over to her. I told my sister all about the creepy man. I guess he must have run over my bike when he left. My sister didn't want to get into trouble for leaving me behind, so I had to tell my grandma that it was my fault the bike got broken. I ended up being grounded for two weeks. I never told my grandparents, and I never saw that man again. I hope I never do. I live alone in an apartment in Utah. My area is fairly metropolitan, and it's not uncommon to see unhoused people near my building. Since I'm a single woman, I am usually more cautious about locking doors and setting alarms than my friends with roommates. I have a simple safe alarm system and two deadbolt locks on my door. Because my area has lots of break-ins, I'm always sure to always lock everything no matter what. Two nights ago, I came home late from a night out with friends, but I was sober. 
I made sure to lock everything and set alarms like usual. When I woke up the next morning, I heard somebody in my house. They were wearing shoes and just walking around. One of my friends has the code to my alarm, but none of my friends have a key. I'm the only person I know of with the key to the second deadbolt on my door. Not even my landlord has one. I lean my head out the door of my bedroom, which is just a few feet from the more open living room area where the sound was coming from. There was a man in my kitchen. He was about six feet tall and maybe forty years old. He was wearing a full suit and tie, but seemed really tired or drunk. He was standing by my fridge and eating leftovers out of Tupperware and just kind of staring. And I ducked back into my room and called 911. For the next ten minutes, I stood by my bedroom door and listened to this man eat a bunch of my food from my fridge. When he was done with something, he would just drop the container on the floor. And when the police showed up, both deadbolts were still locked. They knocked on the door and the man in my apartment answered. The police rushed him and yelled if I was okay. When I came out of the bedroom, they had the man pinned to the floor. I saw that he had rearranged the furniture in my living room. There were containers all over my floor. The man wasn't saying anything, and he didn't even say anything to the police when they were asking him questions. After they took him away, the officer told me that the man had business cards in his wallet. He works at a bank downtown. The weirdest thing is that my alarm was set and my deadbolts were locked from the inside, even when he was in my apartment. None of the windows were unlocked or even open. I have no idea how he got in. I have been in back and forth correspondence with the lead investigator. We were finally able to talk Thursday about what exactly happened. The man who broke in was called Jake. On Tuesday of this week, the lead investigator of my case, Nelson, emailed me with this message, amongst other things. And it read, Don't let anybody wearing a hard hat into your apartment. I called him and asked if I could meet with him. He told me he was busy with several cases and would only be able to meet me on Thursday of this week. We emailed back and forth late into Tuesday night and into Wednesday. I would email him back immediately but it would sometimes take a few hours for him to respond. In one of his follow-up emails, he told me that the man who had gotten into my house never worked at the bank in town. They had tracked the business cards to another person entirely. Additionally, the man who broke into my house is unable to speak. On Wednesday night, all the tenants in my building received a message that light construction work would be going on for the next few days to repair wiring and plumbing. I told my landlord in a message back that an investigator into my case has requested for me to deny access to any person wearing a hard hat into my apartment. My landlord told me there would be no reason for the construction crew to enter my apartment as all the work they were doing was in the community access breaker boxes in the basement beneath the building. A few hours later, I get a knock on my door. It was around 10.15pm. When I look through the peephole, there was a man in a denim jumpsuit standing outside my door. He wasn't wearing a hard hat, but he had on a tool belt and appeared to be some kind of construction worker. I asked him what he needed, and he said he needed to check the pipes in my bathroom. I asked him why he needed to be doing that at 10.15pm. He said they were trying to get all the rooms while the water was already turned off. I asked him if he could contact my landlord on speakerphone so that I knew he was legit and instead of complying, he grew angry and told me he was just doing his job. I told him he wasn't allowed to come into my apartment. I would not be opening it for him. I then stepped back into my bedroom and phoned Nelson. He didn't respond, but I left him a message. I then called 911 and informed them of my situation, asking if they could come by and check on the workers. The dispatcher told me she would send somebody to my building. I then called my landlord and told her somebody was trying to get into my apartment in a construction outfit. She told me the team had left several hours before. I went back to the door and looked through the people, and of course he was gone. When the police showed up about 20 minutes later, they couldn't find the man anywhere in the building. However, in the video of our entrance near the mailboxes, the man was seen entering the building at around 10pm. Early the next morning on Thursday, Nelson called me and asked if I could meet him at the police station. 
When I got there, Nelson walked me back to his office. He had an iPad on his desk and a plastic three-ring binder like I used to use in school. I kind of hoped for a classic manila folder, but oh well. He opened the binder and flipped through some pages before settling and looking at me. Nelson told me that the man who had gotten into my apartment was named Jake. Jake's unable to speak, but he's fluent in American Sign Language. He can hear perfectly fine, and he usually carries a notebook with him to write in for those who can't sign. Nelson then told me how Jake got into my apartment, and what the deal with the construction worker was. Jake went missing in mid-December. He works for the Nevada Department of Transportation. Until December last year, Jake was a fairly respected family man. In his teens, he had been addicted to drugs, but he had kicked the habit and started working for the DOT. In the next couple of decades, Jake got married, had a child, and lived fairly comfortably. However, he had a relapse in December for unknown reasons, and soon after, he had disappeared. There were videos of him acting strangely at gas stations where he had used his credit card in the days after his disappearance, but then he stopped using his card after that. There's a two-week period where they're not sure what happened with Jake. The next time Jake showed up, was in Utah, where I live. He was cited for a minor vehicle infraction. The next time they saw Jake was in my apartment. After they took him to the station, they had a long conversation with him where they would talk. He would write, and then they would talk again. Jake failed to make sense to the investigators. He wrote about being hungry and not being able to sleep. And when they asked him how he got into my apartment, he would write about how he didn't need any help. Eventually, Nelson was able to get the story from Jake. So during his few weeks in Utah, Jake had started going to bars and meeting some blue-collar workers in the area. He got onto a road construction job from his past DOT experience, and he met another drug addict named Patrick. He and Patrick both used hard drugs. Patrick has been known to get into apartments by posing as a construction worker. He has sold stolen goods from apartments to pay for his habit. The night Jake got into my apartment, he was wearing a suit. His method of breaking in was to look nice enough for somebody to just let him through the entrance. After that, he would enter any unlocked apartment, step out of the window, and then come in through a neighbor's window. Apparently one of my windows has a broken latch. It cannot be properly locked. I also don't have sensors on my windows. So that explains why the alarm never went off. When Jake entered my apartment, he had already been to several other apartments. He was high while doing this, and he was hungry from several hours of sneaking around. He decided to go into my fridge and start eating. As Nelson understands it, Jake became drunk just by going through my fridge and eating and drinking. He also said the original owner of the business cards lives in my building. Jake had stolen the business card case from the entrance of the man's apartment. Nelson said Patrick would likely hit the same apartments as Jake at some point, so it didn't surprise him that Patrick showed up at my apartment not long after Jake did. Nelson said he would be contacting me eventually for the trial, and that it might be a good idea to intensify security in my apartment until they catch Patrick. So this happened in 2016 when I was 17 years old. I was a first year college student in film school. I lived alone in my first ever apartment. It was really small, but I was really proud of my independence. I never felt unsafe in this apartment for several reasons. There were multiple gates to get into the residence that needed to be opened through a code, and only the people who lived there knew it. And my door had three different locks. It was right next to the university, so most people who lived in the neighborhood were college students. Nothing bad ever happened in the neighborhood before. I have always been very careful with locking doors when I leave my home. I always check twice. So this one time, I leave to go to class and lock my door, but for some reason I couldn't get my key out of the lock. It was completely stuck. I went to get the caretaker of the building, but he wasn't there, and I was already running late for my class. So I went to class with the key still in the lock. 
When I got home, the caretaker was back, so he came to help me out. We couldn't get it out for like 15 minutes until somehow he did. He told me that the lock was damaged, but I didn't necessarily need to change it. I only needed to lock it once instead of twice. I just said okay and that was the end of it. I really wasn't worried because of how safe I felt in the building. Flash forward to two months later. I was taking the trash out one night around 11pm. While on the phone with my sister, I remember telling her that I was taking out the trash. Then I would be taking a shower afterwards before heading to a party. As I previously said, I always lock the door even just to take out the trash. Because of my lock being damaged, I only locked it once. When I got back to my apartment, I found the door unlocked, which immediately alarmed me. I went into the apartment and locked the door immediately, with all three different types of locks. For a bit of context, when you walk into my apartment, which is just 215 square feet, you have the main room in front of you, and the bathroom door immediately to your left. I had left the bathroom door slightly open, enough so I could see a man in my shower. He had his back turned to me. Naturally, when I saw this, I tried to open the door and leave as fast as possible. Except my main lock was damaged from two months earlier. I couldn't open it no matter how hard I tried. In this moment, all I could think of was the fact I had to leave as fast as possible. I jumped out of my window without really thinking. I figured it was the only solution I had, except I lived on the second floor. I hurt my ankles upon landing. I started running in whichever way I could. When I got a bit further from the building, I looked back, and the man was there at my window, watching me run away. I thought of two possible outcomes. Either the man was going to jump and chase me, but I wouldn't get far with my twisted ankles, or he would get scared of the height and be locked in my apartment. Thankfully, he picked option two. I went to hide in a bush a bit further and called the police. And they arrived within just ten minutes, because I lived so close to the station. They pushed my door and the man was there sitting on my couch, holding a knife, waiting for me to come back. They arrested him and told me he had a record. Attempted kidnapping and attempted murder were amongst a plethora of charges on him. They also told me how everything happened. Like I said, it was a very friendly neighborhood with mostly college students, so he got inside the building by other people holding the door for him. He then heard my sister telling me I was going to take a shower, which was why he was waiting in the bathroom for me. He crocheted my lock while I was taking out the trash. He apparently noticed me on school campus and followed me home several times before successfully getting in. He stayed inside waiting for me because I had recently changed my phone. The previous one was still on the table, so he thought I didn't have a phone to call the police. I don't live there anymore, but after that, to get into the building, we all need identification to prove we live there. Building IDs were created and we had to scan them every time. It was the only way to get inside the building. Nothing bad happened in the neighborhood after that. It's back to being very peaceful and friendly. Growing up as a teenager, it was just me and my mom that lived together. An important part of the story is the fact that our house was in the country, about 40 miles away from the big city we lived close to. When I started high school, I went to a private high school in New York, and my mom also worked in the city. For convenience, my mom bought a house in the city near my school and her work, but we kept the country house for weekends. It's also critical to know that this country house was in some fancy pants gated, secured, and patrolled neighborhood. It was a two-story house, and we never went upstairs. Maybe once a year when my mom would host Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner at our house. The upstairs was an informal living area, a bar, a bathroom, and a game room. There just wasn't reason to go up there ever. The downstairs dining room and formal living room were absolutely off limits. I was never allowed to walk in there or go in there, unless it was a hosted dinner like Christmas or Thanksgiving. It was kept like a museum, oddly. I never really moved into the city house, 
I kept all of my clothes and belongings in the country house, because we still had all of our animals at the country house. I would drive home every day after school to do my homework, feed the animals, watch TV, and just do other shit around the house. After my homework was done, I would pack an overnight bag of clothes for the next day at school, and then drive to the city house. We did, however, spend all of our weekends back at home in the country house. One day, I came home after school, and I'm just putzing around the house. I finish my homework and animal duties, and then go pack my bags for the next day at school. My dresser drawers were really messed up, and things weren't really folded anymore. It looked as if someone was rummaging through my clothes. I honestly thought I must have messed up the last time I was packing clothes. I go to leave the house and there's a crystal ball turned over upside down on one of the living room tables. I'm shocked I even noticed, but I did because everything in that room was kept in museum quality. I thought it was odd, but nothing more of it. I then went to the city house. The next day, I'm back at the country house after school. I finish my homework and animal duties. This time my closet seemed a bit in disarray. At this point, I think, holy shit, my mom came home in the middle of the day to see if I had drugs or something in my room, which I didn't. I wasn't into anything like that. However, when I was leaving the house, I noticed there was a second crystal bowl turned over on one of the living room tables, right next to the first one. So this definitely stood out to me. I went into the room and completely surveyed it. Yes, for a fact. There are only two bowls turned over upside down. I drive to the city house and ask my mom if she went through my room. She denies it and asks me, Do you think someone has been in the house? I say no, because, well, because nothing is missing. Plus, in the back of my head I'm thinking, it's in a gated, patrolled and secure neighborhood. The third day I go to school, and a girl younger than me at my private high school actually lives directly across the street from the country house. On the off chance we ever stayed the night there, I always drove her to school with me. She comes up to me and says, We saw you leaving your driveway this morning and we flashed our lights at you, but it was foggy so I guess you didn't see. At this point, I'm definitely thinking it's my mom going through my room, because my mom and I, at the time, drove matching white Mercedes cars. So I'm thinking my neighbor saw my mom's car leaving. I drive to the country house after school again. I walk in and immediately see a third bowl turned upside down in the living room. Chills covered my entire body. I walked into my room. Bed sheets stripped. Pillowcases gone. So many things from my bookshelves were missing. It was completely ransacked. I immediately ran outside of the house and called my mom and then the police. The police showed up. My mom, who was driving to the house but still on the phone with me, asked me to go into a bedroom closet and look under the stack of jeans on her highest shelf. There was nothing there. It's apparently one of three places my mom kept her jewelry. She started sobbing. She then asked me to check under her underwear in the drawer. No, no jewelry there either. She asked me to check her armoire under her winter sweaters. No. Nothing there again. She's then hysterical at this point. She asked me to check under the stove, and once more, nothing. That's where she kept a heavy wooden box of silverware that her parents brought over from Sweden when they moved to America. Everything that was of considerable value or heritage was completely gone. Every little thing. All of it. The security gate had zero unauthorized visitors on their cameras, and none of them were in white Mercedes. The police did a full sweep of the house and identified a space in the upstairs game room. Someone had apparently been living there. There were soda cans in the attic space that's accessed through a small door in the upstairs bar. Apparently I'd been coming home as a 16 year old while someone or multiple persons were living in our upstairs spaces and been doing a full scope of the house and all the assets to steal. To add insult to injury, my mother died unexpectedly about three weeks after the robbery happened. Anything at all of value of hers, or of heritage to my Swedish family, was gone. Everything. All gone. 
The insurance claim my father had to make turned out to be 480000 Now, the worst part. I'm 16 years old. Remember how my neighbor saw a white Mercedes coming out of our driveway? Well, the local police in the very small town that this country house was in, they tried to charge me with robbery and insurance fraud, assuming I took all the stuff from the house. It only lasted about two weeks, but it was intensely brutal. I cried pretty much nonstop. It was unending tears. My mother had just died and I was working with lawyers to fight my innocence against stealing valuable family assets or heirlooms. When I was in high school, I had a friend Lisa and a second friend Zoe. Lisa had a lot of money, and her huge house was located next to our high school. So every time we had a break or anything, the three of us would go there, we would have a lot of sleepovers at our house. It was this huge rich people house, so it was awesome to stay there. So one day, we decided to stay the night there, the three of us, plus Lisa's little sister, Anna. Their mother was gone for the night. We decided to put on some PJs and watch scary movies for hours. Anna went to bed before us. We just stayed in the living room watching TV. At one point, the alarm goes off. It happens sometimes, so Lisa just goes to turn it off, and that was it. But then about ten minutes later, the alarm goes off again, and it scared us. Technically, the alarm was made to ring only when humans come by. Due to the fact that the house was located in the middle of a forest, we all knew that sometimes animals would come by the house. So when the alarm was installed, it was calibrated for people only. And that was the second time it rang. We started to get a bit scared. We went upstairs and opened the windows to look at the garden all around the house. There was nothing. We even went on the balcony in the middle of the night. Nothing. I was alone on the balcony at some point, and the alarm went off again. The automatic lights around the swimming pool turned on. That meant something was around the pool, and I was just above it. I got so scared I got on my knees. I stayed there until my friend deactivated the alarm and the lights, and then I ran inside the house. At this point, we were really, really scared. We started thinking about what it could be. If it has to be any person, all of our lights were on, so they knew we were home. We turned all the lights off, and all four of us went hiding downstairs in the kitchen. We didn't have our phones on us, so there we were. Lights off, scared in a huge house, with windows everywhere we could see, and then the alarm went berserk again. Anna screamed. Lisa took off with her, reassuring her while walking to shut off the alarm again, as if it was going to be off once and for all. I was in the kitchen with Zoe. All we could do was look around. There was one point where we heard footsteps right beside us. It was like it was on the other side of the wall in the garden. It was fast. It sounded like the person knew where they were going. We just froze, sitting in the dark. We jumped when something, well, someone, it was obvious, walked right by the door in front of us. The person had a light, but there was a second light that allowed us to see this guy silhouette. That meant there were two people running around the house for at least 20 minutes. Me and Zoe were still not moving. The other two that had gone upstairs were so scared that they stayed there. Suddenly, we heard a voice, and then a second one. I wasn't able to understand anything, but I heard it. Zoe and I were blinded by a sudden light right in our faces. We were frozen, not able to move, scream, or talk. The light stayed on. Someone saw us through the blinds. Someone was watching us. Suddenly we heard the sound of the front door. That snapped me out of it. Zoe still didn't move at all, but I crawled to the back door and closed the blinds. I sat in front of the door to hold it in place in case the guy on the other side tried to force it open. The person at the front door was still trying to open it. Zoe was still frozen in fear, and the two girls upstairs doing God knows what. Suddenly the guy at the back door started hitting it. 
trying to force it open. I grabbed the handle and tried to keep it closed, all the while he was just hitting the door and trying to open it. It felt like it lasted hours, but in reality it was only seconds. At one point, the man at the front door stopped, and shortly after, the one trying the back door stopped as well. I saw two lights moving fast and eventually faded. Still overwhelmed with fear and just staying near the door to block it, Zoe and I just slept in the kitchen, the other two girls upstairs. Nothing happened at all, it was all over with. The next day Lisa and Anna's mom came back home, we told her everything. We got yelled at because we didn't call the cops. Their mother took it upon herself and called them. The police investigated the area and discovered footsteps all around the house. They also found some muddy footprints on the front door, but that was about it. They told us it must have been some guys who were just doing some reconnaissance, that they were just walking around houses to see how to rob them. It was common in this area. There was a lot of really big and beautiful houses, filled with expensive things. The only thing I will never be able to understand is why they started being so aggressive. Originally, they were just walking around the house, but I think if they were just observing, then they would have left when they realized we were inside or at least left when the guy saw us in the kitchen. The moment they saw us in the kitchen, they started banging and trying to force the doors open to get in the house. I don't know if they really wanted to rob the house. I don't think I will know. And honestly, I don't think I want to. I didn't spend any more nights at the house. I was too scared they would come back again. Lisa got a bit angry, and it was like she didn't understand. But from what she told Zoe and I, she didn't see them. She just stayed upstairs with her sister. I've never really told this story. Well, at least not completely. But it's still something I think about from time to time. It kind of haunts me. I used to work as a manager of a fast food place in a rather seedy part of a medium-sized city. I'd worked at the nicer location until they decided to transfer me. There were rumors that the location I ended up getting sent to was going to be shut down, which did end up happening a few years after I finally left. Anyway, the point is that the place wasn't being well taken care of. The dining room was dated and old. The owners were certainly not updating or maintaining the place well. They were just barely maintaining the very basic safety requirements, and sometimes they weren't at all. For example, I often worked the closing shift, which for this location at the time was 4pm to midnight. Between 7pm and 11pm, it was me running the drive through and the front counter by myself, and there was one employee running the kitchen. At 11pm, the other employee would go home and I was left by myself to tidy up and do the deposit between 11pm and 12pm. This isn't really safe, and I'm not sure if it was entirely legal at the time. Just to provide a bit more context and background here, I'm a woman, but I'm not what you would consider small. I am six foot. During this time, I think people would probably say I came across as a little more than stern. I was younger, but I'd already spent years working in fast food getting treated like shit by the customers and having drinks and food thrown at me. The location I worked at was a swarm with drug dealers, drug addicts, and just general scary behavior. All this to say, I didn't get ruffled that easily and I took a lot of things in stride. However, on this night, I was working the night shift with a new guy. The new guy had probably been working there for no more than a few weeks. I'd worked with him a few times before, but never the closing shift. And from the first time I'd meet him, I'd always gotten a strange vibe from him. And again, I'm not someone who got ruffled easily. Prior to this, I'd worked with the night janitor at the other location, who'd had an Adderall addiction and rather unpredictable and scary rage problems. And then some creepy incel kid who barely spoke more than two words at a time. And when he did, it was always something about how much he disliked women and me in particular. But this guy, he was a whole different level of weird. He had a kid and professed to be a single father. 
He brought the kid around during the day, and the kid and his clothing were always really dirty. Like, really dirty. Not only that, but the kid also occasionally had bruises on his head and arms. The kid was a toddler, and I know that toddlers can get into things, but one look at the kid, and I knew that those bruises were not just from messing around. I never saw the new guy behaving aggressively towards his kid at all, but I don't know. It was just a feeling, and that feeling translated into other things. I don't know. It was just creepy. It wasn't one thing in particular. It was just a feeling I got when I was around him. He was a medium height, stocky young guy. He was totally average in every way, but he just had a vibe about him. He was always friendly, never rude or aggressive. But his eyes were just lifeless, for lack of a better descriptor. Anyway, on this night, I think he might have been called in to cover a shift for someone else. I was in charge of making the schedules most of the time, and I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have scheduled him to work at closing with me since I found him so off-putting. The first part of the night was fairly normal. I ran the drive through in the front counter, and he ran the kitchen between 8 and 11 p.m. He was talking to me on and off between orders, telling me about his ex and how he'd come to be a single father. Apparently the mother of his child had a drug problem. In hindsight, I think a lot of what he said was meant to inspire sympathy. He really laid the troubled tale of him and his son on thick, but at the time, I just felt a little bad for both of them, especially his kid. But despite being seen as stern, I was definitely still young and naive when it came to manipulative people. He told me that he moved to the city and immediately had trouble finding work prior to this job. He said he'd been running out of money and was behind on rent, bills, and didn't have any formula for his son. And at the time, I think I just empathized with him and said that sucked. We were both working in fast food, and I thought it was obvious neither of us had any money. The place was bare bones minimum wage, and I was barely getting by with three roommates. I was only pretty much eating the free meal I was given from the restaurant every day. Anyway, he laid it on thick all night, but I don't know that I was really paying all that much attention to it. People tended to ramble when working the late shift, and I'd gotten used to listening to people spontaneously talk about their personal problems. I had a habit of just listening and not really reciprocating the sharing. I guess this didn't really go over very well with the new guy. At some point, the new guy said something to the effect of, You don't talk much, do you? I'm telling you my whole life story here, and you've got nothing to say. I don't know if it was just coming across as unsympathetic, or, more likely, that he was frustrated that he wasn't successfully manipulating me into giving personal details about myself. As far as I was concerned, he was just someone I worked with, and I didn't know him. I really didn't want him to know me, and I certainly wasn't about to start telling him anything that wasn't surface-level chit-chat, but the new guy was really intimidating. Something about his tone was off. It definitely wasn't a joke accusation or an off-the-cuff comment. I can't exactly remember what I said, but I remember that I just tried to play it off somehow. He didn't say anything more about it, but after that, the silence between us seemed tense. At 11pm it was time for him to go home. The normal procedure was that the kitchen closer would tidy their area, and an actual kitchen cleaner would come in a few hours later to deep clean things. In our case, it was a husband and wife team who did several locations, but they didn't usually come in until a few hours after I left. So this guy was only tasked with a basic tidy, and then I would let him out after which I would stay behind to prepare and deposit. But instead of this happening smoothly, this guy goes into the staff room and stays there for a long while, almost 20 minutes or something like that. I didn't know what was going on, nor did I know exactly how to handle the situation. It had honestly never happened before. People usually couldn't get out of there fast enough at the end of the shift. Was he sick? Did he fall asleep? I didn't know, but I honestly just wanted to get my work done and go home. He finally emerged and quickly walked to the door and left. I was relieved. It was weird, but I just shrugged it off and hurried back to the office to get done what I needed to get done. Not ten minutes later, 
I start to hear a banging at the back door of the restaurant. Loud, repeated banging. Normally, I would ignore this. The back door faced an alley and was right next to a street full of bars and pubs. People leaving the bars and pubs often got the idea that banging on the door would normally get them after hours food service. Because, well, they were drunk. So this wasn't necessarily uncommon. I just ignored it and kept hurrying to get things done. But the banging did not stop. It somehow just seemed to get louder and louder and more urgent. I finally got up and went to look out the people to see who was there. At this point, I was definitely on edge. And it swelled into a full-out anxiety attack when I see it's the new guy standing at the back door. Now, my first thought was not to open the door. I really didn't want to open the door. But I knew that he knew I was in there. What if he forgot something inside? What if it was his house keys or car keys or something? I was going to have to leave the building by that same door at some point. So there really seemed to be no escaping him. So reluctantly... And very stupidly, yes, I know. I opened the door. What I opened the door to was, quite frankly, terrifying to me. He said he had left his jacket inside. I asked him where it was and I'd go get it. I didn't want him to come inside. If this had been any other person I worked with regularly, this would have been no big deal. I'd let them back in, let them get whatever they left behind and take off. But I instinctively knew I didn't want this guy back inside in the dark, empty restaurant with me. But this new guy was not having it. He pushed past me and said he'd get it himself. Then he proceeded to shut himself in the bathroom again. And at this point, I just panicked. Instead of just staying there by the door, I rushed back to the office. I left some of the cash I was counting for the deposit out. I managed to stuff the cash in the safe and lock it before he came to find me. The office was dark. It was summer and the air conditioning was on full blast. But this guy was sweating a lot. I was taller than him and I'm not a small girl. But somehow I just knew that this guy was about to hurt me. He was keyed up. As I watched his eyes dart around the office, I grabbed my jacket hanging on the hook next to me. I hadn't finished my deposit, but I was getting out of there. I didn't care how much shit I got into in the morning for my work not being done. I smiled and told him I was just leaving and that he could walk me out. I was really just trying not to show my panic. Whatever he had planned, I wanted to give him an out for him to rethink it. So I smiled, grabbed my purse and started walking towards the door. The new guy who was standing in the doorway didn't budge. He started talking about his son about the money trouble he'd been having, and kept the whole story off with a request for a loan. From the tone of his voice, it was clear. This was not a loan. He was demanding money from me. He said he would pay me back as soon as he got paid, and that I'd really be helping him out. I didn't know what to do. He had me trapped. I was not leaving the office or building unless he allowed it. Or at this point, at least, I wasn't leaving without a fight. Something told me that despite my height difference, I was not going to win. So, I gave him money from out of my wallet. Fifty dollars, I think. When I gave it to him, he said, Thanks, you're really helping me and my son out. I won't forget it. But when he said it, he had no expression, no smile, no speech effect at all. He didn't seem grateful or even relieved. Just dead eyes. Arms limp at his sides. It was terrifying. To this day, I don't remember how I got him to the door. All I remember was shutting the door behind me, making sure the door was securely locked, and rushing into the office to burst into tears. I didn't finish my work, but I stayed there until I could force myself to leave out the same door. I was sure he was going to jump me when I left. The thought never occurred to me to call the cops. I don't know why. I guess I just felt like nothing serious had happened yet. He asked me for money and I'd willingly given it to him, despite the fact that I felt like I had no choice and had been scared shitless. I only saw him one more time after that, but neither of us mentioned that night or the money. I don't know why I didn't ask for it back. I think I was embarrassed or scared, or both. I don't know. I don't think I've ever told anyone in my life this story. 
or at least if I have, I definitely left out the part where I gave him money and never got it back. Pretty quickly after that, he stopped showing up to his shifts and I never saw him again. I don't believe in throwing words like psychopath around. I think people overuse psychological terms like that, making them just synonymous with anyone who is horribly behaved. And there are a lot of varying degrees of terribly behaved people in this world, unfortunately. But, after taking a lot of abnormal psych classes, I can say that there was definitely something about this guy's effect that was just wrong. I'd smile, he'd smile, I'd frown, and he'd frown. It was almost like talking to someone, pantomiming emotions. Maybe I'm just remembering it that way because it was such a terrifying experience for me. But the truth is, that I've never been comfortable talking about this event. And to this day, when I do think about it, I feel just as uncomfortable as the day it happened. Many years ago, my friends and I were dumb, new 21-year-olds just barely navigating the bar scene in Philly. We hadn't had many weird interactions, save for the occasional creep who would hit on us even when we tried to tell him to get lost. Back in July of that summer, we were really enjoying the outdoor cocktails at a bar in Old City when a girl came by. She was around our age, early 20s. She had a cool haircut and an outfit I loved. She looked very cool. I don't really know how else to put it. She looked like someone worth hanging out with. I was smoking at the time and she asked me for a cigarette. She talked to me and my friend for a bit, just bitching about boys and work and stuff. My friend and I were kind of desperate for friends because all of us had left the city for the summer, so we were glad to have someone our age to talk to. Finally, after we got to know each other a bit, the girl asks my friend and I to come to her apartment. She says they're holding a party that evening, and then she heads off. My friend Amy and I were thinking, why the hell not? We're bumming around the city that evening with nothing to do. We might as well try to make some friends. A couple of hours later, we were really bored and decided to head to the address the girl gave us. Only when we got there, we realized it was a penthouse on the river. The girl had given me her phone number and I texted her saying we were there. At this point, Amy was a little wary. We both thought it would be some 20-something apartment, not a penthouse. This girl comes out of the elevator, followed by a man maybe in his 40s or late 30s at the least. I didn't expect that, but Amy and I were both trying to be polite, so we followed them into the elevator. During the ride up, she told us she was a dancer. I immediately saw that as a code for stripper, but who am I to judge, I thought. So what if she's a stripper? I chided myself for even making the connection. When we get to the top floor, Around the 14th floor, the elevator opens up into an apartment, not a hallway. It was straight into the apartment. The apartment was honestly gorgeous. All marble, TV mounted into the wall, huge rug, that kind of thing. We stepped inside and Amy and I fell immediately nervous. There were three other men there, clearly in their 40s. We again felt like we had to be polite thought this wasn't at all what we were expecting. The girl ran off into another room and disappeared while Amy and I made our way into the kitchen. One of the 40-year-olds grinned at us in a terribly creepy way. He proceeded to pull one of the many bottles of wine he had from a wine rack and poured us each a glass. While he was doing this and chatting with us, the other three men circled around us, staring. Amy and I were pretty freaked out at that point. Amy started to say we were late for a friend's house party. We got up to leave, but one of the men grabbed my arm, telling me, You're not allowed to leave. Needless to say, that freaked us out even more. Amy and I sat back down and planned our next move by texting each other under the counter, saying how do we get out of here. Around that time the girl we met ran back into the kitchen, completely naked. One of the guys grabbed her and they ran back into the room together leaving three men circling Amy and I. I was so stressed out, I decided to have a cigarette. There was one guy who had been really focused on me, so when I went out to the balcony, he followed. I smoked a cigarette, trying to ignore him. 
despite the fact it was a tiny balcony and he was staring at me the whole time. Finally, he came up and started rubbing against me. I pushed him off and went to the other corner of the balcony. It was pouring rain at this point and I was worried about Amy, so I told the guy we both had to leave. No, you're not allowed to leave. You have to stay. We're just getting started, he told me. That was one of the last straws. I tossed my cigarette into the rain and pushed open the sliding glass door. I grabbed Amy by the wrist and yelled, We're late for a friend's party. I pushed the elevator button. Miraculously, the elevator hadn't moved in the time we'd been up in the penthouse. Amy and I ran inside and pressed the button to close the door repeatedly, watching as the man who followed me to the balcony charged after us, trying to catch us before the door closed. Thank God he didn't. The door closed just before he reached us and we went downstairs, finally spilling out into the lobby. I turned around and saw, by the lights and numbers above the door, that the elevator was going back up to the 14th floor. Amy and I bolted, terrified that one of the guys would follow us and try to catch us. We ran into the rain and booked it several blocks before we finally stopped. To this day, we're both freaked out by that encounter. I still think it was too pushy. They wouldn't let us leave after multiple times that we told them we had to get out of there. Amy agrees with me, and has since told me that when I was out on the balcony, another man inside told her that she wasn't allowed to leave. I don't know if that's freaky enough, but hell, it was freaky for me. This happened a few years ago while I was still in my hometown. I was going for a late night walk in the early AM, which was fairly common for me. I've always felt relatively safe and street smart to avoid bad situations. My walks would often take me all over town, though a favorite haunt was a park we'd had down by the river. Although it was known as a hangout spot for weirdos and drug addicts so late, I've walked there plenty of times and never encountered any problems. So I went down there again, all the same to enjoy the breezy river air. The walk to the park itself was uneventful, so I'll just describe the park itself, something vital to realize the magnitude of the issue. The park was unfenced and easy to get into, open to the public, and looking from the park itself, you could see an opening beach and the river along it. There needed to be an opening because the beach was a bit of a drop-off. You had to take a moderate step down from the concrete supporting the park itself just to get onto the sand, and then away from the opening. The disparity between the concrete steps and the beach became such a length that they needed fencing so as to prevent people from falling and hurting themselves. Basically everywhere that there was not a beach led to a major drop-off into only a sparse land of sand or muddy area, with the only thing separating you from the drop was either fencing or a major tree line. So as I'm walking through the park, there's nobody around, and it's absolutely silent until the hooting of owls breaks it. I'm surprised. Owls are rare in those parts and that time of year, but I ignore it and continue my walk as it continues hooting. As I meandered close to where it sounded, I noticed two things. The owl sounded like it was in pain, and that it was on the ground. I get really concerned for it and want to help it. So I start going over to where the hooting's coming from, though tentatively, because even right then, a weird chill climbed up my spine, though I couldn't say why. I get closer and it sounds louder, more hurt, and it's definitely on the ground in the same place. I keep walking closer and hear it right behind the tree line, after the drop-off point. Bear in mind, Anywhere past the tree line led to a drop-off that was just a thin layer of earth separating you from the water. Kind of like a gorge. If you jumped down, you were relatively stuck. You couldn't go forward from the water, and climbing back up was nightmarish for all the roots of trees just jutting out. And going left or right would have forced you into an extremely narrow path with little room. The owl was right behind the drop-off point, so even getting closer I couldn't see it. The owl kept hooting and I got right in front of the trees. I could hear it right under me. All I had to do was jump down and I would be able to see it and get to it. But I didn't. This weird feeling, this chill up my back, 
They had kept getting higher and higher and more and more intense the closer I got. And finally, my conscious brain finally picks up why. I start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then the owl hooted. I counted back up to ten and it called again. Every time I counted to ten, it kept calling again and again and I finally realized why I was so creeped out, why my subconscious brain was screaming at me to run away. It wasn't an owl, it was a recording, a recording of a wounded owl, on the ground, waiting for anyone to come with the intention to help it, past a tree line obscuring their vision, past a drop-off point you couldn't climb back up from, and on a path you couldn't run in at all, where someone, anyone, could be waiting. It was a lure, meant to lead someone into a trap. I suddenly felt very, very cold and clammy, and like I was being watched. I immediately turned and started speed walking away, taking the nearest exit out of the park and onto as many lit streets as I could, all the way home, constantly checking to see if I was followed. I stayed up the entire night, fully paranoid and looking out of all the windows I could to see if anyone was there although nothing bad ever did happen, and no one ever tried to get me. The next night, I went back with my sister's cell phone with the intent to call the police and report it if I heard it again, but no hooting ever occurred. Upon a more thorough inspection, nobody seemed to be lying in wait. I kept an eye on the newspaper for a bit after that, too, to check if anyone else reported similar happenings, or, God forbid, if anyone got hurt in a similar incident but nobody ever did. It never happened to me again. That's the end of my story. And while I do continue to take night walks, I always carry a weapon on me to defend myself and always, always make a point to trust my instincts. I'm a female. When I was about 14 years old, my family and I went to a resort in Antalya, Turkey. The resort was relatively small, and every day there were plenty of activities that all involved the guests. The restaurant was also a cafeteria style, so everyone ate together. As a result, everyone at the restaurant knew each other well and by name, and we became pretty tight-knit after a few days. In particular, it was this middle-aged bald British guy named Danny. He had his two kids with him who were about two to four years old. Everyone at the resort seemed to love this family as he was a single father who was on vacation with his two cute little children. So they became pretty popular quickly. At one point, I was walking back up to my room when I heard another guest at the hotel say my name in the context of volunteering me to help Danny with something. I went to see what was going on and the other guest told me that Danny needed help taking his kids upstairs. They were badly sunburned and he couldn't carry them both at once. However, the other guest was busy with something, so he suggested I should help Danny instead. I didn't really think anything of it, so I picked up his daughter and walked with Danny and his son towards the elevator. We eventually got to his room and I tried to drop the girl off by the door, but he politely asked me to drop her off on the couch. Unfortunately, I was naive and too trusting so I thought it wouldn't be a problem for me to just step in and drop her off real quick before I go. Worst case scenario, I could scream and people in the neighboring rooms and hallway would hear me. So I stepped inside, and as I dropped Danny's daughter off on the couch, he closed the door and turned the lights off behind me. It was pitch black because my eyes hadn't adjusted yet, when I hear him leaning close to my ear and say, Kids, say hello to your new mommy. I instantly got goosebumps all over and my heart dropped. Whenever I tell this story to anyone, they always say that he was probably kidding, but I can assure you 100% that he was not. I panicked and started filling up the wall for a light switch or the door. He could tell that I was trying to leave, so he said, Aren't you going to watch some telly with us? But I had finally found the doorknob and just made a run for it. I ran downstairs crying and so afraid. When I tried to tell my family, no one would believe that he was being serious or creepy, 
because they all had met him and thought he was such a sweet and loving single father. And I didn't see him the next day or the following days, so I think he checked out after that. I just need to get this story out because it's so unbelievably surreal to me that I can't even believe it's real. So last fall, I started using dating apps seriously because I really wanted to branch out and meet new guys. I moved back home after I graduated college in May, which was still the pretty early stages of the pandemic, so I was lonely. I've only ever used Tinder, so my friend told me I should try Bumble, and at first it was fun. I matched with a few guys and they were nice, but the conversation kind of died off after a while. I didn't really form a real connection with anyone on there. One of the guys I matched with asked for my Snapchat, which I gave to him so we could talk on there. We also followed each other on Instagram. That kind of stuff is harmless to me, and I really didn't think much of it. Our conversations didn't last long, and we stopped talking after a few days. It was a little strange, and I was turned off by it. Fast forward a couple of months and I get a message from him on Instagram. He told me he unfollowed me because of my support for Joe Biden in the election and then proceeded to spam me with probably over 40 messages trying to convince me to change my views and vote for Trump. I'm a very liberal person and if I would have known he was like this, I would never have spoken to him. He kept telling me people had blocked him for doing this before and to, quote, please just understand where he's coming from. His last few messages were memes to ease the tension of the one-sided conversation. He and I never even talked long enough for him to feel comfortable messaging me like this. I didn't respond. I didn't even block him. I opened the messages so he could see I saw them and then unfollowed him. The next morning I get a notification telling me this message has been unsent by the sender. For every single message. Of course I screen recorded it and sent it to my friend to tell her what happened because it was just creepy and bizarre. It was over after that, though. The topic of this guy didn't come up again, so I moved on. A few weeks ago, I was scrolling through Facebook and saw a post from a local news station. It was shared from the town this guy was in from my state. I was about an hour away from me. It was a news article about a guy who shot and killed an 87-year-old woman who lived in his apartment complex with a semi-automatic rifle. He was trying to get the other residents out of their apartments until he was shot and killed as well by a resident in order to protect the others who lived there. As I was reading about this, the guy's name and face seemed so familiar and then it clicked. And it was the same guy. I went back to the screen recording of the messages I took months ago and they confirmed it was him. I'm not sure how to describe what my response was, but I got really sweaty. My heart was racing when I made the realization. It's extremely disturbing knowing that I spoke to this man and even had a weird experience with him. It's been a few weeks since I found out and I still feel weird about it. I was just reading about it again today since more details have been reported since the initial shooting. Sometimes I think about the what ifs. Like what if I had responded to his messages the way I wanted to? What if I called him a creep and a weirdo and pissed him off to the point of violence? And what if he tried to harm me? God, I hope the woman he unfairly murdered is resting in eternal peace. Thank you for listening, and be wary of people on dating apps. I met a guy online. We talked for a day or two, but I was at the tail end of my degree. Things were getting to be a lot, so I decided no dating until I was done. I let the handful of guys that seemed nice know before deleting the app, so they would know why I was deleting it and wouldn't think I ghosted them. He happened to be online when I sent it and said I seemed cool. Can we keep in touch? Sure. No worries. I had him on Facebook. Maybe once he's like, hey, how are you? What are you up to? Normal conversation stuff. I chat about uni, work, gym, and whatever. After maybe two to three months, he says, hey, we've been chatting for a bit. Let's grab a coffee. So yeah, 
Sure, he seems nice enough. I reiterated it would be his friends, and that was fine with him. I was about to head into exams, and we made plans for in three weeks' time after I finished the exams. He started messaging me more and more regularly after making plans, more than once a day. He starts calling it a date. I wanted to make sure we were still on the same page, so I just said, Hey, you keep calling it a date. I just want to make sure it's clear it's a catch-up just as friends. He snapped. He was sending me all sorts of horrible things on Facebook, so I block him. I gave him my number when we made plans, though. So he started calling and calling, leaving voicemail after voicemail. It was late, so I put my phone on silent and went to bed. The next morning I wake up to 37 missed calls and voicemails between 10pm continuing until 4am, as well as a multitude of horrible messages. Now this was 7 years ago, when he couldn't just block someone on a phone. At first, I thought if I ignored him, he would get bored. After about a week, he wasn't slowing down. There were dozens of calls a day. I called my phone company to have him blocked. They told me you could only block three people, and am I sure? I had to jump through all the hoops, and then they turned around and said they can't do it. And I have to call the police. So I call the police, and they say I have to call the phone company, but I can make a statement of harassment in case he does something more. Three weeks later, he's still going strong, but in his messages, he starts saying he's going to force me to go on a date with him. I won't have a choice. Blah, blah, blah. Then he starts saying that if I won't come to him, he will come to me. He started telling me my schedule with where I will be at any given time. He put all of it together based on our weekly conversations about normal stuff. He threatened to come to where I will be. I have to stop doing my regular activities and pretty much become a hermit. He ended up making a threat to my life. I can't remember what he said word for word. But it was essentially, girls like you get what they deserve, or something like that. But it was more clearly threatening he would be the one to make it happen. I contacted the police again, and that was enough for an RVO, and I never heard from him again. At the time of all of this, I was 20, but his pictures looked younger, so I didn't realize online. But it turned out this guy was 34, so this wasn't dumb young kid behavior. This was a grown-ass man. I've had many other psychos since this guy, but I'm very grateful phones have since allowed you to block anyone, anytime. Against my better judgment, at the beginning of the month, I got a Tinder account. I matched with a few guys here and there, and one of them was named James. We ended up texting each other and he seemed pretty chill and pretty into me. He's a decent looking guy and we seemed to click. He had apparently been in a relatively abusive relationship with a woman and he was looking to start over. According to him, she had hit him with a frying pan and pepper sprayed him once. He kept on going about how crazy she was. Alright, it happened. We went out to the movies this past Friday and I had a great time. We ended up talking for a few hours and we hit it off pretty well. I asked about his ex because I was a bit curious as to why he'd stay with someone like that. He didn't even say anything positive about her, just that she was crazy, had mental illnesses and didn't take her meds. That kind of stuff. She had tried to baby trap him, but she had a miscarriage. He had expressed relief that she didn't end up with the kid. He said he had felt obligated to her. Again, I get that. All in all, I had a good time. This morning rolls around and he tells me that he hooked up with his ex last night and that he was trying to work things out with her. It was mildly insulting that I lost out to an abusive ex, but whatever. I tell him it's cool. He then a few hours later messaged me saying that she was crazy and he thought she was changing, but she wasn't. Blah, blah, blah. He kept asking if he could see me. He was very pushy about wanting to see me that day. He begged for five minutes of my time so he could explain to me. I politely told him I didn't want to be involved with someone who was clearly so hung up on his ex. And this is where it got nuts. He admitted he still was, but that he wanted to see me today so I could meet her and she could determine if I was better for him than she was. 
that she wanted him to be happy because he and I had a connection. I flipped out after that. I told him the fact that he needed his ex to determine who was right for him was absolutely nuts and that's not what love is. I said I wanted no part of it. He started texting me after that and it was non-stop insults and incoherent shit that made no sense. She also dropped the bomb that she was his wife. I basically told her to fuck off and block the number. I then went on Tinder to message him where I called him a piece of shit and if he was intelligent, he should leave her and never message me again. He started to harass me, saying that I was miserable because they have a beautiful love together and all this crazy shit. He then went on to say, My wife knows where you work. I hope she doesn't do anything rash. I told him if that was a threat, I would gladly go to the police. He then said she's been to jail before. She's not afraid. That she loves him so much she'd mess anyone up and risk jail for him. That she'd kill my friends if they tried to protect me. That she's armed and dangerous. I told him goodbye, reported him, and then deleted my Tinder account. I did go to the police, but since it wasn't a direct threat, they can't do much. The cop thinks James was more or less full of shit and just trying to scare me, since some people love getting off on that shit. He said I did the right thing by blocking him and reporting him. Then he said I should keep my eyes open and alert the people at my job. The scary thing is, James seemed perfectly normal, but he lied about being married, how he felt towards his wife, and he flipped like a switch. His excuse for not being up front and being married was that they were going to get a divorce. He seemed so docile and unassuming. The hatred and aggressive attitude was insane. I have to honestly wonder what would have happened had I gone to talk for five minutes. I'm kind of concerned since they do know where I work, but if either of them try anything, then the cops can actually nail them. What a weekend. So about three years ago, when I was 18 or so, I was using Grinder and someone messaged me. And to keep this anonymous, we'll call him Rando. So we started talking and we asked how we were and what we were up to. The usual conversation starters. Shortly after beginning the conversation, Rando began to sound rather depressing, bemoaning about his insecurities and how everyone hates him, and occasionally talking about how he should just end himself. So, being the nice person I am, I try finding something about him I could compliment on and try to make him feel better, that kind of thing. I was determined to bring a smile at the least and that's where things began to get heavy. Rando began deflecting my compliments, calling me a liar or a user or saying I'm just trying to make fun of him. I tried my best to reassure him that my compliments were genuine because I hate seeing people depressed or down. It's just in my nature to bring joy to people. Now, I have been in his shoes before with a severe insecurity thing, so I know how he felt. After he finally began to believe that my compliments were real, he began to get very attached to me. He started sending me over 20 messages at once, and if I didn't reply within 5 seconds, he'd start to be like, Oh, I guess you found someone better to talk to then. You're just like all the rest. It began to get frustrating at this point. I could have just blocked him and saved me the headache, but I have anxiety and I feared he'd turn up at my door someday and maybe do something drastic if I blocked him. He also tried sending me nudes to grab my attention when I didn't reply instantly, and it only got worse and worse from here. Eventually he told me he'd be in my town over the weekend and began to get very pushy about meeting up somewhere and doing abject things. When I didn't reply, he flips out and started finding me on different social medias to keep tabs on me. Facebook messages, friend requests, Instagram follows, that kind of thing. I went on a night out with some friends of mine at the time, forgetting he was in town over the weekend. He saw me walking down the street and he ran up to me. He was bawling his eyes out about me trying to avoid him and he began begging for my phone number and house address. And he was asking us if he could join us on our night out. And when we politely refused, he followed us further and tried forcing drinks into my hand when we got to the bar. Infuriated by how clingy he was being, 
I went home just to realize he got on the same bus as me and followed me back to my place before he finally disappeared. He started messaging me on Grindr about visiting me at my home sometime, or trying to find my friends to get my phone number. I finally snapped at this point and I finally blocked him. I thought that was that. I discovered that the next day he was trying to catfish me with my own pictures. He was trying to get my attention and screaming to know why I blocked him. At this point things got way too heavy and I deleted Grinder from my phone. I changed my number and moved house just to avoid him. This whole experience has really put me off dating people with severe insecurities out of fear that something like this will occur again. I've been trying to go against my nature to avoid complimenting people too much to avoid something like this happening again. And three years later, I haven't seen him since. I had a stalker in junior high and high school. This was back in the early 2000s without being too specific. As far as I know, this guy is still out there somewhere. We met each other through an extracurricular activity group. He struck me as a shy and quiet guy. I was rather shy myself. For the time being, we'd only seen each other at these extracurricular get-togethers maybe once or twice a month. I don't remember when it happened or how, but we exchanged phone numbers and he asked me to go to a dance with him at his high school, being as he was maybe two years older than me. Surprisingly, my mom agreed. I was genuinely excited. The day rolled around and we arrived at the town where the boy lived. The dance happened and we danced together pretty much exclusively from what I remember, and maybe only once did we dance very close together. Maybe a couple of months down the road, I had the opportunity to invite him to see a movie with my sisters and I, which he accepted and my parents agreed would be fine. All that happened at the time was we exchanged a few pleasantries before and after, but besides that, we only watched the movie. I wouldn't even really consider that to have been a date. After a time, the boy started calling me almost every week, which was fun and nice at first, but he was exceedingly awkward despite how long we'd been communicating. He continued to be just as awkward to talk to no matter how many times we spoke. His voice was very low and soft, and he spoke almost exclusively in short sentences, letting me do most of the talking. Honestly, there wasn't much going on in my life. We ran out of things to talk to pretty quickly, but he kept me on the phone for about an hour each time. It came to be that after a time I would get sick of talking to him, he didn't really contribute to the conversations, and I didn't have an interesting enough life to carry it on by myself. Before anyone gets mad at me for leading him on or whatever, I was a dumb teenager, raised to be nice and pleasing. I didn't cut people off when it suited me. One day I asked my mom if she could call me to dinner or something when I felt the conversation had died out. She agreed, and that became my out for a long time. In addition to the phone calls, the guy also had my address and email too. He would send me mostly funny chain letter type emails, and occasionally write me a letter. The frequency of those was never enough to bother me, but the phone calls were really wearing me down. Later on, we moved to a different state during the summer, and the guy weaseled my new phone number and address out of me. I was kind of hoping that he'd lost interest at this point, but that was not the case. The phone calls continued, and I continued having my mom shout down to me that dinner was done, or maybe other random things after 15 to 30 minutes of awkward, mostly one-sided conversation. One afternoon, out of the blue, our doorbell rang and I answered it, being the closest one to the door. To my surprise, the guy was there at the door with a super tall male friend of his whom I didn't know. I greeted the guys with a smile and asked them what they were doing there. I didn't think it was weird at first, but the longer this interaction went on, the stranger it became. For one thing, neither one said a word. They both came towards me like they were going to push past into the house, but once they noticed my parents were there, they kind of stopped and looked at each other as if they didn't know what to do. Me, not getting the gravity of the situation, invited them in and showed them the comic book I'd been working on since the beginning of that summer. If the guy spoke at all, it was only very briefly, and his friend said nothing, nor was he introduced to me. 
Despite having driven supposedly from his hometown, they only stayed for maybe five minutes and then they both left. Only later did I fit the pieces together and realize that the picture it made was dark and sinister. I decided after we moved to a different house that I wouldn't be giving him my forwarding address any longer, but he still had our home phone number since that hadn't really changed. Maybe a year or two after the surprise visit, I was home from school at her new house when the phone rang. I answered it, thinking it could be one of my friends from school, but it was that guy. I sighed, being unwilling to tell him I didn't want to talk. I just sat on the stairs with my chin in my hand, wishing my mom would come home so she could get me off the phone. After a while, the guy asked me what was wrong because I wasn't talking that much. I kept yawning and sighing, so I said, I'm just tired. You don't look tired. My eyes darted to all the windows I could see from where I sat on the stairs. Could he see me? Where was he right now? How did he find our new house when I hadn't told him the address? We weren't listed in the phone book. I suddenly blurted out, I have to go. I hung up the phone, ran up the stairs and locked myself in the bathroom, and then I called my mom. I was terrified that the next thing I would hear was glass breaking and him coming to find me in the house. My mom told me not to move and she would be home in a few minutes. Honestly, I should have called the cops. The next time he called, I told him flat out that if he ever called me again, I would call the police. I am still afraid of this guy. I don't know how he found me, and I'm a little afraid he could find me again. I'm no longer a huge pushover and state my boundaries whenever people push me, but I don't honestly know what I'd do if this were to happen again. Nor do I know what he would do if he found me. One summer I was in law school, I was swiping through Tinder looking for someone to hang out with. I matched with this guy who seemed pretty nice and looked good. Lots of shirtless photos. He was a counselor at a local high school in the metro area. We texted for a bit, talked on the phone, and then decided to grab brunch the next weekend. I met him at the restaurant and we had brunch with bottomless mimosas. He was nice and funny. He made me laugh a lot. I think we both got a little tipsy. He said he was going to go to a barbecue at his friend's house after brunch and asked me to come. He seemed pretty cool and I was having a good time, so I agreed. I had to walk my dog because I hadn't anticipated being out for that long, so I told him I would meet him back at the restaurant in 30 minutes. He said he really wanted to meet my dog and asked if he could join. I thought about it for a second, but my place was a total disaster, so I told him no. After that, I joined him back at the restaurant. We grabbed an Uber to his friend's house. There were a bunch of people drinking and talking. Everyone was nice. They had the barbecue situation going on out in the back. We talked to some people, hung out, drank. He started to get drunk and handsy, so I told him I wanted to drink and walked to the kitchen for space. A couple of minutes later, he comes into the kitchen and tries to kiss me. I kind of smiled and shrugged my way out of his grasp. I told him I needed to go to the bathroom. I asked him to grab me a drink and meet me outside in the backyard. When I left the bathroom, I walked straight out of the front door, two blocks down and took a ride. I grabbed an Uber home and started getting calls and messages, but I blocked him. He tried to reach out over social media, but I just blocked him there too. I honestly totally forgot about him. Fast forward three years. I'm sitting on my couch reading through the local news on my phone. I see a picture of this guy's face. He'd been arrested for assaulting women he met on Tinder. So about seven years ago, I had an online date, who after I told him a second date wouldn't be happening, decided to show up at my place of work. Needless to say, after that, I was extremely hesitant to dive back into the pool of online dating. In fact, since then I can count on one hand the number of men I've dated from online. But my sister and my best friend have both met men over the last year on an app that connects through Facebook. 
It's used to help filter out catfishes and also tries to find mutual friends of friends that would match with what you're looking for in a partner. So over the last month, I've been talking to guys here and there, but I hadn't yet found one that I was ready to move beyond text with. And then this guy came along. We chatted in the app and he was really nice and seemed safe. After almost three weeks of daily texting, I agreed to a date. For the first time ever, I did not stalk his social media profiles because I wanted to stop self-sabotaging. I tend to dig so deep that I would know too much before the day and have already made my decision that it would not be a second. Yes, I am extremely paranoid. So I show up for the first date and it's okay. He's mostly quiet and shy, but polite. I know I have a big personality and can dominate the conversation, so I decide to give him a second shot. As the week leading up to date two goes on, I start to get apprehensive and tell myself not to sabotage this. I realize because I didn't want to stalk his profiles, I didn't know his last name, so I text him and ask. He seems hesitant to tell me. He asks me why I need to know. I respond jokingly that I typically ask before my first date so I can know who my murderer is, but we're beyond that now. I simply want to know who I'm dating. It takes him a while to respond, but he sends it finally, and then he doesn't message again for a while. I keep my promise to myself and don't social media stalk him. I tell some friends who start to seem hesitant about me meeting him again. So date number two, I show up at the restaurant of my choice. It's pretty empty there, so there's plenty of parking up front. I park and wait. I see another car pull in and I assume it's him. He drives past all the open spots, my car included, which he knows because he walked me to it after date one. He parks over at the side of the building, gets out, walks past my car, and then messages me that he saw me in the lot. It seemed a little awkward, but I ignored it. We enjoy the date and spend an hour and a half talking on and off until the restaurant closes. We discussed where in the city we live in, the fact that we've lived in those areas our entire lives. We also discuss social media and he claims to have no social media account. This should have been a red flag since the app takes Facebook. Although the conversation was much better, I wasn't sure that I was ready to tell him I wanted to see him again, so I figured I would go home and think about it. He walks me to my car, but walks uncomfortably close behind me. I ignore this and turn to awkwardly hug him and say goodbye. I didn't open the car until he walked away a bit after a bit of a pause. I then leave and get out onto the road to head home. There aren't many cars in the area as it's a heavily restaurant laden area and most are getting ready to close for the night. I get up to the main road I need to turn down to go the direction I live and I notice the car behind me gets into the turn lane. I wasn't going home because I wanted to make a quick stop at the grocery store. I needed to grab some items for dinner the following night. The light turns red and they sit extremely far back. I look in my mirror and realize it's him. No big deal. I'm sure it was just a coincidence that he was going the same way, as there are other stores this way as well. I refuse to become paranoid and overthink things. So I get up to the intersection that the store is at, and I notice he's still in the far lane. I hop into the left-hand turn lane and turn to the store. I notice he cuts over two lanes to get behind me. That did seem odd but maybe he didn't know where the entrance was to the shopping center. But it still was a really odd coincidence he'd be coming this way, especially without sending a text or something acknowledging he's behind me. I mean, we're the only two cars on the road. I pull into the store and he pulls in one row before I do. I decide to loop around the lot and pull back onto the service road. I slowly drive back to the main road, noticing he gets out of his car and scans the parking lot. It wasn't a casual scan like, is there a better parking spot? But it was more like a prolonged, where are you scan? I get back out onto the road and drive all the way to another out of the way grocery store that I actually used to work at knowing it's a safe place. It was in a more heavily populated part of town with some friends who will be there that will make me feel safe. Needless to say, I haven't heard from him since and I think he knows I know. It took me a while, but I found his social media. His first name was not what he told me. I dug through my messages with him until I found a screenshot he'd sent me of an Instagram page. It listed mutual followers. Another red flag I should have remembered, he obviously had an Instagram. 
I started to dig through the accounts listed until I find one that's not private, and I find his profile. This leads to the ability to reverse Google Images until I find his Facebook, which has a different first name and a city that's nowhere near where he claimed to live. I guess it was time to delete my dating profile again. In 2001, I was sentenced to eight years in prison in Florida. Yeah, I was a dumbass. A few years in, and I got transferred to a close management camp, Florida State Prison. To make a long story short, I was given a job working on the wax squad. We would be let out of our cells at night to wax and clean the floors. Depending on who was working, we would be assigned to wings to wax each night. The best two wings were G-Wing and X-Wing. G-Wing is death row, and X-Wing is max lockdown. G-Wing being death row was usually kept clean and always quiet. X-Wing was small, so not much needed to be done. Anyways, in December 2005, I was assigned to G-Wing, and every night after finishing my work, the sergeant would allow us to run the wing and pass things from inmate to inmate. It was during this time I met a guy who called himself Doc. Doc would tell me about growing up dirt poor in Louisiana while we played Scrabble. I got to know him pretty well. Well, as much as one could during the time we played Scrabble. I worked G-Wing for about a month before I got the news I'd be transferring back to a general population camp. It's pretty crazy that serial killers seem so damn normal until that switch in their brain clicks. Danny Rollins, aka Doc would be put to death in 2006 for killing five students at the University of Florida in Gainesville. He was the inspiration behind the movie Scream. Back in the summer of 2020, I was 14. I would spend a lot of time with my cousin. We both loved going on walks and would always walk in the neighborhood near her house. One night I was spending the night over and we decided to go on a walk. It was around 10pm. I'd also like to mention that the roads weren't very well lit, so it was very dark out. We were used to doing that, so we weren't scared at all. While we were walking, a white jeep started driving very close to us. The guy who was driving lowered his window, and there was another guy with them. They both appeared to be around 25 years old. The guys just weirdly stared at us for like two minutes. And then the guy in the passenger seat started asking weird questions like, Are you girls not scared of the dog? And after asking that, they drove away. Me and my cousin were relieved, thinking it was just some sort of joke. But unfortunately, we noticed the jeep's lights on the road and it seemed like they were going back and forth before coming to our level again. And in this time, the guy in the passenger seat asked if we wanted a ride home. He said they'd take care of us while smiling, and at this moment my cousin's eyes opened wide. After that, they drove away again. Me and my cousin were petrified, we couldn't even speak. We could still hear the jeep, so we didn't want to run home because we were scared they would follow us. We hid inside of a garden behind trees for ten minutes. The jeep came back, but fortunately they didn't see us, and when we couldn't see the lights anymore, we sprinted home. We got there and cried a lot. My cousin told me she saw a knife, and there were some sort of pills in the back seat. So guys in the white jeep, let's never meet again. This happened back in 2016 on Christmas Eve night. We'd just gotten back from my sister's and we were sitting in the car for a few. It was fairly cold, and also as a side note, we had a bunch of cats, so at first we hadn't thought anything of it. We sat there for about ten minutes and we heard rustling. Not thinking anything because we have cats, we blew it off. Not even a minute later, we heard it again. My mom just so happened to look up and there was a bald man in a wife beater tank top and shorts. My mom and I both had that uneasy feeling because of his choice of clothing. It was 32 degrees and he was in summertime clothes. Weird. My mom has a window cracked and he was barely a foot from our car. 
She yelled out to him and said to back away from the car. What a surprise he didn't. He continued to stand there and stare at us. My mom decided to try and scare him. She yelled out to him that she had a gun and would blow his shit away. She didn't have a gun on her, but she definitely made sure he thought she did. He threw his hands up but continued to get closer to our car. So my mom threw a phone at me and I was told to dial 911. I told the dispatcher what was going on. She said she'd have the police there right away. My mother proceeded to try and run him down, but he went between two porches and our car wouldn't fit because of how close they were. Finally, about half an hour later, the cops finally showed up and took our statement. The station was right down the road from us, and if he had actually tried something, I felt as if it would have been too late. If he hadn't have run off, I wouldn't thought his intentions were ill, but he ran. I was so pissed off it took so long for the cops to show up. The cops stayed and looked everywhere for him, but they came up empty. My mother and I didn't sleep through that night. We didn't even finish opening presents because we feared he'd come back. The police thought that maybe he wanted to steal the gifts that were in the car, but we may never know. The scariest part is, months later it came to light that he escaped jail. He was put in for assault, so who knows what he would have done to my mom and I. This story goes back, and thankfully it never escalated into anything more than what it was. A period of time that instilled the fear of God in me, but it also taught me a valuable lesson about internet safety and the cautionary tale generated from my young naivete, false security and teenage invincibility. We've all been there at one point or another. When you're young, you don't think about the potential dangers entailing from using the internet with reckless abandon. I knew there were predators out there, but I never applied much thought in regard to it besides the standard precautions. I never gave out my last name or location to anyone. I knew that much at least. I used to go on an online message board. It was a tight-knit community. Everyone knew each other on a personal level, and we were good friends. I had plenty of good friends in my immediate life, but I've made many friendships through the site. They're great people, and to this day, I still am in contact with some of them. I even met one of them while on vacation last summer, which happened to be nothing short of a wonderful experience. But there was one user who was different. Being a very friendship-oriented community, everyone was welcoming of him the moment he joined, but anyone could see that there was always something about him that was off. He was just... odd. But at the same time, he came off as a sweet, naive character. He wouldn't hurt a fly, we thought. I felt sorry for him. His lack of social grace and people skills had me inclined to believe he didn't have many friends in his life. I foolishly made the mistake of befriending him or at the least, showing him friendliness. It was a short-sighted decision, and one that would result in a long and traumatizing ordeal for me. He became obsessed with me. There's no other way to describe it. I shrugged it off as some weird online crush that would pass, but it never did. If anything, his obsession with me grew stronger every day. It started off small and innocent enough. He'd always praise me and agree with anything I said, even if my view was dramatically different than his. He would continually single me out and shower me with praise, but it was always in a seemingly respectful manner. We all thought he was awkward and harmless. Then, his antics became more fervent. He would hound me multiple times a day to Skype with him. I repeatedly declined, until one day I agreed, only to verify that he was indeed who he said he was. He wasn't necessarily rude or offensive in the beginning, just awkward and eccentric. I kept the session brief because he made me uncomfortable, but I didn't think much of it at the time either. He seemed harmless, albeit strange. I felt sorry for him, honestly. I didn't want him to be outcasted. Nobody ever suspected there to be any element of malevolence in his behavior. But then the qualities I initially dismissed as quirks gradually became something more sinister. He began revealing things about himself to me that he surely knew made me uncomfortable. About how his father would abuse his mother, about how he would hurt animals as a child. All of it was purposeful, even if he did play it off as being clueless and too socially inept to fully understand the inappropriateness of his behavior at the time. I stopped talking with him after that, but I still didn't completely shut him out. 
My view of him was that he was socially awkward, but he still had no nefarious intent. Nobody suspected anything, and he seemed so naive and innocent. Around that time, I started getting creepy anonymous messages. Trolls started flooding the board, personally singling me out. As creepy as it was, I took it all with a grain of salt. This wasn't the first time the board was overrun with trolls. We'd had the troll problem for a long time now, and this didn't seem any different. I didn't make the connection between any of it and him. One day he asked to join a Skype call between my friend and I. We hesitantly obliged, not wanting to hurt his feelings. To our disgust, he started to touch himself in the call. I cut all ties with him after that, and he apologized profusely before disappearing. I thought that was the end of it, but it was just the beginning. After his vanishing act, the creepy messages became more violent and threatening. I was receiving at least a hundred a day from multiple anonymous guises. It did not take a genius to figure out who was doing this. Before I knew it, I was being impersonated on multiple accounts throughout social media sites. My inbox became flooded with hundreds of messages threatening to kill or hurt me in the most barbaric ways every week. Anonymous accounts would send me collages of pictures of me from sources I've never shared with anyone, and I had no idea how the person gained access to any of them. I've never given out my personal social media. In some of these pictures, my eyes would be cut out or the image would be perversely doctored. The board became flooded with multiple anonymous accounts all posting threatening messages about me. The person even made a website dedicated to his plan to hurt and kill me, but it was taken down not long after. I started saving everything this nutcase sent me so I could compile evidence and request it for performance of an extensive IP check. One of the SOC accounts that was checked matched up with 200 other accounts, including, you guessed it, his original account. I always knew it was him, but to have it confirmed that this psychopath created 200 accounts to use and stalk and terrorize me was finally enough to truly unsettle me. Up until a whole year of his online stalking antics, I wasn't too bothered. Yes, I was creeped out, but I wasn't fearing for my life. That is, until the call started coming. Somehow, and to this day, I have no idea how the fuck he got my home phone number. I never told him my last name or anything. There was nothing that would have led to my personal information. My best guess is that he must have acquired it from my last name. The only way he would have gotten it was from my Facebook. I never told anyone what my surname was. How he found my Facebook, though, I honestly don't know. He would call my house at all hours of the day and night. I never answered. My dad did all the time, though. It didn't matter how many times my dad would hang up. Within five seconds, this creep would be calling back. This cycle would go on every hour of the day. It got to the point where none of us was sleeping because he was calling non-stop every hour until the wee hours of the morning. At this point, I was beside myself with fear. I expected any day he would show up at my door. If he had my phone number, he certainly had my address. I became so paranoid I put tape all over my webcams in case he somehow managed to hack them as well. No matter what, I couldn't shake the feeling that he could somehow see me, that he was always watching me, even though I knew he was safely across the continent from me. I spent many sleepless nights fearing that he'd show up any second and try to kill me. We contacted our phone service provider asking them to trace the call. The number itself was untraceable, but they were eventually able to pinpoint the address of the caller. Sure enough, it was coming from a state I knew he lived in, because he had told me once he lived there. I knew without a shadow of a doubt it was him doing this, but what could I really do about it? The cops wouldn't care about some threatening phone calls and messages from a creep miles and miles away. It went on for two years. I told my family what was happening immediately once the call started but there wasn't much else we could do about it besides block the multiple numbers he'd call from. We eventually just unplugged the phone altogether to get a decent night's sleep. Needless to say, I eventually reached the end of my rope. My cyberstalker, as psychopathic as he was, was not the brightest crayon in the box. Before he began his reign of terror on me, he had revealed all sorts of information about himself. He even posted them online. I knew what state he lived in, his parents' name, his full name, things like that. 
Call it the typical hubris characteristic of a not-so-smart psychopath. He made it all too easy for me to turn the tables on him. I went from ignoring and avoiding him to actively stalking him back. I did some digging and creeping of my own. I was able to acquire personal information of his. It honestly wasn't very hard finding his parents' phone number. I had a last name and he had once told me their first names. Bingo. He was a twenty-something year old that I knew lived with his parents. I thought at the very least it was about time his family found out what he's been up to. A call was made to them revealing everything, and I do mean everything. I don't know for sure if they ever got the message. It was left as a voicemail since nobody answered, but I assume that phone call had its intended effect, because it's been years and I haven't heard a peep from him since. I hope he got the help he needed, but frankly, I don't care what became of him so as long as he's not tormenting anyone else. In hindsight, it's pretty funny that writing him out to his own parents was enough to stop him, but it's not all too surprising. For a twenty-something year old, he was incredibly childish. So, psychopathic cyberstalker, let's never meet again. For your sake, because I am not afraid of you anymore. For context, I'm a 24-year-old female, I live in a very populated city where people drive a lot. I'm still shaken up by this. The other night, I parked my car outside. I went to let my dog in my house and went back out to get my stuff. It was about 6pm and completely dark outside because of the winter. I get into my driver's seat, lock the car, and I'm still sitting there for about a minute getting my stuff together. All of a sudden I see a man walk in front of my car to the driver's side window. He's holding something up to my window. I get extremely panicked. It was a sketchy situation then, and a sketchy situation now. The next few bits are blurry. I'm looking at him in panic. He motions for me to roll my window down. I look into the back of my car to see if my dog is there to protect me, and I realize she's not there as I just let her into the house. And then I realized I had the back windows both 75% open. Then a thought pops into my mind. I can drive away. My car is on. I shift the car into drive. He reaches back onto either the window, the door, or the side of the car. I'm not quite sure. I start to drive and he backs up. I pull into the street and almost hit another car. I end up pulling out and leaving, shaking. The next day I realize my landlord had a camera pointed at the front of the house to see if packages get stolen. I asked if he had clips from the night before. He did. The only thing is, it's motion censored. It only shows the movement when my car is pulling out. It showed the man walk away from the car and he had a huge wooden plank or something in his hands. It was hidden behind his back. Whatever it was, it was at least a good three foot. It showed him walk down the street a bit, and then he turned around and went the other way. I wish I didn't even see that video. I was so scared before, and I thought maybe I was overreacting, but now I know he was hiding something behind his back. Whatever it was could have been a weapon or something. I am very thankful I trusted my instincts. Someone on a neighborhood website said that the car got stolen two streets over, so maybe he wanted my car. My boyfriend had an operation on his foot a few days prior, so he was still using crutches. We wanted to go to the city center to hang out with friends and get some drinks, but since cycling wasn't an option because of the crutches, we decided to walk. We didn't live that far out from the center, about a 15 minute walk, so it seemed like the most logical choice at the time. We left the city center around 2 in the morning. The way to our house is heavily populated and there are always people on the streets. This night, however, it was quiet. We were about five minutes on the way when I spotted a guy on the opposite side of the street. He was looking at the shop windows, but also keeping an eye on us. And I suddenly felt very vulnerable, considering my boyfriend using crutches and me being quite small at about five foot one. The guy walked in the opposite direction, but then walked back again. He did this a few times. I tried to walk faster, but my boyfriend couldn't keep up, 
so we had to keep a slow pace. All of a sudden, the guy crossed the road really fast in a straight line towards us. I'm small but fierce, so I was ready to fight. And then out of nowhere, around the corner, a homeless man came walking towards us and the man. He was shouting and cursing to no one in particular. Apparently the homeless man had frightened the creepy guy so much, he decided to immediately run away. We walked as quickly as we could, and we kept looking back to see if the creepy guy had been following us. But thankfully, we didn't see him again. I fully believe that creep had bad intentions, maybe robbing us, maybe even worse. But I also believe that homeless man saved us, intentional or not and I am very grateful. I was walking my dog in the rain. It was about 6.30 p.m. A man comes up to me. He's wearing a red jacket and seems to be in his 40s or 50s. He's missing a few teeth. He greets my dog and we talk about him. He gives me a chew toy and we play with the dog for a bit. As I'm about to leave, I give him the chew toy back and he insists I keep it. After a few minutes of back and forth, I decide to take it. I thank him and wish him a good night. I get home and examine the chew toy closer. I take out the squeak cap. Inside, I see a chip that is blinking with a red color. I immediately grab a pen and pick the chip out and snap it in two. My mind is filled with a lot of questions about why this happened, and what I should do about it. So I used to work as a personal trainer at a very familiar gym in the city, to help pay for college. The neighborhood this gym was located has two other gyms across the street, so we would have a lot of clients changing from place to place. I worked the night shift since I was out of class at about 6pm, so from 6.30 to 10.30 I was working. Usually, a lot of guys would go for experimental classes at night, and I was known for working with the bodybuilders. At around 9pm, this huge guy with a very arrogant posture walked in for an experimental class. The secretary immediately sent him to me, and I was more than happy to help him out. Although, I was pretty sure he already worked out and needed no help whatsoever. Weird, but okay. Throughout this whole hour, this guy would ask me very personal questions. Where do you live? Are you single? What's your shoe size? That kind of thing. And as I was working, I just politely tried to keep our conversation focused on training and exercise and stuff. When the class was over, he looked at me and said, Can I have your number? I said to him, I'm sorry, but I have a fiancé, I replied. And that part was true. Are you sure? I don't usually take no as an answer, the creepy guy said. Yes, I am just here to help you exercise properly. Nothing else, I said to him. Then this guy puts his finger in my face and says, When I get my gun, you won't say no to me. And he walked out of the door. For almost a month, I needed to ask a male co-worker to go with me to the parking lot because this guy would be at the corner waiting for me to get out. He would stare at me and smile and wait for me to leave. Later I found out he was at the gym across the street and took my license plate. I had to ask one of my clients, who was a cop, to scare him out. Until this day, I cannot get his smiling face out of my head. I was about 10 years old and went to Six Flags in New Jersey with my mom and my friend at the time. At the end of the night when the park closed, they gave an announcement to leave, and everyone makes their way to the parking lot. The park was filled to max capacity that day, so we had to park the car five lots out from the entrance. Since it's a nightmare to get out of the parking lot once it closes, and we parked so far away, my mom decided it's best for us to leave the park 30 minutes before closing time. We get to the car and belt it up, and the car doesn't start. My mom keeps trying, but to no avail. My mom calls a tow truck and my friend's mom to pick us up. 
My mom had a tow friend, but it would be 45 minutes since we were so far out, and it was late. In the meantime, me and my friend sat in the parking lot next to a car, playing with makeup until the tow truck would get there. A strange man pulls up and asks if we need help. We told him we were fine and the tow truck was on the way. He wanted more details, strangely. What time is the tow truck coming? He creepily smiled. At this point, me and my friend looked at each other and gave a nod like, this isn't right. We got into my mom's car because we had an uneasy gut feeling. Fifteen minutes go by and everyone is pretty much gone at this point. It's just us in the parking lot. That creepy man comes back from earlier. He pulled up next to my mom's window and tried to get it to roll down the window. He starts tapping his wrist like he needed the time, even though he had a clock we could see that was in his car. My mom ignored him four minutes later and he drives off. He parks five lots away from us and sits there. Two security cars from the park pulls up next to him and they start to chat. Thank God, I thought. By now the tow truck guy calls my mom to tell her he can't get into the park since they lock the gates with chains. Thinking quickly, my mom beeps and flashes her lights at the security to get them to come over so she can ask them to open the gates for us. Little ten-year-old me gets out and starts jumping, flaunting my arms. They completely ignore us and drive away. The creepy guy stayed parked. Great. My mom's determined tow truck friend comes in through the exit, on the opposite side of traffic just to get to us. He chains up the car and we go to leave out the exit that was just open, because the tow truck guy came in through there, right? The exit was chained shut. The entrance was chained shut. The security was nowhere in sight. It was just that creepy guy. While the tow truck guy says F it and rams his truck through the gates, he broke the chains, letting us out like a badass. We're racing out of the exit, and guess who's on our tail? The creepy guy. We went separate ways, and that was the end of it. This story is from about 10 years ago. Maybe not as creepy as some others on here, but it still freaks me out a bit. I was driving home from my sister's house late at night, probably around midnight. There really weren't any cars on the interstate. When I was about halfway home, I was passing a car who was going a bit slow for the speed limit. As I was pulling next to them, I saw the driver out of the corner of my eye just staring at me with his puzzled look. I thought nothing of it and just kept going. All of a sudden, he decides to speed up and keep pace with me. I look over again and he's got the same look on his face. Then I noticed that there was another guy in the passenger seat looking over at me too. I didn't think anything of it again, but when he slowed down and kind of passed over two lanes to get to me and keep pace again, I started to get concerned. I guess he wanted the passenger to see me better. I just kept driving and they stayed behind me. I'm switching lanes to see if they do too. They did. They followed me every move. I get to my exit and of course they follow me off. There's a light at the bottom of the exit. I get there and kind of see them somewhat in the rearview mirror. I can see them pointing at me and getting somewhat animated or hyped when doing it. I go on green and they follow. I knew I was getting followed for sure. I wasn't leading them to my house. I have a concealed carry permit and had my 9mm with me. I was not going to pull over on the street and shoot, so I decided to make sure they were following. Took a few turns here and there and they followed every step. I decided I'm not taking this shit. I pull into a Walmart parking lot and park. They pull in a few seconds later. When they did, I got out, gun in hand. They didn't see it right away because they pulled towards my passenger side. The driver began to roll down his window and started to say something. The passenger unclicked his seatbelt like he was going to jump out. Before the driver could even finish whatever he was saying, I raised my gun up and pointed. I yelled, Who do you think you're following? 
His eyes were like saucers. He just yelled, oh shit, whipped his car around and floored it out of the lot. I just got back in and drove home, but I didn't go straight home. I took a lot of extra turns to make sure they weren't following again. The whole thing had me rattled for the rest of the night. I slept with my gun on the nightstand, which I never do. I felt I had to share this encounter because honestly, I'd never thought I'd experience something like this myself. This was not a scary monster or even a ghost. This was a close call, or so I believe. For a bit of background leading up to the night in question, I was graduating from university the next day. I was determined to get an early night's sleep, so I'd gone round to my friends for a wee spliff. But don't get me wrong, I'm not a pothead. It was more of a celebration. Anyway, I remembered I had to take my mom to the hospital. Nothing serious, but she had to be taken and picked up. And then I'd remembered we'd rolled the joint in the car. That's a disaster. She'd smell and see it everywhere. I made a mental note to stop and vacuum the car. We have a 24-hour gas station really close to us, but it's sort of on its own as there's no houses or buildings around the area. I pull in and look over to the shop. They use a hatch after 12 and don't allow you inside, but luckily I didn't need anything. It had just ticked over 4am and I had to be up at 10. I just wanted to get this done and get out of there. The vacuum machine was behind the coal shed, and it was well lit. I put on some music on my phone and got to work. It cost me a pound for four minutes vacuuming. Not too bad, I thought. There wasn't anyone else in the parking lot except for this one white van, but the guy inside was yelling wildly into his phone. It wasn't too loud, but he was making a lot of hand gestures. I felt for him. Probably some guy who was driving all night, but hey. I cracked on with the work at hand. I looked over again and caught his eye. He looked away and I laughed. Love at first sight, I thought to myself. I was in an amazing mood. Then it started to get weird. The summer sun was already starting to rise and the street lights went out, including those illuminating the gas station. It wasn't that dark, but it was noticeably creepier and I was really keen to get a move on. I stared over at the van and saw the man watching me again, still talking on the phone, but then something happened that I really, really freaked out at. I saw someone lean forward from the other seat and peek around the guy. They immediately slammed themselves back against the seat. That's when I realized the guy on the phone was in the passenger seat and wasn't driving. I hadn't noticed it when I drove in, but I shrugged it off and set the vacuum cleaner back, ready to leave. I threw all of my stuff back into the car and went to unlock the door. When I heard a voice say, Excuse me. I swear I nearly shat myself right then and there. My heart was absolutely pounding, but I recognized the voice. The gas station was a spa, the same chain of stores I work in. The guy who'd spoken was my old supervisor. He'd moved to the 24-hour store not too long ago. He began to shout at me for using the vacuum so late at night. The two guys in the van just sat and watched us, waiting for him to go away. Then he said something to me that made this whole situation real. I'm gonna have to ask you to come inside. We aren't allowed to let customers in past 11, even in stores open until 12. This is a big no-no, especially as I knew I wasn't doing anything wrong. I allowed him to lead the way, and the moment we were in the store, he put the shutter down. He told me he'd been watching the guys in the van. They'd been sitting there for nearly three hours. Little did I know, my old supervisor saw someone get out of the back of the van, and as he described it, put a bit of masking tape across a few O's in their number plate, effectively creating a new one. I began to panic. I looked outside and noticed the van was gone. After checking the CCTV, it was shown that they sped away the minute I was taken into the store. We called the police and they examined what little footage was there immediately. They took the tape and thanked us for it. At one point on the CCTV, the guy who got out of the back of the van turned to get back in. It looked like he had a knife in his hand. I realize I sound dramatic and this story isn't exactly thrilling, but I cannot imagine what would have happened if my old supervisor hadn't been looking out for me. I am never vacuuming at 4am anymore, that's for sure.
I was homesick, probably on a Tuesday or Wednesday, bumming around in my pajamas. I had a pretty bad cold, so I was mostly hunkered down on my couch watching TV. My house is out in the country, so I sometimes leave my blinds open, as my dog likes sitting in the window. About 2pm, there's a knock on my door. No one ever just shows up to my house, unless it's my parents or someone I've invited. Curious and confused, I look out my window and see a white van in my driveway, and then I saw a chubbier man standing on my porch. Knowing I couldn't fake that I wasn't home, since my TV was on and my blinds were open, I open the door a bit blocking the back with my foot. This guy launches into this spiel about having too much meat for these home delivery packages, and if I bought some today, he would knock 50% off the price of anything I wanted. I start to explain that I really don't eat meat often enough to spend $200 on a package, when from the other side of the van I see another guy coming towards us, carrying a white box. Now, I'm not typically one to judge people on appearance, but this guy looks completely sketchy. His clothes are not professional at all. He's got a grungy hat on, tattoos all over his hands, broken teeth. He also acted shifty. Looking around and peeking into my window, he wasn't even close to the type of person you want delivering anything to your house. This is where I start to get scared and try to defuse the situation calmly to get them to go away. The first guy said, Oh good, so we can come inside and show you what we've got here. We could lay it out over your table, completely glossing over the fact that I've said repeatedly that I don't eat meat. I tell them I have a dog who really doesn't like people. They cannot come in, and I'm not interested. There was no way I was letting them in. The first guy proceeds to lay the packages on my porch, telling me how great these pork chops are and how juicy the steak is. Meanwhile, the second guy is again peeking into my windows, pacing around the front of my house and generally acting like a sketch ball. I say again I'm not interested, but if they have a card, I'd be happy to give them a call in the future. Well, they didn't have a card on them, but he did give me some generic website where I could apparently contact them. They finally left, and I called the non-emergency police line from my area. The police officer said that there is a meat delivery service around, but their vehicles are usually well marked. They hadn't even gotten a license yet that year to be selling in the area. I was terrified for days that they were casing my house to return to, that they would try to rob me or something, but they never came back. I was about 19 and still in college at the time, I always had a hard time studying at my house, so I would usually go to a coffee shop in the evening or late at night to study. Around that time, I would just go to McDonald's near my house, grab a burger, and study in one of the booths since it was closer, and I didn't want to drive to the city. This day, I was sitting in the booth closest to the bathroom when an older man walks by, probably in his 70s, on his way to the bathroom. He stops to look at me and tells me he loves my hair, I thank him and go back to studying, but he was still standing there. He continues to say, My mother used to have chestnut-colored hair like that. She was beautiful. I'm not trying to be rude, so I respond with something generic and go back to work. He then sits down at my table, uninvited. He begins talking to me about his daughter, who's likely about my age. He goes on and on about how he likes to visit her and play his music for her. He pulls out his phone and tells me he's going to show me a video of her. While I'm not thrilled that he's sitting with me, he seemed harmless and maybe a bit lonely, so I just let him enjoy some company. He pulls up the video and shows it to me. To my horror, it's shaky footage of a girl that's likely in her 20s, laying in a hospital bed in what appeared to be a vegetative state, her mouth gaping wide open. He was talking and singing to her in the background. He then breaks it to me that she's in a coma, I don't remember what I said to that exactly, but I expressed how sorry I was that she was in that condition. I then tried to call my boyfriend who I was meeting there after work. It's about 11pm now. The man is still sitting at my table. He was oversharing details about his life with me, while I am clearly now weirded out and trying to ignore him. He then gets up and I watch him walk out to the front doors to a large white van. The man opens the side door, and from what I can tell, 
He'd been living in the van. The glimpse I got of the inside showed me a lot of cluttered belongings such as clothes, bedding, boxes, and that kind of thing. He crawled in and I thought he was gone for good. I go back to studying for my big math test. I hear the front doors open again and look up. It's him. He walks directly back to my table and hands me a business card. He tells me to remember to vote for him for president and that he's out campaigning. Eventually he goes back to his van and takes off. The car just had his name and for president written on it, complete with a cheesy slogan. Needless to say, after that and a couple of run-ins with a homeless man, I stopped studying at McDonald's. This story takes place when I was 17, in the small border town I grew up in. I lived in a house on a steep hill, and I took the bus every day, to and from school. Classes started very early, and no other students lived on my small street. It must have been during the winter, because it was very cold every morning, which wasn't a usual thing where I lived. I remember being afraid every morning, because it was very dark outside. I only had the light of the moon to guide me, and back then, Cell phones didn't have flashlights that you could use to guide your way in the dark. There were only three other houses on my small street, and they were all on a big hill with paved driveways going down, and they met on a gravelly road. The houses were arranged on a gravel cul-de-sac, which many people used to turn around if they went down the wrong road. I lived in a desert area, so there were leafless mesquite trees and cactus around, to where it was very reminiscent of a forest or dense flora area. It was so quiet that all you could hear were the bats fluttering around the one streetlight that decided to work on the off day, but usually it was just pitch black, along with the yapping of coyotes and crickets chirping. Other than that, all I could hear was the crunching of gravel beneath my feet. The first time I saw the man in the van, I wasn't that surprised. A lot of the time we would get these white vans passing through because they delivered papers to the surrounding houses. I then started to realize that this van would stop right next to me when I was standing alone, waiting for the bus to arrive. There was a stop sign there, but there was no reason for the person in the van to be stopped there for like 10 minutes until the bus picked me up. He must have started to get brave, because after that, he would roll his window down and ask me if I was cold. I'd say yes and ignore his presence. I'd pretend like nothing happened. I just figured he was trying to be nice to me. He was an older man in his 70s. Again the next day he pulls up even closer to me. Are you cold? You look beautiful today. You look so cold. This time I just ignored him and waited for the bus to pull up and got in. I would watch his van pull away after my bus left. He kept doing this for two weeks until one day he looked at me through his window and said, I could use a pretty girl like you. It's cold outside. You must be so cold. Come inside my van and I'll keep you warm until your bus gets here. I looked at him in horror, and luckily the bus pulled up a few seconds later. I decided I needed to tell someone about him. My dad is in law enforcement, and I told him what had been happening. He asked me what the guy looked like and when the van would pull up. He said I should have told him sooner, but he's glad I told him when I did. He called the police and I told them what had been happening. They said they had similar reports in the area and then they would catch him. The next day, the police hid behind me, where the cul-de-sac is, and I stood in my usual spot where I stood for the bus. I remember that day, the streetlight was finally working, and I could see the man's face in the van. He didn't realize the officer was there until he made a full turn around the cul-de-sac and started towards me. The police turned their lights on and pulled him over. I could hear him yelling as the bus pulled in and I left for school. I could see the police lights glaring on the bus windows. The next day my dad sat me down and said he needed to talk to me. Apparently the man had many suspicious things in the van. He had duct tape, plastic bags, zip ties, trash bags, a machete and some other strange things. He claimed to be a newspaper man and he would distribute the newspapers to my neighbors. Yet the police never found one newspaper in his van when they searched it. My dad ran a background check on him and he had a CD passed. I'm not sure whatever happened to the man legally, but he never showed his face on the street again. 
but whenever I stood at the end of the street, all I could think about is if he had gotten the courage to step out of his van, that I would have no way to defend myself, and no one would have heard from me again. A couple of years ago, I worked at this 24-hour diner. Sometimes I worked the night shift. One day I was at Walmart after an afternoon shift I worked, in my really painfully recognizable uniform. The guy in front of me had these crazy eyes and was taking a sweet time bagging up his groceries. And then he said hi. So I just said hi back. And then he said, Oh, you work at Max's diner? I replied back to him and confirmed it. He left the store. I bagged my groceries and walked out a couple of minutes later. Well, the guy was outside and saw me get into my car. He didn't follow me though, or so I thought. And that was the end of that. So fast forward two weeks. I'm working the night shift and it's 2am. I was sitting outside smoking a cigarette and talking on the phone. This white van pulls up and guess who hops out? He said to me, Hey girl, I've been looking for you. Do you remember me? His eyes were bugging out of his head and he had a few buddies in his van. I stuck my phone in my pocket and he grabbed my wrist and started pulling me to the van. And then he said, Come hang out with us. I said, Fuck no, dude. I yanked away and started backing towards the door. He kept asking if he could at least get my number. I just ran inside to the back and told my almost 7 foot tall co-worker. But by the time he went to investigate, they drove off. Two nights later, one of the windows was shot out with a BB gun during a night shift that I wasn't working, but my co-worker said it was a bunch of guys who drove by in a white van. I was around 8 or 9 when this happened, and I went to visit my grandparents on the other side of town. They lived 5 minutes away from an elementary school and I would often walk to it and play on the playground. A young family with a daughter my age lived right next door, and we would play together whenever I came over. One day we decided to take a walk after having fun at the park. We still had energy, and dinner wasn't ready yet, so we wandered through the neighborhood. We were laughing and picking flowers along the way when I noticed a white van. We continued our walk, and before you know it, I'd completely forgotten all about it. My friend had stopped to tie her shoe, and I was looking around for more flowers to pick, when I realized that we had gone a lot further than we ever had before. I didn't recognize the houses in front of me, and it was going to get dark soon. As soon as the thought enters my mind, I see the white van rounding the corner, heading towards us. My stomach sank. It was the same van from earlier, but something seemed different. They stopped in the middle of the road and stared at us. I tell my friend that we need to go, and I ask her if she recognizes the houses around us, or the van in front of us. She doesn't. I tell her that we should probably head home, and she agrees. The van then drives past us slowly, and the man in the passenger seat rolls down the window. Do you girls know where Applegate Street is? He asks us. We both say no, and I get a good look at the van. It has a picture of a vacuum on the side, and a company name I don't remember. He tells us that they're cleaning houses in the neighborhood, and they can't find the street they're looking for. I know I'm not supposed to talk to strangers, so I grab my friend's hand and tell the men I'm sorry, but no we don't, and keep walking. We begin our walk home, and my uneasy feeling grows stronger every step of the way. We were going back the same way we came when I start to recognize the houses. We're about ten minutes away, and then I hear it. The van coming down the street behind us. I tell my friend to grab a rock from the path, because now I'm sure they're following us. I'm scared, but I know we're not too far from my grandparents' house. We can get there faster if we run, so that's what we do. Picture two terrified eight-year-olds running down the street with softball-sized rocks in their hands. I look back and see the van racing after us. I can hear someone yelling. It's the man driving, and I hear the word directions. I stop because I'm out of breath, and I think maybe that's all they wanted. I was probably just overreacting, but boy was I wrong. As soon as I stop, my friend does too. So does the van. I get a good look at the driver this time, 
He's explaining that all they wanted was directions, but I know that something's wrong, and before I get the words out, the sliding door of the van opens and a man in the back is coming towards us. We throw the rocks at him and run as fast as we can to my grandparents' house. When we get inside, we start crying our eyes out. My mom had apparently arrived when we were gone. I run to her and my grandma and tell them what happened. She runs outside yelling at my grandma to call the cops while she looks for the van. She sees it parked two houses down and charges at it like a bull. I had run out after her, so I'm standing there screaming. My mom is tiny, but she's fierce and in mama bear mode. The van starts to pull away and I'll never forget what happened next. She jumped on the hood of the van and starts beating on the window. They stop and she yells that she's making a citizen's arrest and that they need to stop their car. They act like they're going to and they slowly pull over and park. She gets off of the hood and as soon as she does, they race off. Thank God she managed to remember their license plate. When the police got there, they asked us so many questions and I try to explain everything that happened from the first moment I saw them. They run the license plate number and it comes back as out of state. They say I can go now and they want to speak to my mom alone. When she comes back inside, I hear her talking to my grandma in the kitchen. What she said makes my blood run cold to this day. The man who owned the car he was linked to a kidnapping out of state and had a bolo out for his arrest. The police ended up arresting all three men. We had to go in to give an official statement. My friend, my mom and I, picked all three of them out of the lineup. They were charged with kidnapping out of state and or attempted kidnapping. I never went walking in my grandparents' neighborhood after that, and I still cringe when I see a white van. And that's when I realized there's a reason for the creepy white van stories after all. So I lived in a pretty nice area with my husband and some family friends. We lived there for a few years with nothing bad happening around us. It felt like a very safe neighborhood. Now for context, I'm a very short female and considered disabled, even though I look fine. But I could never really beat anyone up since my disability has limited my activity severely. Anyways, on to the story. This happened about a year before we moved in. I had some stories pop up on Facebook of some traffickers that were targeting women and children at the local store we lived right behind. I was freaked out and so I made a point not to go to the store without my husband. I still got the news article about people being followed and grabbed and kidnapped from the store, but I felt pretty safe as long as I didn't go anywhere without my husband. I was going to work one day. I worked about 15 minutes away from our house. It was a call center, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. There were fields every which way. I worked the afternoon shift and was one of the last people to leave at night. I had to stop and get gas and was a little freaked out because I was scared to go anywhere without my husband. But I wasn't going to make it to work and back home, so I had no choice. So I stopped at the gas station and was slightly relieved that it was super busy. I got out and started pumping my gas when this big van pulled up in the spot next to mine. The guy got out and started pumping his own gas. He then walked around the pump and got between my car and I. He smiled and said, Wow, your car is so clean. How do you get it so clean? I was flabbergasted at the question. My car was a mess. It was dirty with bugs and stuff on it. Why don't you show me how you get it so clean? He reached out to touch me, but I jerked back. Another car pulled up behind me and a guy got out. I think he freaked the other guy out because he walked back to his van. I quickly finished pumping my gas and got into my car. I locked the doors and sped away. A few minutes later I look out of my window and the van is behind me, pretty much riding my bumper. I could see the guy smiling and laughing with some other guy. I was pretty freaked out but figured he was just going to the freeway. We passed the freeway but he kept following me and at this point I was very freaked out. The only place on this road now is my work. I called my husband but he didn't answer since he was at work. I was freaking out so I just picked up the speed and continued to work. I kept looking back and the van was still there, only just a bit farther away. I made it to work. 
It was a large building with lots of cars in the parking lot. I parked right in front of the doors in a handicapped spot and ran straight in. I looked back through the locked doors and saw the guy stopped in front, looking really pissed off. I ran up to my department and went right up to a friend who was ex-military. He carried multiple guns on him at all times. I cried as I told him what happened. I got to work and was still freaked out all day. We closed up and as I was walking down to my car, I took a peek out of the window and saw the white van. I couldn't see anyone in there and I wasn't even sure it was the same van. I ran back to my department and told my friend what was going on. He pulled out his gun and walked me outside. The van had now moved to right behind my car. My friend walked me to his car. We got in and he drove me right to my car. He then followed me all the way home and sat outside until I was inside the house. I could see the van following us, but once we passed the freeway, it turned onto it. The next afternoon on my way to work, I passed the gas station and the van pulled out. Again, they followed me to work, but they turned away once I got to the parking lot. This went on for about a week. They would follow me to work, leave, and then be outside when I was leaving. My friend would always walk me out. My buddy told me they were probably trying to learn my schedule so they could figure out a time to jump me. He insisted I take one of his guns just in case he wasn't there to walk me out. I didn't want it though as I was afraid that if I had one, I would get pulled over for something mundane and then get into trouble for having a gun not in my name and not having a permit for it. I was telling my husband that evening about how this van was still following me. He suggested that I should call the cops and let them know. I honestly don't know why I didn't think of that. So the next morning when I was about to get ready for work, I called. I told them everything and then I left for work. Just like clockwork, the van pulled out of the gas station and started following me. We were on the long stretch of road that nothing was on when I spotted a car parked off to the side of the road. I passed and then the car passed, and then the parked car's lights came on. It was the police. The van was pulled over. I later found out that the men following me had several warrants for sexual assault and attempted kidnapping. The back of the van had knives, rope, gloves, masks, chloroform, and some other sketchy shit in it. The cops believed that I was going to be their next target. When I got to work, my friend wasn't there. He was sick. I'm so glad I called the cops that morning, because I don't think I would have made it home if he wasn't there to walk me out. We have since moved out and live in an area that's not as nice, but so far I haven't noticed any creepy people around. But now I always carry pepper spray whenever I go out. Ever since I can remember, I've always been afraid of white utility vans with blocked out back windows. In sixth grade, I used to pick up my sister, who was in first grade. I'd then walk to the restaurant our mom worked at to hang out for a while and eat some dinner while she was on shift. One day, as we were walking out of our apartment complex and approached the gate, one of these creepy vans pulled in and blocked the gate off. He was not trying to exit. He was purposely blocking our path. We slowed down and the driver hopped out of his car, walked around to the passenger side, opened his back door and then started coming towards us. I immediately freaked out, grabbed my sister's hand and yelled, Run. We ran back to our apartment as the guy got back into his car and followed us. I locked us in the apartment. My sister and I hid in our room and stayed really quiet, and then there was a knock at the door. We both started crying. I called my mom, but since she was working, she didn't answer right away, and then I got the guts to look out the window in the living room, and sure enough, the white van was parked outside. Later on, I spoke to my mom about it on the phone. She didn't really believe me. When she got home, there was a piece of paper stuck in the door. There was no writing or anything on it. It was so strange. I'm a female and this takes place when I was 14. It was late summer and I was coming home from hanging out at the beach with my best friend. 
It was Mia's 17th birthday party. When I got off the subway at my stop, I looked at the bus arrival screen. The bus I would normally take home was arriving in an hour. Being a tired 14-year-old girl, I decided to take an alternate bus route home. This was a decision I would later regret. When I get off the bus at the stop, I have about a 10-minute walk to my building. My area at night is pretty quiet. There weren't many cars on the street. As I'm walking up the street, I hear the sound of an engine nearby. I look over my left shoulder and see a white panel van rolling up the street. I try to think nothing of it, but when I turn onto my street, the van does too. Now I'm unsettled and start walking faster. This van is driving slowly and it never passes me. When I turn up the long driveway to my building, the van once again turns too. Now I'm scared. The driveway to my building has an ice rink on the side of it, accompanied with bright lights. So I walk beside the rink under the bright lights. There are small townhouses on the other side of this driveway. The van catches up to me and stops. I think maybe this person is lost and trying to ask for directions. I stop. I stay about four feet from the van just in case. I look in the van window to see an older man, starting to bald with black hair and a white t-shirt. I ask if he's lost and they don't respond. Instead, this man tries to get me into his van. I say no and start walking, but the van continues to drive slowly, following me. When a red car begins to drive down the driveway, the van drives all the way to the end and waits for the red car to turn out before reversing to be beside me again. The man is still trying to get me into the van. I want to make a mad dash to my building, but I'm worried he'll see where I live, so I keep walking. When another car comes down the driveway, the van does what it did before. It drives to the end and waits for the car to leave, but this time there's a cab dropping someone off the townhouses. The cabbie is closing his trunk when he sees me. Are you okay? He asks. I tell him how the van has been following me, and that every time a car comes down, the van drives to the end and waits for it to leave before following me again. The cabbie tells me he'll get in his car to drive to the end of the driveway, and that he'll sit there for a bit so I have enough time to run to my building. I tell him okay and thank you. The van is back in line with me, so the cabbie gets in his van and drives up the driveway, and the van does its thing. I look and see the two vehicles sitting there. I run the rest of the way up the driveway into my building's lobby. My heart is racing. When I get into my apartment, I'm still freaked out. I go into my room and call the cops. While I'm on the phone with the cops, I look out of my bedroom window and I see the van. It's slowly driving around my building, looking for me. And now I'm fully panicking. The cops send officers to sweep the area, but they don't find it. Two officers came up to my apartment to get a statement from me. About a week after this happened, the officers come back to my apartment. They show me a photo of the man from the van that they were able to get from the security camera inside of the building. I told them the man in the photo was the one that followed me. They said they found him and he was being put on the sex offender list. I'm a female, and this happened to me about six years ago. I was about 15 years old at the time. I live in a relatively small town where everyone knows everyone. For reference, there were about 120 kids in my graduating class in high school. The town is so small that there's not a lot of ground to cover, so it wasn't unusual for parents to let their teenagers wander around outside with their friends. My friend from a different town had come over to my house, because we were going to go see my school's musical later that night. We decided to go wander outside until it was time to go. She was from a different town, so she was unfamiliar with the area. I suggested we go down to my local train tracks, because there's this cool overpass thing where you can sit and watch the river. I had been to the train tracks with my friends many times before, and people my age used to hang out there all the time. This was sometime in early March, so it was still quite cold where I lived. Even though it was chilly, I remember distinctly I wore flip-flops for some reason. The train tracks intersected a street in my town, which was quite close to my house. So this is where we entered the train tracks. We were walking and spotted a middle-aged man who was alone and on the phone. We thought nothing of it and kept walking. We made it to the overpass and we were just sitting there and hanging out. When we noticed the man that we had passed earlier, 
was slowly inching closer and closer. We did both notice this, but we decided not to panic since it was possible he was just slowly making his way down the tracks. Maybe five minutes had passed and this man was getting closer and closer to us. At this point, we notice he's getting closer to us at an alarming rate. He's not continuously in motion. It's more like we notice him standing still doing whatever, and then a minute later, he's standing even closer to us than he was prior. Now he's close enough to where we can clearly make him out. He's with an earshot and could easily get to us if that was his goal. My friend and I are starting to get nervous. We're two teenage girls in the middle of essentially the woods. There was no one else around us other than this creepy man. I've watched a lot of investigation discovery in my day, so I just think it's best that we promptly make our way out of there without creating chaos. I decided it would be a good idea to pull out my phone and pretend to talk to my mother as we began walking back to the main road. My friend and I are calmly walking down the tracks while I have the phone up to my ear. I'm saying things like, Yeah, we are at the tracks. We're on our way home. Just making shit up so this guy thinks my mom is aware of my exact location. There's a point where we have to walk directly past the man in order to make it to our destination. It's at this point where he opens his mouth and says clear as day, I know you're not on the phone. At this point my fight or flight kicks in and I'm terrified. Up until this moment, the creepy man had not directly said or done anything to make us think he was a direct threat. The situation was uncomfortable enough that my friend and I thought we'd better head out. When the man said these words to me, I quickly realized that the perceived threat was both real and dangerous. As soon as my brain registered what he said, my friend and I both ran for our lives. I was never one to enjoy physical activity, let alone running, but I could have won an Olympic medal that day. I ran so fast that my flip-flop broke. I ended up running barefoot on the gravel that lined the tracks. I was so scared that if I looked back, I would see him running after me. So I didn't. When I finally began running out of steam, I quickly looked back and saw the man standing right where we'd left him. He didn't run after us, but I couldn't shake the fear of turning around and seeing him chase me. When we finally made it to the main road, I quickly called my mom and told her what happened. She was conveniently driving down the exact road we were on, and pulled up about two minutes later and took us home. My friend and I had never been so scared in our lives. I haven't been to those train tracks since, and to this day, I still think about the man who knew I wasn't on the phone, and what his intentions were that day. I'm a 33-year-old single male who lives alone in Denver. My apartment complex is not what you would call a nice building. I'm on a road close to Colfax Avenue, which if you're familiar with the geography of this area, it is not the safest boulevard in town. I'm a few streets away from it, but close enough that I wouldn't consider this an up-and-coming neighborhood. This evening I was watching Netflix on my couch. My two cats were cuddled up against me as I lay under a comforter. The night before, I had watched a horror movie that was scary enough to leave me in an unsettled mood, making it hard for me to sleep. So this night I decided to watch a stand-up special instead. I wanted to keep it light so I wouldn't have any trouble getting some shut-eye. I have classes early the next morning, so I was surprised when I made the conscious decision to turn on a second stand-up special and then let myself fall asleep on the couch. I was just so comfy where I lay, and I didn't want to move not even to turn off the several lights throughout my apartment. I remember dozing off around 11 o'clock. It was effortless, which meant I was really snug under the covers, with my cats flanking me on either end, creating a tucked-in feeling. I fell into a dream wherein I was on an impromptu date with this guy, whom I didn't recognize at a blockbuster video store. He bought me blue and yellow underwear, insinuating I would take the hint of his intentions. He was also desperate for a job, so when we got to the counter, he was given an off-the-cuff interview that didn't go well, and all of a sudden I'm not sleeping anymore. I was woken up by a knock at my door, then a man's voice that said, Maintenance. I just sat there, sitting up straight on my couch. I knew something was off. 
I looked at my phone, which was by my left hand, and the time was 2.15 a.m. I didn't move. The floors in my apartment are old wood, and there are many creaky floorboards. I did not want whoever was knocking to know someone was at home and awake, let alone alert to his presence. My cats got up and ran over to the door as they normally would, but I stayed still and listened. After a few minutes with no answer, the man walked away from the door and down the hallway to the stairs. A moment after that, I heard the back door of the building swing open and then close. I have one window where I have a partial view of that door. I break my paralysis and run over to it. I saw an old-looking green SUV sitting in the no-parking zone just in front of that back door. It must have been running the entire time because I didn't hear it start up and then the brake lights started glowing red. Someone, presumably the maintenance man, got in that car and drove off. I don't know what his intentions were, but no one knocks on someone's door at 2.15 a.m. in the morning, claiming to work for the landlord with good deeds in mind. Had it been a true emergency, wouldn't he have knocked again, maybe even used his key to get into the unit? What did I just avoid here? I can only assume it was an attempted robbery at best, or an abduction at worst. When I was watching the SUV drive off, I surveyed the other apartment windows. They were all dark. And I can see every unit except the two corner apartments below me from that vantage point. I think because my apartment sticks out from the building and has many windows, I was targeted because my lights were visibly on and noticeable from the street. However, I don't know how this individual got into the building in the first place, because you need a key to do so. I've never been so legitimately afraid as a single person living alone. I'm grateful I installed a security chain on my door when I moved in. I'm also so glad that even in my disoriented state, I had the presence of mind not to move from the couch or make any noise. As I recount this event, I can't stop my eyes from tearing up. My nerves are definitely shot. I don't think I'll be going back to dreamland anytime soon. I have turned off all of the lights, save for the lamp by my bed. I usually can't sleep with it on, but tonight, I don't think I could sleep with it all. This is a story with a happy ending, I promise. It's a recount of some unsettling events I went through during my college years, as well as the most amazing example of Bro's Sixth Sense I've ever witnessed. So, without further ado, meet Kevin. Kevin was a colleague of mine and was in the same group as me, which meant we had maybe five to six subjects per year together. Kevin was odd. Not that there was something wrong with him physically. He was adorable, a bit nerdy, a bit on the shorter, scrawny side with blonde hair and big blue eyes, and like three fluffy hairs on his chin instead of facial hair. If I had to compare him to something, I'd say he looked like a cute, soft baby chicken. Well, if baby chickens were mentally inclined to grow into serial killers. More on that later. At first, I really didn't notice him. There were a lot of people in my class. Everything was new, and I personally didn't know anyone. Except for a guy named Harper, whom I knew from my sports days, as we often competed against each other, they exchanged colorful insults on the track, and then go get drinks together. So, as I've said, I only knew Harper there, and there was only six other girls in my class. I've had classes that didn't hold much interest amongst the female college population. During that time, I made friends and got really chummy with three more geeky guys. Zachary, Steve, and Rick with whom I shared many interests. So, to cut it down, the important guys so far are Harper, Zachary, Steve, and Rick. They would later become my personal army. And then, there was Kevin. Damn cute Kevin. Whom I made the mistake of asking if he had any notes picked up from the first half of the lecture, because I missed it and overslept. In Kevin speak, Hey, got notes from this morning apparently translated into, I have interest in you. Oh, magnificent Kevin. Nothing would make me happier knowing that I've caught your eye. So please, make sure I am never left without your presence again, for I cannot bear it. 
I borrowed his notes, partially copied them, and returned his notebook back. What I didn't see was that Kevin sniffed the notebook when I turned my back. Zachary noticed it first, and Snort laughed about it later, because my first reaction to it when he told me was to sniff myself and see if I stank or something. I was young and naive then, so sniffing it was less of what's wrong with him, and more of what's wrong with me, and that's where it all went downhill. Over the next few weeks, Kevin would always be there, never talking to anyone precisely, just kind of staring at me when we were in class. When we had breaks and went for a coffee to the shop outside, then he started showing up for classes we didn't attend together. His excuse was simply that he arrived too early for his later classes. He never participated, he just sat there in the back. Also, Kevin sort of had an aura about him. You didn't have to look at the door to know when he entered the room. You just felt his eyes in the back of your head and kind of wished for a shower. Anyway, I didn't worry very much until one day. I went to the women's bathroom during a break. I did my business, went to the front section to wash my hands, and in came Kevin. Bear in mind I was alone. Kevin turned, closed the door behind him, and locked it. Needless to say, I was confused and unsure about what to do, so I just stared at him and asked him if he needed something. Hi, he said, and then proceeded with, How are you? Kind of like he hadn't just locked himself in the women's bathroom with me for no fathomable reason. I realized something was very, very wrong. I tried not to panic. I managed to keep a nonchalant expression and turn towards the mirror. I pretended to fix my makeup. Fine, I said and I said nothing else. I could see Kevin fidgeting, playing with the key nervously, and after a long and uncomfortable silence, I heard loud banging from the other side of the door, and it was Harper and Steve. Harper was yelling something like, Kevin, get your scrawny ass over here and open that door, or I swear to God, in the next ten seconds, that door ain't gonna be the only thing I'm breaking. I could hear Steve behind him, sounding a bit panicked, telling him to move since he managed to get the spare key. Kevin paled and stepped away. The key he had fell somewhere on the floor. Steve and Harper unlocked the door, and Harper jumped on Kevin like a damn primate. He knocked onto the floor, while Steve and Rick, who were there as well, got inside and all but dragged me out of the bathroom. None of them wanted to tell me what, why, or how any of that happened, but I pushed back at the weakest link. Rick. Rick and I were alone, and I found out that the whole hour prior to all of that, Rick overheard Kevin asking one of the on-campus students for the lady's bathroom key, and then he paid him for it. Rick didn't know why the hell Kevin would need that key, but he knew that Kevin was a weirdo, so he figured it couldn't be good. Later on, Steve was looking for me and asked Rick if he had seen me, and that's when stuff kind of clicked for Rick. They asked around, and people told him they saw me go into the bathroom, and I hadn't come out yet. It was confirmed when they saw Kevin going in there too, and they joked around that we must have a makeout session. Steve immediately connected the dots. Harper overheard him talking to Rick, and they then went to break me free from Kevin's affections, while Steve ran to get the extra key from the janitor. Kevin appeared with a light black eye in class two days later, and me just wishing to forget the whole thing, pretended like he didn't exist. I wish that was the end of it. Maybe a week or two went by, I figured he learned his lesson. He was leaving me alone. But then he got the wind in his sails back for some reason, and proceeded with attempting to sit next to me in class. He was so insistent that Zachary got involved, and now the guys made a timetable, so two and two would attend classes at all times when I was there. After a few failed attempts, Kevin gave up and settled for sitting in the back, glaring at my back and the two guys on duty that day. I wished this was the end of it. Two weeks of that later, Kevin either didn't show up for class or left early. I hoped he found some other interests and that it was finally over. But no. I noticed Kevin was now following me to the bus station. It took just one time to see him standing inconspicuously behind the newspaper stand to freak out. I called Steve as he lived nearby. Steve picked me up and drove me home. The next morning, Harper called me around 9am and said, Aren't you in my class at 10am today? Yeah, I said. Pack your shit and wait for me at the end of your street. Kevin is waiting for you at the bus station. Steve just called me. This went on for some five days. 
as the guys extended their bro services to now accompanying me literally at all times, before, during, and after class. That day Kevin showed up to class looking somewhat roughed up, but now stared at me with so much hate I could barely cope. And finally, after some sound advice from Harper and Rick, decided to bring this shit to the college authorities. The pro dean immediately transferred Kevin to a completely different group, so our classes never overlapped again. I stopped seeing Kevin all the time and reached my final year in college. By now, Zachary and Steve moved away. Harper finished it early and no longer attended classes, so it was only me and Rick now. But it was okay since Kevin was no longer there. I wish this was the end of it. Rick and I finished college, graduated, and decided to celebrate by visiting a medieval fair in Rick's hometown that summer. We agreed to get some drinks for old time's sake. All was well. We had a great time as we toured the fair a bit. And suddenly, Rick, the sweet, polite Rick, says, That son of a bitch. Ain't that fucking Kevin? It was fucking Kevin. Cute Kevin is there, staring at us. Then he turns on his heels and leaves. We saw him a few more times and I started to panic, thinking he's following me again. So Rick was already dialing a few of his friends to come over, but Kevin suddenly got lost, and I never, ever saw him again. Carry on Kevin, you creepy little chicken. I hope you've learned to function in society by now. For a bit of context before I start explaining what happened to me, I live in the middle of nowhere. And what I mean by the middle of nowhere is that my town is three hours away from the capital city of Alberta. My town is very small and the police are usually called during the day, so there's hardly ever someone on duty during the night. I'm a 16 year old girl who's a big video game addict, so I never leave my house other than for school or work. My father and my mother are divorced and my father works for the military. My mom, however, works from home and my stepdad works in the oil fields, so he wasn't home at the time. My parents both live in separate houses, and due to the past between me and my father, I permanently live with my mom and visit my father twice a month. So now, onto the actual situation. Everything started during October 2021, on a Wednesday afternoon. Every two weeks, I get an early dismissal from school, I get to leave at 1.30 instead of 3.10pm. My bus never came to pick me and my sibling up on time, so our mom came to pick us up instead. She drove us home and as we were on our way, our neighborhood had police officers all around it with police dogs. Police officers were stopping every car in the neighborhood to see who was in them. They were looking for someone. They gave us no context of who they were looking for, and because we had multiple issues with missing children, we didn't really care. We did what they asked of us and went home. Me being me, as soon as I got home, I went to my room and started playing video games. I chose to worry about my homework later. Around 6 o'clock, my mom came into my room telling me dinner was ready, so I came out of my room and grabbed my food and brought it to my computer, and then I chose to start on my homework. About 20 minutes later, my mom barges into my bedroom screaming my name. I panic and yell, Mom! What's going on? I ran towards her. Instinctively, she told me to cover up my windows and make sure every door was locked. As I was doing that, my brother heard the commotion and asked my mom what was going on. Turns out, my mom had been messaged by one of our neighbors, a video of the police in front of the neighborhood's duplex, trying to break down the door because a man was shooting around his house. He was trying to push the police away, and we lived right beside the duplex. It turns out, the police officers left after being shot at, even though the guy was considered missing since he had kept his family hostage. He hadn't gone to work within the past week. After a few hours of the police missing in action, it was about 9 o'clock when my dad called me. He was frantically asking what was happening. Since my mom thought the situation had calmed down, she chose to text my father the situation. I told him I had absolutely no clue what happened since the screaming, shooting, and any of the loud noises disappeared. My dad being, well, my dad, he put on his military clothing and went to the police station. 
He told them to get back there and stop the situation. It turns out, the police called the Edmonton SWAT team, and that's why the police were missing in action. They had hidden officers. The situation had been dragged out all night, and the SWAT team had brought drones in. We had police officers around our house. We were told to stay inside, and we chose to head to bed. I had woken up around 2am to more screaming shooting, and other loud noises. In the morning, my mom had received ten videos from our neighbors. The Edmonton SWAT team had gassed up the duplex, broke into the house, and managed to get everyone out safe and sound. And as for the guy, he was caught with an illegal weapon and was put to trial. We don't know what happened since the trial, and we never thought about checking. My stepfather came home from his job early, and he quit on them to keep us safe. My dad and I started talking a lot more, and he stayed in close contact with us since. We've had plenty of kidnappings in my area recently, and he's kept us up to date about it. We think it might have something to do with the guy's friends or dealers or whatever, because there were more illegal things he had done, other than owning a prohibited weapon. Everything was safe by the end of it, and our neighbors as well. It all ended smoothly, and we got to continue on with our lives. I grew up in a quiet suburb outside of Houston. Some people talk about neighborhoods where people don't lock their doors. This wasn't that kind of neighborhood. Situations in Houston notoriously went from zero to 100 quickly. So while the neighborhood was basically quiet, doors were locked and checked religiously. That said, 90% of the time, the big neighborhood problems would have been teens vandalizing or car break-ins. Annoying, but not really scary. I worked retail at a clothing store that closed at nine. I worked with a woman who I was getting to be friends with who asked if I could give her a ride home. It was a little out of the way, but I didn't mind. Her neighborhood was pretty sketchy. I don't know if that has anything to do with what happened later, but I drove her to her apartment. We sat in the car and chatted until she was ready to head inside. I stayed and sat in the car to watch her go inside. Around me, other residents were outside drinking and shooting the shit. It was around 10 at night, so it would have been late for my neighborhood to be outside talking in a volume like this on a weeknight. But it was expected at this place, so I didn't think much of it. When she got inside, she blinked the lights a couple of times to let me know she was insane, and then I headed for my childhood home. I should note that this was a time before cell phones, so this was kind of a basic routine. I was to call her from my house once I got home, and everyone was confirmed to be safe. I don't remember the drive home, really. I probably blasted some tunes and sang along as I usually did, and then parked in the driveway. The outside lights were on. Mom was good about turning them on for me, so I went inside with no fuss. Now, I know about my parents. They weren't mean drunks, but they were alcoholics. They still functioned okay by day, but it was uncommon for me to arrive upon a scene as I did that night. With all the lights on, the TV going, and Mom passed out on the couch. Dad was presumably in the bedroom, or passed out in his man cave. From experience, I also knew if I turned off the lights or the TV, Mom would wake up and be grouchy about me waking her up. So I left everything as it was and headed to the bathroom to brush my teeth, wash up, and then get ready for bed. Once in my room, I changed for bed. I then called my friend to let her know I was home, and then all was well. One of my more annoying habits is that it's impossible for me to end a conversation. I'm tired as hell and I just want to read a book or something. But instead, we're just rambling at each other about work things or whatever. I had already gotten into bed and turned the lights out. I was just laying in bed, in the dark, listening to my friend rambling. My room was at the front of the house. It had a weird wall in front of the window. Some stylistic mid-century modern thing that didn't make a ton of sense but it did block out some light from headlights when cars passed. Ours wasn't a high-traffic road, but cars driving by in a square pattern of light on the upper part of my wall wasn't an unusual sight. What was unusual, though, were specific beams of light bouncing around the upper part of the wall to the ceiling. I stared at them for a moment, before realizing that they were flashlights. That was highly unusual, but I figured it was kids. I wasn't the sort of kid that other kids bullied or pranked. 
We never had our house TP'd, and I couldn't imagine anyone would want to now that we'd all graduated. I really needed to sleep because I had college finals the next day, and yet, flashlights around the house was super weird. My friend told me to call the police, but for a variety of reasons, I'm just not a fan. Besides, carrying flashlights in my front yard isn't a crime, so I couldn't even imagine what the police would do. I see well in the dark, and besides, the lights in the living room were still on, so still on the phone, but without turning any extra lights on, I got up and with the intent to check the front door. I really don't remember how long my friend and I were on the phone rambling. It had to be for a while for what happened next to have happened. I get to the living room, but I hear something in the kitchen. It's this weird metallic slapping sound that makes no sense at all. I tell my friend and she continues to caution me to call the police, but for what? Flashlights. Metal sounds. The kitchen lights are also on, so you have to picture it. A brightly lit living room with a woman passed out on the couch. The TV is on. The kitchen lights are on, but not the dining room. But for all intents and purposes, this looks like a house where people are awake. Except for my mom, who is very clearly dead to the world. So I head toward the sound. At the very end of the kitchen is a smallish window with metal blinds. The blinds are closed, but they're rattling, making that weird metallic slapping noise. I think to myself, is the window open? We are not window opening people. I know some people in the south open their windows on a nice evening, but that's not us. Sometimes windows are open temporarily when mom would pass out while cooking dinner, and then something burned, but it was always for a very fixed time. It was possible that she left the window open, but unlikely. So I just stood there staring at it. My head cocked like a curious dog, and then I saw the front of a shoe on the sill. I screamed. Actually, just saying that I screamed way understates the noise I made. I'm a notorious low talker, and I assume that I'd just been saving all that volume for this precise moment. I wailed. I cried. I keened. I became a banshee and threw all my power into my voice in this mighty force. The foot vanished. My mom woke up. My friend screamed on the phone with me. From the back of the house, my dad came bounding out with his gun. I got off the phone and called the police. I grabbed another gun and headed outside with my dad. I'm not a gun person, and going outside was super stupid, but the scream to end all screams had apparently done its job, as no one was there. Being kind of an expert in criminology due to watching police shows, I told everyone to stay away from the sill so the police could investigate it. I had visions of them taking fingerprints and molding the shoe prints to find the culprit. Adorable. The police arrived half an hour later, so it is good that we weren't actually under attack. In the meantime, my mom started to doubt I'd seen anything at all. She started to believe that she'd left the window open. But no, the police verified that the window had been pried open, that whomever it was carefully took all the bric-a-brac that decorated the sill and set it on the ground as if trying to remain very quiet. At no point before this did I consider what the invader's plan was. Maybe it was shock or lack of imagination, or just being tired, but they knew it was a full house and they were sneaking in. These were not robbers who just wanted to take some electronics for quick cash. They were going to take us by surprise, but to do what? Thoroughly chilled, I asked when they were going to take fingerprints. The cop basically laughed me off because nothing was stolen. We locked down the windows, and I stayed up all night trying not to imagine what exactly those people were going to do to us. A little background. Around November of 2019, I was running to a Target for some cupcake decoration supplies before meeting my aunt and cousin for lunch later that day at a relatively nice restaurant. This being the case, I was slightly dressed up. Nothing too fancy, but I did look slightly older. It was around 10 in the morning, and I was walking to my car from the Target. I parked pretty far back in the parking lot, because I hate fighting for parking spaces. Suddenly a truck quickly pulls into a parking spot a little in front of me, and a man gets out. I was very freaked out as he started to walk up to me. He asks if I'm single, and tells me I'm the most beautiful woman he's ever seen. 
I tell him I'm underage and I have a boyfriend, to which he replies he would wait. This guy had to have been at least 40. He then gets back into the truck and backs into a spot at the back of the parking lot of this particular shopping center. I was about halfway to my car at this point, but no way in hell was I going to my car because he was watching me. So instead I walk into a nearby frozen yogurt place. I looked visibly panicked, and I quickly grabbed a cup of yogurt and tried to look natural because this guy was looking at me through the windows. I called my best friend who lives in a neighborhood close to the shopping center. He quickly said he'd be there soon. About 10 to 12 minutes later, my friend came and picked me up from the yogurt place. When we pulled out of the parking lot, the guy in the truck started to follow us. We started to drive around as I messaged my aunt I needed to push lunch back about 30 minutes. My friend and I took a bunch of back roads in the area, then we drove through some confusing neighborhoods and eventually lost the guy. My friend is my absolute hero, and he took me back to my car in the parking lot. I was going to run some more small errands before going to lunch, but that obviously didn't happen. When I was a kid, I had this creepy encounter with a grown man. I think this is important to the story. I was a preteen when this happened, but I hit puberty early enough that I looked like a young teenager. So now onto the story. We used to have a tiny barn on my property, and it was my job to milk our dairy goats every morning. So every single morning, at the exact same time, I'd be in the back corner of our lot to milk. It was in a fairly isolated area of our yard and between three neighbors' fields and pastures, which was intentional since goats can be talkative, so it was right beside our neighbor's chain-link fence and grapevines. I'd sing fairly loudly every morning since there was generally nobody about to be bothered by it, and it also calmed the goats down, so it was easy to know that there was a girl back there every morning and night. This particular morning, my mom had a bad feeling and made my little brother go with me, he was bored, so he messed around and collected eggs while I milked. There were little windows all around, including a wide one right behind me, and the doors were wide open, so I figured my brother would come back eventually. Well, I saw him walk past the doors and start talking to somebody. I figured it was the neighbors, so I didn't worry when he said, Okay, I'll get mom. And then he took off. I then heard the chain link fence behind me rattle and I turned around just in time to see a man launch himself over the chain-link fence and into the neighbor's yard. He'd been watching me and waiting since before I got into the yard. I don't know what he would have done if my mom hadn't made my brother go with me that morning. It did get me out of goat milking solo, though. I'd like to preface this by saying I was young and drunk for most of this, so my bad decision making, while annoying, was not out of pure ignorance. I'm a female and I was 20 at the time. I was at an anime convention. My 21st birthday was coming up a month later, so my roommates decided to let me get shitfaced as long as I stayed in their room, or at least left with someone I trusted. I was staying with a large group of people in one of the nicer hotel rooms there. I had been to quite a lot of conventions and never really had a bad experience outside of a few cosplay creepers and shitty people at times. The weekend went pretty normal except I was drunk and my group was throwing small parties. On the night of a particularly not so fun one, I decided to drunkenly leave the room and go roam around the main lobby. That was where I met Stephen. I have no idea how old Stephen was, but he was at least an adult, maybe a little older than me. We ran into each other at a manga table, and he mentioned how much he loved the manga I was holding. I didn't really read manga, and just liked the artwork, but I still listened to him gush about the story for a bit, because whatever, he seemed nice enough. I didn't say much to him outside of, mm-hmm, and yeah, that sounds really cool. I thanked him for the information and walked away. After an hour or so of roaming around, I decided to head back up to my room. Back in my room I had taken two shots with my roomies. I was laying on the couch when we got a knock on the door. The music and talking quietened down as it was customary to shush when someone knocked, in case of con security coming to shut our party down. That's when my roommate who answered the door said, Veronica, 
She's here, come on in. Followed by silence. And then my roommate calling my name and telling me, Someone is here for you. Now two things drunk me didn't think about were the fact I didn't tell Stephen my name, and I gave no information to him. Our little interaction lasted five minutes max. On top of that, my name is more complicated and hard to pronounce, but maybe I just assumed he described me, and my roommate knew who he was talking about, but I didn't give him my room number. No, we were several floors up in the suites area. You'd have to take a different elevator to get to the room than the one you'd usually use for the standard hotel room. I definitely didn't think about that, though. I walked to the door, and Stephen was smiling. He asked me to go for a walk with them. I drunkenly said, yes. I mean, he's just an awkward anime guy who just wants friends to hang out with. We were walking, and he was talking to me about how he was recently watching an anime, where the protagonist wouldn't stop killing the girls he liked. I have since googled that anime plot, but I've not been able to find one similar to what he was talking about, outside of some yandere anime. I got a little creeped out as the hallway was empty. We were walking with no plan of where we were going. He then began to talk about his favorite serial killers, how he was a huge crime junkie and he followed a lot of cases. A big red flag went off in my head and I decided it was time to try to go back to my room, but then he stopped walking. He stared at me and said, I know a really cool spot we can go. If you take the staff elevator, you can go all the way to the top of the hotel. It's really pretty. He started to breathe oddly. His hands were shaking. I said no as I had some sense left in my head. He then grabbed my arm as hard as he could and started pulling me, yanking me towards the staff doors. I pulled back, asking him to stop, and he told me to be quiet. I managed to pull my arm free of him and started running. He chased me, yelling at me to stop. I was nearly in tears and wondering why the hallways were so empty at one of the most crowded cons I've ever been to. When I finally ran into a group of girls, they saw the fear on my face. They immediately pulled me into their group, asking me about my hair and makeup, wrapping their arms around me. I was crying, telling them what was happening. And when I looked back, Stephen was gone. I didn't see him for the rest of the con but I stopped being so friendly at cons because of him. I told security about him. My roommates and friends used the body system with me for the rest of the convention. I was working at my first ever job in retail. I was around 20 years old and it was a busy morning. I was working the checkouts as per usual, scanning items, ringing up customers, and all that jazz. About an hour into my shift, I was serving an elderly man who brought in a handful of items. After giving him his subtotal, another guy behind him, smelling of booze, put out his hand, handing me cash. I kindly told him I wasn't serving him, I was serving the man in front of him. I then looked down and saw he was buying some cheap knockoff branded Baileys. It didn't take me long to figure out this guy was wasted. Just as I was taking payment from the old man, I was planning in my head how I was going to tell the guy that I can't sell him alcohol as he's already too drunk. As I said before, this was my first job and I never encountered this sort of thing before. So I finished serving and now on to the drunk guy. I looked around in hopes to find another colleague or my manager, but there was no one available to help. I looked at the man and just before I opened my mouth, it felt like someone grabbed a fistful of my hair, and then something sharp poking me in the back. The person then whispered into my ear, and his breath also smelled like alcohol. Serve my mate. He pushed what I'm assuming was a knife harder into my back. Now. In complete shock, I said nothing. I just scanned the bottle, took the cash, and they were gone. I quickly turned around to my colleague working the checkouts behind me but all they did was look at me and asked if I was okay. They were completely oblivious to what just happened. I then went for my break. I see my manager pass by and I rushed over to him and told him what just happened. All he did was laugh because he thought I was joking, but he still criticized me for selling alcohol to someone under the influence. Whatever sharp object that man held to my back cut me. Just before my break, I could feel blood running down my back and it was sore. The thing is, my uniform is black, so you couldn't see any blood. I screamed to my manager. It's true, it did happen. I turned around and lifted my hair. 
Lift up my shirt or get a female colleague to do it. This guy sliced me, but the manager just said to me, oh, No, I don't want to see you lift up your shirt. He just walked away, staring at his phone. Well, I did not return to finish my shift. I snuck out of the store, took a taxi and went home. My mom cleaned up my back and dressed it. The following morning, she called my work to tell them I wouldn't be returning. Due to the manager's incompetence to take action when I could have been almost stabbed over a bottle. For some context, I'm a female, and at the time I was 26. I needed gas, and it was around 11pm on a Saturday. I pulled into a busy gas station to fill my tank, except it was completely bare. There was no car in sight. I also live in Alaska and it was very cold this night. Maybe minus 10. Tired after work and just wanting to get home. Usually I start my pump and sit in my car due to the freezing cold. But this time I had a weird feeling that I needed to stand by the pump. So I did. I just started pumping my gas when a little golden sedan pulled up right next to me. A guy got out and I was feeling hypervigilant for some reason. He started cleaning his completely clean windows. As he put the squeegee back, he started towards me. I felt like I wanted to run, but I stayed calm and continued pumping. He asked me if I would help him put his windshield wiper fluid in his car, because he ran out and doesn't know how to open the hood. I laughed it off and told him I didn't know either. He kept getting closer and closer to me while trying to lure me into his car, saying that there's something under his seat, but he can't get it because he's too big. I'm five foot two and petite. This man was large and scruffy. Think of an Alaska wilderness dude. At this point I'm freaking out and hit the call button on the pump. He took a step back and started to go back to his car. I thought I was being smart. My gas is almost done. I looked in his car when I noticed the insides of the doors had no handles. The only handles I noticed were in the driver's door. That freaked me out. I was putting the pump back and opening my door, and he had snuck up behind me. He slammed my door shut and yelled, You're coming with me. Obviously I refused and I was petrified. He grabbed my arm and slammed me against my car. I elbowed him as hard as I could and started to scream at the top of my lungs. Thank God for the gas attendant with his big ass gun that night, because if not for him, I don't know what would have happened. The attendant pulled the video and we made a police report. I called immediately after the guy took off, but I haven't heard anything else about it. I just hope he didn't get some other girl alone. This all started when I was probably around nine in the summertime. My brother was a year younger than me, and long story short, he convinced me to go look for some cats that he'd seen. I put on my shoes and followed my little brother out the door. We walked the streets in search of kittens, completely unsupervised. We lived in a small town and my mom worked at a Pizza King until 9pm every workday. My dad worked until midnight at Johnson Controls. That left our older sister, 13, to supervise, but she was always off doing God knows what. Because of these circumstances, I realized later we were perfect targets, predictable schedules, lack of supervision, and comfortable in our tight-knit Midwestern neighborhood. My brother led me about six blocks away when someone called out to us. I turned my head to find four young men leaning up against an old gray two-door beater. They were standing outside of a known drug house, smoking cigarettes, seemingly minding their own business. The one who called out to us closest to the passenger seat, asked us, Do you guys want some gum? I stopped dead in my tracks. My brother looked confused. They offered us gum. It was eerily reminiscent of our yearly Stranger Danger assemblies in the school auditorium. My brother and I looked at them for a second, but then turned around and started walking back the way we came, saying nothing. They yelled at us to stop. We turned our heads and saw the driver getting into his car quickly and the passenger pulling up the seat to let the two other guys in the back. As the engine started, we ran. We ran through the yard of a man whose lawn was always overgrown. We tried to crouch low and lose them, 
but the loud engine of that old beater was getting closer. It didn't occur to me that they could see the grass moving as we crawled through it. We got up this time and ran at full speed, weaving in and out of people's yards, trying to buy us some time. They followed. When I realized there was no out running a car, we took a straight line to one of our neighbor's houses. We started beating on their back door. The car sped out from around the corner and stopped abruptly in the driveway. We abandoned the idea and jumped over her fence. We eventually made it back to our house and thought we lost them. My mom's voice startled me from behind. Where have you been? Where is your sister? I think she'd come home because she was on delivery route that day. Sometimes, when someone messed up a pizza, the owners would let my mom take it home to us if she was on delivery, so that we had something to eat when the pantry was empty. I started to tell my mom what happened. She didn't look like she was too keen on buying the story, until I stopped mid-sentence at the sound of a sputtering engine. I looked outside. The four men drove past our house slowly, looking into our windows, making eye contact, and then giving us a menacing look. My mom saw them, tried to close the blinds, but failed. She told us to stay inside for the rest of the day. She left after that. I can't explain why, so don't ask. She just did. Later that night, still no sign of our sister, and we were hungry. We made some mac and cheese and put on Hannah Montana to get our minds off of things. Laughing at scenes that weren't funny, my nerves started to settle a bit. However, I kept seeing this tiny red light in the corner of my eyes, coming from the window. I kept brushing it off. It could have been anything. After some time, I finally stood up and went over to the window to investigate. I saw this red dot was actually the light to a video camera. I gasped at the sight of this. The person recording ran away immediately, directly towards another man illuminated by a streetlight down the road. Naturally, I panicked and I cried. I ran outside and screamed my sister's name as loud as I could, and then I ran back inside. I called 911 first and then my mom. I told them that there were two men with what I thought was a video camera outside on the street. The police showed up after circling the area. They said they'd stake out for a couple of hours at the house on the corner, but they told us that the man was probably long gone. They never found the man, but the man found us over and over again. A couple of years later, my brother had the neighbor kid over for a sleepover. We all hung out in his room until late at night laughing loudly and shooting BB guns at the ceiling and at each other. I left the room and when I came back, my brother told me that a hand slapped the window and slid down, just like in a horror film. I thought he was just trying to scare me. I still believe he was probably lying. I was in the middle of telling him he was full of shit when I saw that little red dot again, silencing all of us. We ducked to the floor at first, silent, unbreathing and then my brother crawled over and turned the light off. We stayed there for a long time until waking our parents up, but they found nothing. I passed it off as a prank. A couple of years later, in an insomniac-induced all-nighter, I was sitting in our sunroom reading a book. It was about three in the morning and the whole house was asleep. I had my headphones in, listening to my MP3 player, when I thought I heard a loud noise over the music. I looked up, startled and I saw a man at the door, watching me, at three in the morning. This is the closest I'd ever been to him. I froze and stared at him. He was about six feet tall. His hair was long and wavy over his eyebrows. It kind of looked like bangs or a comb over without enough gel. He was wearing a white hoodie and long blue pants that nearly covered his shoes. He looked like an aged version of the guy who offered us a piece of gum years before, and he had a blue digital camera in his hand. He walked away casually, without any fear or haste, maintaining eye contact. I followed him with my eyes, past the windows, and behind the only window that was concealed with blinds, out of my line of sight. I ran inside and told no one. I passed it off as a sleep-deprived hallucination for months, denying the nightmares and the cold chills, before I finally came to the realization that this was the man I had seen years before. And then I remembered something. That door's lock was broken. Those weren't the only times we caught someone outside of our windows. It happened for years. It became an odd fact of life. He seemed to be less interested the older I grew. It's strange. 
because he always purposely revealed his presence instead of trying to stay discreet. He even showed his face to me that one night. It makes me wonder what kind of pictures and videos he's captured. How long would he watch before making himself known to us? I used to convince myself that these were surreal, unrelated instances, because it scared me to think that one person had the capacity to invest so much time into us. It seems like an odd revenge for outrunning him the years before. So if you're hearing this, you are the reason I keep my blinds closed, and why I can never own a plant or a sunroom. So I'm trans, female to male, and I'm not in a safe place to transition yet. I try to dress as masculine as possible, and I have off days due to my anxiety, fear of people, and depression, to where I just throw on whatever and try to avoid the world. I do not do dresses or skirts, show off my body, nor do I do anything with my hair. I don't wear makeup or dress up to draw attention to myself. I do have a very soft face and I'm overweight and I obviously look exhausted due to my lack of sleep. I'm also very short. This happened on a very off day for me, but adulting happens and I had to go to the bank. I had no one to come with me, and I couldn't take my emotional support animal to the bank because of the weather, and because they don't have the same rights as a service dog. I had taken my prescription to calm me down a bit before leaving, but it only helped so much. There was an older, bald guy at the bank, I thought nothing of him and was in my own little ball of anxiety. He was dressed in a nice suit. As I was waiting for the tellers to let me into the main building, he nicely pointed out the newly installed button to be let in. I thanked him, thinking that was that. I went about my business, deposited my check and was feeling alright. I didn't see anyone outside. I stepped out into the ATM hallway for a quick withdrawal, and as I turned around, he was right behind me waiting by the main exit. I could have taken the side exit or gone back in, but I thought I was being silly. No. He said to me, Hi, my name is Jason. What's your name? I'm Alice. Thanks for your help earlier. You're welcome. You're very beautiful. Can I have your number? Uh, no, thank you. I don't like to speak on the phone. I have anxiety. Come on. Just give me your number. I'm sorry, I don't want to. I have an anxiety disorder. I said to him. That's okay. Just give me your number. This was getting way too much for me. I moved to the door and he kept pressuring me for my number. No matter how much I apologized or tried to get out of it, he kept talking to me. Eventually, I gave it to him out of pure panic to get away. But by some stroke of luck, he misheard me because of my stutter. He read it back to me, asked me to repeat the number, and I went with it. He finally bid me a good day and left, reassuring me that he'd phone me at six. At this point I thought I was home free. I didn't live far from the bank. I walked up a one-way street and into an alley off the main street to try and avoid him. There were huge planters blocking traffic going up, so I thought I was safe. Just as I stepped out, I heard a car rumbling through. A large white van with tinted windows sped through. On the opposite side of the alley was another one-way street leading in the opposite direction. The van nearly collided with my car going the right way up. I had been waiting for that car to pass to get in a pedestrian-only laneway across the street, so I quickly jumped back on the sidewalk. The van honked, turned around, and pulled up in front of me, blocking my way. The tinted window rolled down, and there he was. Hi, Alice. Get in the car. I will drive you home. It had began to drizzle, but I was two and a half blocks from my home and visibly scared of him. No thanks, I don't have far to go, I said to him. Come on, get in, he said. This went on and on until he seemed to grow tired of it. He left after reassuring me that he'd call me. I was wary and took the sidewalks this time, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a white car at the end of the block. I figured that he was just trying to get out of this little burrow and kept walking, but it didn't make much sense. I had been walking slowly, and he should have been out of the burrow by then. The next block, the same thing happened. He was still there, following me along a street going the same way. 
My block was the last one you could drive down before having to turn onto a main road, but the street I was on went one block further. I ignored my turn, and the gut feeling told me to keep going. I called my brother at the end of the block, mostly hidden by a big tree. I watched my street and asked him if a white van was there. As I was standing, that man's van slowly rolled into the view at the intersection. If I had gone up my block, he would have seen me on my way back down the street. Somehow, he didn't notice me. I stood there quietly, just making sure he wasn't doing another round. He didn't. I made it home safe and sound. I was very shaken up, and I never received a call from him. Last night I took some melatonin to get to sleep early. I have an American bully who's scared of everything, so I don't think of her as my protector. I feel that I'm her protector and I'm fine with that. My boyfriend works late, so she usually barks when she hears the garage door open. At 10.55, she started going crazy. At first I told her to go back to bed, and then I heard my doorbell going off excessively, followed with a flurry of knocking. We never use our front door. Not once have we ever entered through our front door. We used the garage. My first thought was that my boyfriend's garage opener must be broken or something, but I had no calls or texts from him. My dog was going insane. We live in a gated community, so I don't ever feel unsafe. I go down and my dog is with me. Unfortunately, I can't see through the peephole because I'm really short, but I heard someone screaming, help me. They were still knocking and using the doorbell. I thought my boyfriend was just trying to play a trick on me. We have one of those hotel-like locks at the top of the door. You can open it two inches without being really compromised. I unlock the deadbolt and turn the knob, and then I open the door. A man was saying, help me, and then started jerking the doorknob. I screamed at him, what do you need help with? He couldn't speak and kept jerking the door, and during this time, my dog is sounding the meanest I've ever heard. I slammed the door with all my strength and locked it back up. I yelled that I'm calling the cops. While I'm on the phone with the police, he's still ringing the doorbell and beating the door. 911 heard it. I felt bad because I wasn't sure if they were hurt. But why wouldn't they say something when the door was open? Why didn't my dog's bark face them at all? He stays beating on the door until the cops get there. When they arrive, I see them put an old man in the back of their car. I find out it's my neighbor across the street that I've never met and barely seen. Apparently he has dementia and got out of his house. I have such a heavy feeling of guilt for calling the police and scaring his wife. I also felt stupid for how scared I was. I watch a lot of crime shows and my boyfriend has an important job. Sometimes he isn't home until 4am. I immediately thought someone was watching me and knew I was home alone. I just keep telling myself I did the right thing. Because what was I supposed to do when all I knew a strange man was at my door acting erratically and trying to get into my house? I feel bad for his wife and that the cops made him take an ambulance to the ER and that he also had to get checked out. That's my creepy encounter for 2022 and hopefully that's the last one for the rest of my life. When I was 19 to 20, I used to work for a well-known gas station chain. A lot of the time on evening shift, I was alone, and that was from 4 to 12. Though both cash registers were behind a wall of plexiglass, there was still a 2 to 3 foot opening between them, where a sliding glass door is for the night shift to close to avoid robberies. It was about 5 p.m. and still daylight, when this guy came in. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up when he walked in. There was just something about him that just wasn't right. He walked to the back of the store. He made it seem like he was looking for something in the coolers and by the back shelves. He never once picked up anything to read or look over. Every now and then he'd look up at me. He gradually made his way towards me, but would retreat to the back of the store when someone came in. This went on for about ten minutes. These two women came in and they went to the coolers at the back of the store. I quickly wrote on a piece of paper that said, Please stay with me so I can call the cops. 
When one of the ladies came to pay, I showed her the note. She nodded and went to tell her friend. I kept my eyes on this creepy guy while trying to keep from completely panicking. One of the ladies leaves the store, and the other lingers around it. She looks outside and sees something, and then leaves. Immediately after she left, and I was about to hit call, the creepy guy rushes up to the counter. He looks out the glass door, and he's two feet from me, and then he bolts. I look outside, and the two women are talking to the cop that just pulled up. The creep must have seen the cop and decided it wasn't worth it. The cops look over the guy as he takes off, then comes inside to talk to me. I explain to him his behavior, and how my finger was on the call button as soon as he pulled up to get gas. The two women came back in to make sure I was alright, and then left. The cop leaves, then comes back about 30 minutes later, saying they've picked the guy up. He explained that the guy was high on meth, that he was looking for someone to rob to fuel his habit more. He was also in possession of a hunting knife. The cop figured he would have seriously harmed me to get what he wanted. And to this day, I thank my lucky stars the cop pulled up when he did. This happened just last night. I am still thinking about it because it scared me so much, and it was just so weird. I work nights and I'm often driving home alone around 2 to 3 a.m. when the roads are completely deserted. Last night I'm driving home and got stopped at a light, and there's a fairly large man crossing the street to my left, with a guy in a wheelchair trailing behind him. They get to the curb and start waving at me, and then step off the curb to cross where I am parked. At this point my light has turned green, and the guy walking is waving his arms in the air at me. It's a four-lane road, so I figure he's with someone in the wheelchair. He's just trying to make sure I see them while they're crossing. So I do that acknowledgement wave, and stay stopped so they can cross. And then the large guy suddenly starts drifting away from the crosswalk. He seems to be walking toward my car. The guy in the wheelchair continues on the crosswalk. I don't think much of it until I notice that no. It's not that this guy's just a bit wobbly. He's definitely walking straight to my car. My light is still green, so I decide I'm just gonna go before this guy gets to my door. And so I start driving. As I'm maneuvering around this guy in the wheelchair, he gets up out of his wheelchair and starts jogging after my car. I floored it at that point. I looked in my rearview mirror to see them both just standing there, looking in the direction of my car. I don't know what their plan was, but driving to work tonight made me nervous that they'd be out there again on my way home. This happened to me in high school when I was in 11th grade. I was 16 years old. The street I lived on was in New York City. It was a pretty small street so you can hear anything that happens at each end of it. You can hear kids laughing, kids falling from bikes and that kind of thing. Remember this detail for later. Another important detail is the house I lived in only had one front entrance to get in. The front entrance has two doors, a screen door and a wooden door, both of which had locks, so no one can just open the screen door unless they had a key. I was living alone for a month and it was pretty fun and mundane. My parents were living in California at the time due to work. One day while I was on my computer doing something, there were these strong knocks on the screen door. I left my room and approached the front wooden door cautiously. I am an easily anxious person, and it doesn't help that I keep watching crime documentary videos. The person on the other side knocked on my screen door again. I peered through the peephole of the wooden door, and I could see this middle-aged man just standing there, moving his head side to side. His body was doing those jumpy movements that people do when they're standing and waiting. I decided to open the wooden door a bit, thinking the screen front door was going to protect me anyway. I asked him what was wrong. The guy instantly responded, There's been a crash. Please come out here and help me. The kid that was riding his bike was run over. Where's the car crash? I asked. Down the street over there, he responded. He pointed to one end of the street. Remember when I said the street was small and I could hear anything, even a kid falling from his bike? I sure as hell would have been able to hear a car crash. 
The second he said that, my guard immediately went up. I was quite scared. I was also pissed off for some reason. Call 911. I don't know why you're coming to me, but call 911. The guy pushed on with what he was saying before and asked me to come out and see the car crash with him and then see if there's anything we could do to help. I remember telling him, call 911 or I'll call them. They'll be able to handle this much better than I can. I then closed the wooden door and locked it. If you're wondering, I didn't call 911. I just went to my room and watched YouTube videos. I know it's a weird thing to do, but I was just trying to calm myself down at that point. My heart was beating so fast, all I could do was keep looking at the time. It happened in the afternoon. The sky was bright blue at least. I waited for a few hours when I was sure the guy would be gone. I went back to the entrance and opened the wooden door. I made sure no one else was there and opened the screen door to see if I could get a glimpse of this car crash at the end of the street. Why did I do this? Well, I wanted to truly make sure there was no car crash. I know I said I would have heard it, but I wanted to make sure I was not ignoring something I just happened not to hear. There was nothing there. No kid, and no crashed car. Just the usual street end that I'm used to. At that time, I felt a sense of relief. It's only a few years later when I thought about this moment again, I realized that the guy may have had some malicious intent for me. It's a good thing I kept myself level-headed and realized that there's no way there could have been a crash without me hearing. God knows what would have happened. To pay off the mortgage, my family built two granny flats in our backyard, and they've been renting both out. At first, this concept was terrifying, strangers living on our land, and it felt like a blatant invasion of my privacy. Fortunately, the real estate agent and my dad both found kind old men to live in either granny flats. Now we were familiar with one of the men, as he was previously living in our neighborhood and would greet us if we walked past each other or engage in small talk. The only issue was that he's a non-functional alcoholic. He's always been kind to me despite having some horrible habits, and they often get him into trouble, resulting in my mom having to patch him up after a solid beating and him being disowned by his family. My parents tend to overlook his views and even lowered his rent out of pity. We honestly thought he was a good guy, merely a victim of circumstance. The first red flag for me was when he coaxed me into coming into his granny flat under the ruse of finding his phone. Instead, he locked the doors and proceeded to show me his stash of opioids and injectables, and then tried to engage in conversation about various medical issues. In order to escape, I had to call my brother without the tenant, and leave the call running so my brother could hear me ask to be let outside. I had him overhear the conversation. Being the victim of sexual abuse twice left me fairly shaken up. Since then, I have refused to engage with his tenant alone. Recently, the final straw for my family came when we started noticing odd things inside our house. My dad found blood in his room that no one could explain. I would hear footsteps inside the house when I was alone during the day, and simultaneously causing our little puppy to go into guard dog mode. Two hours ago, my mom was home from work. She suddenly hears the door open, someone step in and then sit down on the couch. From my mother's recollection, she ducked inside our pantry and watched as our trustworthy tenant walked around our house. He was avoiding rooms that had noise emitting from them. He did, however, peek into my room while I was sleeping and then went to go sit back down on the couch. My mom soon confronted him, kicked him out and regained composure for what she could only describe as a near-damn heart attack, and then he went back to his granny flat. The man had no recollection of entering our home ten minutes ago. He was playing dumbs with lines such as, Was I really in your house? Did I do that? I don't remember doing anything wrong. What is evident is that this wasn't the first, second, or third time. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. I just want to share some news. I've just launched my channel membership option. I've kept it to two basic levels to hopefully keep it more accessible to more of you who want to join. I'm looking forward to sharing custom emojis, badges, exclusive posts, and members-only live chats. 
including a chat on a special Valentine's video. The link should be on the screen now if you want to check it out, or in the video description. Do me a favor and like and comment. Let me know what you thought of the stories. Subscribe if you haven't, and turn on notifications. I want to give a shout out to my YouTube members and patrons for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Blaze Goddess, Monique, Cal, Monica Levelace, Spider's Web, Emma, Sean, Ryan, Brenda, Astara Ray, Rudy, Rochelle, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire 5 Linda, Sham, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gorgano, Gemma Allen, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. If you guys want to check out my YouTube memberships, Patreon, Twitter, or Reddit, all my links are in the description. I hope you're all doing well, guys, and your week's going great. I'll see you all on the next one.